you guys enjoyed your holiday, but uh, we want to make sure that we show uh, some love to those who serve our society, built on the selflessness of service, uh, whether it be God, country, or community. We appreciate each and every one of you, the teachers, nurses, first responders, uh, the soldiers, uh, the officers of the law. You know who you are, all you can name each and every one of you, but uh, just want to say thank you like we do every morning. Go ahead and come up. All right, hook them up with Ian Rodby, and we appreciate you being there. Also appreciate your uh, conversation. You can get us on the message line, the text line, as always, 512-447-3776. And I opened up the messages this morning. People were mad that we weren't here yesterday, Rod, or on Tuesday. Uh, we, no, yeah, we, we, not- you, you and I haven't taken a, a show off since July when everything went down uh, maybe early early, mm-hmm. early August. But uh, so we've been grinding pretty good, take a couple of days. And, yes, yeah, so we, we appreciate that you wanted us to be there to uh, talk about the weekend. But uh, it was good to get away, Talk about the Cowboys, little, huh? Talk about them. Well, <laughs> Cowboys and Texans uh, both took Cowboys. tough losses over the weekend. Yeah. And, uh, you know, week 16 and 17 in the NFL promised to be full of drama. Oh, uh, Cowboys man. are at least in the playoffs, but their playoff uh, – Playoffs? Uh, you know they got a big game kind of Saturday night, Rod. I'll be in I'll be in New Orleans because uh, I'll be in New Orleans to watch the Cowboys and oh, Lions. I heard y'all doing it big. I wish I could be there. That's all yeah. right. That's all right. It's gonna be it's gonna be great. I'll be there in spirit. Yeah. Well, listen. Spirit, I'll, we'll do this show <laughs> and tomorrow's show, and I'll be here in Austin. But then it's uh, it's off to New Orleans the uh, for Sugar Bowl coverage. Want to thank our friends at Hay City Store, Nice House, and Taste on Main in Buda oh. uh, as our travel partners getting us there, and we're looking forward to doing uh, getting there, getting all the coverage, and uh, I'm gonna partner up we're, once again rod we in the station with bobby burton and the on uh, texas football crew mm-hmm. uh for some pregame coverage and uh, getting you ready for this game so i'll be out there so yeah that's for maybe i'll go over to harris rod i'll go to harris and watch the uh the sugar bowl i like it uh, not the sugar bowl the uh, the cowboys and lions which is a really big game in the nfc safe to say so we're looking forward to the weekend we're also looking forward to this game uh, four days out. Hey, can we dive into the headlines get you caught up on the news it's a very busy thursday morning a lot going on make sure you're caught up as you get up and out Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment, new location coming for Top Gun. We'll tell you about that. They start, uh, we start with college football. The third-ranked Longhorns arrived in New Orleans yesterday for a final few days of on-site prep for their showdown with second-ranked Washington in the All-State Sugar Bowl Monday night. It's part of the semifinal round of the college football playoff. Texas head coach Steve Sarkeesian led his team off the plane yesterday and believes his squad is ready to enjoy their trip to the Big Easy while maintaining focus on the task at hand. Obviously, we want to take our time to make sure that we're putting forth uh, maximum effort to get ready for the game, uh, but I also want to give our players a chance to experience this opportunity, experience the city of New Orleans, experience uh, what they've earned, which is to be in the CFP. But I think our players will will echo the same sentiment. You know, we're here to, to play our best football that we can play to to try to win a, a, a semifinal game to get into the national championship. And so, um, I think there's definitely a uh, a workman like mentality that this team has, but. I want to make sure that they enjoy the experience as well because they've earned it. Also from college football, four bowl games yesterday, including a pair of wins for the Big 12 down in Houston last night. Oklahoma State took down Texas A&M 31-23 in the Texas Bowl. Houston uh, Cowboys quarterback Alan Bowman threw for 404 yards and a pair of touchdowns against a shorthanded Aggie squad. Also last night, USC top Louisville 42-28 in the Holiday Bowl. Uh, earlier in the day, West Virginia rolled past Drake Mayless, North Carolina in the Dukes Mayo Bowl 30-10. Virginia Tech upset uh, Tulane in the Military Bowl. Four more games on tap today starting at 10 a.m. this morning. SMU will face Boston College in the Fenway Bowl in Beantown. That'll be followed by Rutgers in Miami in the Pinstripe Bowl. NC State meets Kansas State in the Pop-Tarts Bowl in Orlando. And uh, tonight should be a good one down at the Alamo Bowl in San Antonio. 12th-ranked Oklahoma facing 14th-ranked Arizona. If you missed it on Tuesday night, congrats to Texas State. Their fifth-year linebacker, Brian Holloway, returned a pair of touchdown interceptions for touchdowns. Jamil Jeter ran for three scores. They led the Bobcats to their first-ever bowl win in the first responders bowl. First, first one ever for the program, 45-21. Congrats to them. NBA last night, Phoenix down. Houston and the Mavericks lost at home to Cleveland 113-110. Earlier in the day, NBA owners officially approved the sale of controlling interest of the Dallas Mavericks from Mark Cuban to the families that run the Las Vegas Sands Casino Company for somewhere in the neighborhood of $3.5 billion. College Hoops, fifth-ranked Texas women, finished off their non-conference schedule a perfect 13-0. They whipped Jackson State yesterday at Moody Center 97-52. They will open Big 12 Conference play Saturday afternoon in a big one hosting 10th-ranked Baylor.
you know, one thing we didn't get a chance to talk about, and we'll get into it a little bit when we go behind the burn orange curtain, Raj Rand. I mean, we're talking a lot of Texas Washington, obviously, all day long. We'll hear yeah. from uh, Sark and hear from Kalen DeBoer. They both did their uh, Sugar Bowl press conferences when they got down there. So uh, we, they're, they're pretty short, too. They're like seven, eight minutes. So we, we'll just play the whole yeah, thing. They just, both just got off the yeah, plane, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but the, the offensive line for Washington won the Joe Moore Award. We'll get into yes, that. For yes. the best offensive line um, in the country. That was a little surprising. We'll get into some of the details about that, but it, it wasn't surprising. But it's uh, the their road to get there. I think is a is a little unorthodox. Um, so I, I I'll, I'll, we'll get into that a little bit because their offensive line that's going to play a huge uh, role in the in the matchup. I was listening to an interview with Chris Peterson, former Washington Huskies head coach, who had been in the college football playoff actually against Alabama. Um, I believe. But but uh, was Sark on? Sark actually was an analyst, I believe, maybe on that Alabama staff around that time. Remember, that's when he said that's when he was really impressed with PK, I believe, right? That was what that, was, that matchup, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. He, he referenced that. But either way, Chris Peterson said he thinks the key matchup will be the offensive line for Washington versus the Texas defensive line and defensive front. He said uh, Washington is the best pass-protecting offensive line in the country. You can make that argument. Only allowed 18 sacks in the last two years. And in Texas defensive front, you could argue there's no better – there's there's no uh, more uh, pronounced strength for Texas all throughout the season than the best D tackle duo in the country. Yeah, well, and we've talked about it for for a few weeks now. We're getting ready for this game. I mean, pressure on Michael Penix, Penix is going to be a key. Uh, they, you can't let him stand back there and uh, you know throw to his his you know trio of receivers against the Texas secondary. They at times can be susceptible, especially with the Derrick Williams suspension and others. So, I mean, to me, pressure on the quarterback is is massive. Uh, can they get it against, as you said, the Joe Moore award-winning offensive line? I know Longhorn fans have made a lot about the 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 280-pound center for Washington that uh, can he hold up against Tavondre Sweat, Byron Murphy. <clears throat> this is what the chess match is, Rod. Both teams should be healthy, or at least as healthy as they've been since the start of the year. Both teams have had a month to prep for it. Uh, what does PK bring to get pressure on Michael Penix? What does uh, Kalen DeVore and his group do to protect their quarterback? Because uh, I don't think they're going to be able to run the football. I know they were able to, against Oregon in that uh, Pac-12 championship game. They kind of pulled the surprise party and 28 carries for the running back. I don't know that that's going to work against Texas. We haven't seen anybody run on Texas this year. But uh, Michael Penix certainly can be efficient in the passing game. And as you've talked about, Rod, going down the field. But you got to have time to do that, right? So that becomes the, the really the, – I would, I would agree with Chris Peterson. That's the, the key matchup of this game in my mind. If the Longhorns can get the better of it, they've got a real chance to win that game. Uh, but Michael Penix is a dangerous player when, when, when not pressured. Yeah, and you know, you were just you know kind of referencing it there about the running game. I don't. They're definitely not going to be able to run at Texas. That's pretty much the Andre Sweat, Byron Murphy, Alfred Collins. They can't run at Texas. Jalen Ford. Um, teams try to run either around Texas or at the edges of Texas. That's their best chance. Or they have unorthodox, uh, unconventional run games, which are the quarterback run game. Uh, we've seen teams use kind of the. Uh, extension of the run game, which are screen passes, um, or the uh, if you look at the end of rounds, remember the, the wide receiver uh, reverses and the end of rounds that Oklahoma used against Texas. That's really the only way to truly run the ball against Texas, and they can deploy some of those strategies and techniques. Uh, I do wonder if every now and then Michael Penix will be encouraged to just run the football. Yeah. I mean, this guy, I know he, he got multiple ACL surgeries, but, you know, I always say to win big games, you got to break tendency. That's what Oklahoma did, right? Dylan Gabriel had his most prolific rushing game in it, of his career <laughs> versus Texas. That was their ultimate way to break tendency and an unconventional way to run the football against Texas. I'm not saying they're going to do that a, a lot with Michael Penix, but this guy's a track star in high school before his ACL injuries, and he can move. They move the pocket, actually, a lot. That'll be one of the ways that they try to neutralize the in, interior pass rush for Texas. They'll just move the pocket and have him roll to his left or roll to his right. Um, that's why the edges for Texas are key and how they how Texas decides to fortify those edges. So it'll be, yeah, it's a chess match going on, a continuous chess match. I, I'm with you. I think they'll shut down the conventional running game. Right. But what about the unconventional running game? What about the extension of the running game? What about them deciding, you know what, we're going to attack the edges, which Dylan Johnson, most of his runs are actually to the edge. They want to run to the edges. And he had the big game in that Pac-12 championship game against Oregon uh, as they improved to 13-0. and <laughs> You know, it's funny talking to a lot of Longhorn fans through the holiday and just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, previewing the matchup. You know, fans do this. Fans will find 
the worst performances of their opponent, right? Well, what about the Arizona State game? And what about Oregon this State Oregon State game? game? Yeah. Well, you can find those for Texas, too. I mean, yep. Texas fans will find their best performances against mm-hmm. Washington. Tech, Washington's, yeah. State. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, man. Have you seen a, us? We've been what about boxing H? people. Yeah. What, well, yeah. But I always remind yeah. people, that, hey, look, y'all, they're 13-0. and They're 13. That's hard to do. They won them. It's very difficult to do. They yeah. won those games. So I would give, just like we'd give Texas credit for being resilient and finding ways to win tough, hard-fought games on the road against Houston with an injured quarterback and uh, finding a way to, to, to rally back and, and beat K-State with, around Malik Murphy. Uh, without your starting quarterback, I mean, those are that's that's signs of resiliency. Both yes, teams have them, yep. and both teams have really good players. I mean, Texas probably has the better and more talented overall roster, uh, but at the same time, man, their 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 goods are pretty good. Uh, their goods are really good. They're going to have an NFL quarterback, uh, three NFL receivers, and here's the thing, Rod, about that Texas defense and the pressure and PK. You know, last year the Longhorns lost twenty-seven to twenty in the Alamo Bowl against this same team, and the Longhorns didn't have a single sack in that game, Mm-mm. and they didn't have a single tackle for loss in that game. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that, that has to change no in this game. Plays. Yeah. They didn't force a negative play in the game. They had one interception. That was Jaron Thompson, uh, in that football game. I mean, you I was, I know you've gone back and watched that game several times. I was, I was at it at the game and, um, going back and looking at some of the, uh, the, it, it, it's amazing. Texas only lost by seven points. I mean, it felt like Washington controlled the game, uh, having, having, uh, been there, but at the same time, Texas has to impact, impact Michael Penix more. Uh, they know that. Uh, they've got to come with a strong game plan, both sides of the ball. If they do, you give. T- I think Texas has a real chance to win this football game, without a doubt. Same time, they've got to be more impactful and more more pressure oriented on this Washington offense because it's really efficient. And you know, just like Texas will be as healthy as they've been in a you know all season. Rod Michael Penix, who you told the story last week or before we took the break about you know playing with a cracked rib and having to be driven back from that uh, Arizona Roma State. Dunze. Yeah, oh the the receiver yeah, Roma Dunze. Roma Dunze, yeah. And then there's also been talk that Michael Penix almost was a scratch from a couple of games this year because of injuries. It. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously Quinn missed a couple of games for Texas. It's just both teams are healthy. Both teams have really good coaches and coaching staffs and have had a month to prepare. That's what it was going to make this a really, really fun football game to, to to chew on and get ready for and then take in on Monday night. Yeah, I'm glad you uh, brought up the, the hell that in that same Chris Peterson inter- interview that I referenced. And maybe tomorrow I'll try to get some pieces of that and we can actually uh, listen to it. But he also talked about how there's so much time off now that coaches are balancing trying to infuse some physicality and some intensity into practices, but you also just want guys to be healthy. Yeah. They're, you, you, your biggest fear, he said, as a coach is to have guys get injured in practice. Right? He said you, you safeguard against that uh, for, you know, at, all, uh, at all costs. And I think he said he even regretted later on in his coaching career um, being a little too soft during the bowl practices because he just wanted guys to make sure they were healthy um, f- for whatever bowl they had. Of course, if it's a big bowl like this. So I think Sark and most coaches, if he referenced that, are probably, in, from my experience, they err on the side of caution. That's why the young guys get so many reps. The older guys, they get reps. And even Sark mentioned this, and we'll talk about this when we hear from Sark. Um, he's talk- He references they went good on good to avoid the – I don't need the the kind of lackadaisical maybe malaise that could set in when you had that much time off and you went to go hang out with your family and you you know I mean you you know, you, just, you you really talk about that downtime you know you've been riding this this in, intense high all season long um, on this regimen on a schedule you know crystallized focus and then it comes this period where you relax and you exhale and he always talked about guard, and guarding against that is important but also Hey man, you can't be hitting at practice too much when you got that much time off because guys are going to get hurt this late in the season. That's why guys are as healthy as they are because coaches don't really hit in practice. Not with their, not with your front line guys. Sure, your younger guys are getting a lot of that work yeah. in the bowl uh, practices and trying to improve your depth for the long haul and yeah. then for the good of the program. And you're right. I mean, we saw that uh, go back with Texas, right? I mean, they they played the Rice game to start the season, and they weren't nearly as physical as Sark wanted them to be, if you remember, mm-hmm. knowing they were going to Alabama the next week. Yep. And according to Sark, they got real physical in practice that week, saying, look, we, we're going to get smoked if we go up there and, um, you know, because they couldn't push rice around in week one. And people are like, oh, my gosh. Um, they got pretty physical. So you wonder now that they're in New Orleans. You just mm-hmm. heard Sark in the headlines talking about we want to enjoy the Big Easy in this trip. They've earned that. But at the same time, you may yep. need, to, you may need to, to roll the dice a little bit, Rod, and get, get head on head here a little bit. Yeah. 
in these last couple of workouts before. But, you know, as you said, it's the it's what keeps coaches up nights. It's somebody will get a key player will get, uh, you know, rolled up Deemed on. Or, up you know, practice, just a freak, you know, freak thing because you yeah. go too hard. Never forgive yourself as a coach. <laughs> you won't. You're like, oh, man. Yeah, you've, you've gotten to this point and <laughs> you're, you, you've gotten fresh and healthy, but you also got to get game ready. I mean, you know, yeah. boxers talking about it, right? You got to exactly spar. Right. Yeah, you got you to take on take on some tough competition ahead of uh, that big big bout, or you, you you might get knocked out in the first round if you're not careful. That's, exactly That's right. the way that can go. Also, before we took uh, took the break, Rod, and uh, enjoyed the holiday, uh, we'll get into this coming up throughout the burn orange curtain as well. But the Longhorns received a couple of Christmas gifts right ahead of Christmas that we didn't get to talk about. But on Friday night, right before the signing window closed, Aaron Butler, highly touted four star wide receiver from Calabasas, California. Kind of looks like on film an Xavier Worthy he kind does. of player. He, he chose the Longhorns over Washington, Arizona. Comes from California, likes X X Man. He would you know rounded out the Longhorns at least early window high school uh, class. Twenty three players. Uh, the fourth wide receiver. Remember back on uh, Wednesday of last week when Sark did his press conference, he talked about we're not probably not done at wide receiver. Well, we were wondering who that was. One of the names we threw out there was Aaron Butler, and he became uh, the Longhorns. 23rd high school prospect on Friday night, six foot, 170 pounder, legitimate track speed rod. Uh, you see him out there running the 200 meters and, mm-hmm. you know, 21 and a half. And um, once committed to Deion Sanders in Colorado, also committed to USC at some one point along the process, ends up signing with and is officially a Texas Longhorn. Then on Saturday, the Longhorns received their third major transfer portal commitment when UTSA edge rusher Trey Moore the nation's number one rated edge rusher, according to On3 Sports. And other um, outlets out there, Rod, chose Texas over Alabama. So that really means the Longhorns hit on all three of their top portal prospects through the portal season. Uh, Clemson safety Andrew Makuba, the local product, uh, Houston receiver Matthew Golden, and then the UTSA edge rusher Trey Moore. All three will be uh, joining the Longhorns in January. Yeah, when we talked about how Texas was very selective in the transfer portal, they wanted to supplement the uh, roster would transfer portal guys, but still have a homegrown organic approach to building the roster through just, you know, regular recruiting or let's say traditional recruiting. And the guys that they, they pinpointed were, you know, Matthew Golden. They needed the guy as soon as, as soon as he was in the portal available, I don't know, 48 hours, or so 48 to 72 hours. And he was already committed to Texas. Uh, the Trey Morgan obviously took a long time, but, from everyone that we talked to and a lot of the insiders, they were pretty confident that Texas was going to be, you know, the one of the front runners, if not the front runner to get his commitment. And Texas, you know, they they didn't seem like they were interested. I didn't hear a lot of names about pass rushers in the transfer report. It seemed like he was the guy that they wanted in the well, transfer. Well, they wanted production. I and mean, you talked yeah. about that from the very beginning. Guys who have produced on the field, not yeah. star prospects, what they were coming out of high school – Dudes who have shown up and played, and Matthew Golden, uh, Andrew Makuba, and uh, Trey Moore have certainly done that. I mean, three seasons for Makuba, certainly two seasons for Trey Moore as a disruptive force for UTSA. And, it's, you know, you give Trey Moore the, the credit that, you know, coming out of high school in Smithson Valley, he didn't really get recruited. He kind of got caught up in that COVID, mm-hmm. you know, era, which a lot of players did. And so he, he took his time. He took his time. He went to Alabama. He went to Texas. He really, uh, you know, went through the recruiting process. Uh, this is probably his last move and uh, ends up choosing Texas. So uh, three guys who I think can be, you know, whether they're starters or not, impact players, impact players immediately. And we saw the Longhorns hit on some impact guys last offseason in the portal as well with A.D. Mitchell. Will be a big fate feature on uh, on Monday night. Also, the punter Ryan Sanborn was a key guy that they targeted and uh, brought in, and he was um, you know exactly what they wanted in the punting spot on the special league teams. Uh, so you know they 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 hit in those regards, and I think they feel like they've gotten three really good players here that can yep. come in and help for next year. Totally and, and then twenty three high school players, and as you said, right, Sark and wants to be a program that builds. Traditionally, through the high school ranks, we talk about the high school recruiting being like the NFL draft. Mm-hmm. You want to you want to build your team mostly through the draft in the NFL and mostly through high school recruiting. But then, as you said, supplement and uh, dabble in free agency, dabble in the transfer portal. But guys that you know can play. You've seen it. They've produced and they fit what you want to do culture wise. Yep, totally agree. And I mean, most of, you got most of that class uh, from 2024 is going to be coming in early. I mean, you oh got, my gosh. I believe, you know, 20 early enrollees if you end up counting the, the transfer portal guys too. So you're going to get an infusion of talent, and that's the talent acquisition phase that you're dealing with now. Instead of just recruiting and transfer portal, you're just looking at it, like you said, from a more professional standpoint because of NIL, it being, uh, you know, inextricably linked 
to the transfer portal and now in recruiting too, I mean, you're just looking at a, a, a personnel department <laughs> and looking at acquisitions and your acquisition. Now you want those guys to be able to contribute as early as possible. That's what's happening. I mean, I, this is an unprecedented amount of early enrollees. I think it's 21. It, yeah, exactly. it's, it's unbelievable. Because if you count the three portal guys who will be enrolling in January, I think it's 19 high school players. Because Aaron Butler, who committed on Friday night, he was a, he's an early enrollee as well. So I think it's 18 or 19 and then three portals. So you're, you know, over 20 of your yeah. – because, I mean, the total class is 23 high school, three portals, so that's 26. I think 21 of them are going to be rolling in here in January. It's crazy. To be a part of spring practice, uh, which is, you know, uh, you know, as Sark said last Wednesday, uh, that's the biggest change. I mean, he talked about mm -hmm. the changes in, in the landscape of portal and NIL and everything. He said the biggest change to him is these guys getting here early and, you know, getting assimilated to college and the college life, um, you know, getting away from their parents for the first time and their families and their friends, but then just immersing themselves in the program. That's right. And it just accelerates their ability to help the team mm -hmm. next fall. Uh, right. Without a doubt, because then they'll participate in the spring. And Sark talked about the ability to actually, you know, have a really, really productive spring practice where ones are against threes, twos are against fours, and yep. they're they're practicing and repping on two fields and really getting after it to develop the program. And as you you knew, Rod, no, Rod, when you played at Texas, when there's a really talented roster, top to bottom, and, and steel sharpening steel, and guys working against really good players, that's how the entire roster gets better, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's for the future, and we'll talk about that, obviously, but wanted to get that out there. Uh, we'll talk more about the uh, the build of the where this thing is headed into the Southeastern Conference, but obviously, more importantly, four days and about 14 hours plus from now, the Longhorns will be on the field at the Sugar Bowl uh, in New Orleans, meeting Washington, number two against number three, and we're really going to drill down on it. Rod will have some behind the burn orange curtain coming. We'll get some what the facts before the end of this first hour of our five-hour Thursday morning conversation. Appreciate you being there. We'll get to week 16 in the NFL as well. Cowboys, Texans, and tonight's game. Also, the other top stories out there, but a lot of Texas Washington chatter here over the next five hours. We appreciate you being there here on 1019 AM 1260, streaming on the Horn app and always at hornfm.com.
Aaron Hogan, Rod Babers. Hook them up. 1019 AM 1260. The Horn. Well, I woke up early Sunday Hope you had a great uh, holiday season. Merry Christmas. Uh, Happy Kwanzaa, which happened uh, on Tuesday, I believe, was Kwanzaa. Hey, there you go. Yeah, man. Man, whatever your, out there. Your, uh, your holiday season was, it was all about. We appreciate you being back with us. We took a couple days to um, unplug and decompress. We're ready to roll. we got four days to the uh, Sugar Bowl. We've got uh, bowl games tonight, including something called the Pop-Tarts Bowl, Rod, which we'll preview coming up. The Pop-Tarts formerly Bowl. Formerly known as the Camping World Bowl, formerly known as the Champ Sports Bowl, whatever the game is in Orlando. And I think there are 32 players for both teams tonight, K-State and NC State in the pro- in the portal. Hmm. So we, tra- we call it the transfer portal, Pop-Tart Bowl, potentially. <laughs> and it's amazing to watch. Is, is it fair to say the bowl games, Rod, are going the way of the flip phone uh, real fast here to where you almost aren't sure if they're on or not? And I was watching the A&M yeah. game last night, and it's like, who's on their team? They'll, I think they only had like 48 mm-hmm. scholarship players available for – Whoever was coaching their team last night, I don't even not even sure. I'm with you. Elijah Robinson, who's on his way to Syracuse. I don't whatever. Mike Elk goes up in the booth on TV. It's hard to keep up, man. It, and it, you know, between that and the eligibility of guys, you have no oh, yeah. idea what's going on. Yeah. Now Oklahoma State seemed to take the game pretty seriously last night because uh, they, they rolled it up on the Aggies, and Ollie Gordon mm-hmm. had another hundred yard game, and uh, the Doak Walker winner, Alan Bowman, threw for four Bills. And they torch the Aggie secondary, but you know that hardly looks like what the, what the Aggies are going to be moving forward. They hope, but uh, either way, that that was last night. Tonight there are four more games, including I think the Arizona Oklahoma game could be a pretty interesting game. The Alamo Bowl typically delivers as far as entertainment value, and that's tonight. That's the eight o'clock kick tonight with uh, Oklahoma and Arizona. How about Brett Venables in the lead up to that game saying, "Man, watching Arizona on film, this this might be the best team we've played all year long." Wow! <laughs> yeah, is he really? That's an insult. Oh yeah! Oh, trust me, that's a face. backhanded slap at the uh, the Burn Orange for sure. Best uh, <laughs> team you played all year long. Come on, Brendan. Why, why would you say something like that? Because he's a Sooner, I guess. I don't know. Come on, man. Yeah, uh, you, know, they, they, you know he was trying to pump up his opponent and and give them some credit, but obviously that also smacks back at everybody in the Big Twelve, including the Longhorns. Uh, yeah. Now, because they didn't play anybody in the non-conference, let's be honest about that. They played nobody in their non-conference schedule. But you and... got a, there's a team in the college football playoff. Yeah. Who you talking about yeah. the best team you played? They're they're, they're a good team. They're, I mean, but come on now, that's ridiculous. Maybe if he said the maybe one the, of all you had to do is put that. If he really wanted to stick the dagger, he could have said that's this, this might be the best team we we didn't beat this year. Mm. <laughs> because, they, of course, they beat Texas yeah. uh, in that great game up at the Cotton Bowl. But either way, we'll get you ready for the bowl games if, you know, if you're, you're, you know, we're trying to find the, uh, cool stuff. But obviously the, the big ones are what matters on Monday. Uh, there's some pretty good games into the weekend. And huge games this weekend in the NFL, Rod, which starts tonight with, oh, with Joe Flacco and the resurgent Cleveland Browns hosting the New York Jets tonight. Also coming up in our What the Facts, Rod, I'll get you this. Who it is thought? official now. looks like the Russell Wilson trade will go down as, as one of the worst trades in NFL history. Uh, with the news coming out of Denver yesterday that Russell Wilson is going to get benched and then get cut uh, by Sean Payton. We'll get you details on that. But right now, can we go behind the burn orange curtain? Because it's all Texas. It's all Washington. It's the Sugar Bowl. Let's hit it. And they ask themselves the same question. What is behind that curtain? The Longhorns uh, arrived in, um, they arrived in, I believe, New Orleans on the 26th, and so did Washington, if I'm not mistaken. And when they got down there, of course, uh, they were welcomed um, by a lot of uh, the uh, bowl uh, (laughs) officials and a lot of the Longhorn fans, actually, uh, who are already down there, too, celebrating and having a good time. They decided to spend their holidays down uh, in New Orleans and get ready for it. Uh, But they also spoke to the media, both coaches, Kalen DeBoer as well as Steve Sarkeesian, but but about eight minutes, so it's not that long. um, So we can play the whole thing and then discuss what Steve Sarkeesian um, spoke about. But here's Steve Sarkeesian at the Sugar Bowl introductory uh, media availability uh, for the coaches. Uh, well, this is uh, exciting for the week to finally be here. Uh, we, uh, you know, when you, when you play a conference championship game and then you don't get to play again for another month, um, it takes a while, right? There's a process to get to that point too, but to uh, finally make it to New Orleans, I got my beads on, I feel good. I know our, our team's excited and we're excited to play a, uh, quality opponent in the University of Washington, a ton of respect for them. Uh, 
in the Allstate Sugar Bowl, which is, which is a great honor in the CFP. So um, great opportunity, uh, fortunate to be here, and um, looking forward to the ball game in a week. Coach, the way you've recruited the New Orleans area, is this starting to feel like a second home for you? Well, I, I just think the natural proximity helps us. Um, we, we joke sometimes on the staff, we never know when East Texas ends and Louisiana begins, right? And so uh, from a proximity standpoint, it, it's very natural for us to recruit Louisiana. Uh, naturally, we have a couple of coaches on staff who do a heck of a job uh, recruiting, recruiting the state. Uh, we've been fortunate to, to sign some really good players uh, that, that are really good on our team right now, and, and hopefully that can continue. Uh, we know that this state produces a ton of talent, and so uh, for us to be able to, to make some inroads here recruiting and now to be playing in the Sugar, Sugar Bowl, um, it's, it's naturally, you know, I think helpful for us. Coach, you've, uh, you've been in bowl games, and you've also were in a playoff situation at Alabama a couple of years. How do you treat this different from a regular bowl game? And what have you done to uh, maybe Im implement the, what, what did you learn first from being in Alabama in the playoffs like that? And what have you done to implement that this, this week? I think, I think one of the keys is you do, a, you do a lot of the structural work from a game planning perspective back home, right? Because we have so much time, um, you know, we kind of take a week to really implement what we want to do when we're back at home. Uh, when we're here, obviously we want to take our time to make sure that we're putting forth uh, maximum effort to get ready for the game. Uh, but I also want to give our players a chance to experience this opportunity, experience the city of New Orleans, experience uh, what they've earned, which is to be in the CFP. But I think our players will, will echo the same sentiment. You know, we're here to, to play our best football that we can play to, to try to win a, a, a semifinal game to get into the national championship. And so um, I think there's definitely a, uh, a workman-like mentality that this team has, but I want to make sure that they enjoy the experience as well because they've earned it. Uh, Steve, obviously you are peaking at the right time at the end of the year. Now you're a month off. As an offensive guy, how do you keep an offense in rhythm and in sync when you have to, don't get to play for a month? Yeah, you know, I, I think part of it was making sure that we did enough good on good in practice, uh, especially early on in the prep, that we kept uh, the speed of, of the competitiveness in, of what a game would feel like in a practice setting. Uh, not necessarily to scrimmage all the time, but um, at the line of scrimmage, offensive linemen need to feel the speed and physicality of our defensive line. Uh, our DBs need to feel the speed and the rhythm of our passing game because that's that's critical to you know, when that ball gets kicked off next Monday night, it's gonna, it's all gonna be fast. And so we have to make sure that we're playing as to, to our tempo and to our speed. Uh, I think too, you know, when, when you implement, implement a game plan, uh, what I've learned is you, you don't wanna give it to them all at once uh, because ultimately then it can become monotonous. Um, and so we, we try to kind of, kind of keep giving them things as the day comes and they keep their interest really perked and, and on point and make sure that practice is upbeat and, and energetic and that we've got a lot of positive vibes going in our building and on the practice field. And, and, uh, and I think that our guys have responded well to that. Steve, the messaging has been pretty consistent throughout the year from yourself and the players about each week being a championship week. And you talked about the workmanlike mentality. How does that help the team kind of not get overwhelmed by this atmosphere at the Sugar Bowl and really be able to be laser focused just on the task at hand? Well, I, again, I think one thing that's helped us this year, we, we've played in some pretty tough environments, right? We've, we've had to go on the road and, um, you know, naturally, you know, playing in Tuscaloosa was helpful for us. Um, playing in the Big 12 championship game uh, in Arlington was good for us. Um, and to not be too enamored with the outside and what was going on outside, but stay focused on us. We have a simple adage, be enamored with us. Um, and we try to keep our focus internal. Um, and so that when the games come, it's about what we've prepared to go do and not what might be going on around us. And um, a, a lot of times when you get into these settings, um, the world around you is pretty chaotic, right? We, we talk about all the time as a team, like what's going on around us is very chaotic. We want to make sure that we're a steady sea and that we're focused on what we need to do. We're very calm when the moment comes, um, regardless of the circumstances, because adversity is going to strike. It's going to strike in this ball game. And but us, us keeping our, our composure, us keeping our poise is going to be critical to our success. 
Hey, Coach, kind of along those lines, not getting too enamored with New Orleans and the fun that you have this week. How, how do you, what, what do you need to see to know your guys are in the right mindset as you go through the week? Well, I, I think that started back home. You know, when, when you listen to our leaders talk and when you guys get a chance to visit with them, um, I think their focus is already there, you know. Um, you know, na naturally, um, how we prepare, how we practice is going to tell me a lot. What are they talking about? You, know, you listen to conversations, you know, when we're on the bus and what's going on. But I also don't want us to be so over the top so early uh, that, that we're exhausted by the time the game comes. So we operate pretty well as a group when we're loose. Um, we have a lot of fun together as a team. Um, but I also think that this group knows how to, when it's time to really be focused and locked in, that they have the ability to do that. And so I don't think that we need to change a whole lot. Uh, I think that we already know kind of how to do that. Um, and so, you know, trusting on our training to get us to this point, I think will be big as well. Your staff had a month to prepare for them. Their staff had a month to prepare for you. Yeah. Does that change how you go about things or do you just try to, you know, what, how do you deal with that extra time? Well, it presents a heck of a challenge. Um, you know, obviously a lot of what we do early on is look at ourselves first. You know, what, what are our tendencies? What do we need to, what, what, where are we giving away too much in, in any phase, offense, defense, or special teams? Two, knowing that, you know, Washington staff and, and the staff, Coach DeBoer and, and his crew, they're great coaches and, and they do a heck of a job. And so uh, knowing that they've had the same amount of time that we've had, um, I, I think is, is understanding, you know, as you navigate your way through it. And, but at the end, it all comes back to, let's not outsmart ourselves. Uh, and let's make sure that we do the things that we do well. Um, and let's make sure that we continue to do those things well uh, as we game plan and, and, and put some of the fluff around it. One final question for you. Um, Steve, since there has been finals, some off time holidays, since you all are back together and this is, this is go time, is the team's focus where you want it to be? I love where our team's at. Um, I, I really thought uh, when we came back to work, um, whatever that was, you know, really getting back to it, I think it was the 22nd, no, excuse me, end of the 22nd, but whatever that was, like a couple Fridays ago, I don't even know the dates anymore. It's been a long month. Um, they were ready, you know, our guys were ready. You know, I, I don't think they even wanted to stop practicing, but they, I, know, I knew that they needed it. We were a little fatigued by that, by that Big 12 championship game. Um, this was a heck of a week we just had last week. Uh, they had a few days for, there for the holidays and, and we came back the last two days and had two really good days of work. I like the mentality, so I am. I, I feel good about where we're at. I know that the hay is not in the barn for us. We've got work to do this week while we're here. Uh, to put ourselves in the best position to be successful. All right, that's our uh, media availability for the Sugar Bowl. Uh, one thing I thought was really interesting, and you heard him say it earlier, that you know they they got after it at one point. Um, he chose to go good on good, and he talked about the defense. The offensive line needs to feel the rhythm of their defensive front. Um, talking about basically getting their offensive line some quality reps against high-level competition so that they aren't necessarily shell-shocked after a almost a month being off. And he talked about their DBs essentially feeling or at least being able to compete against the rhythm of their offense. I think he's talking about their elite wide receiving core and testing some of the uh, these troubleshooting some of the troublesome areas are the problematic areas for Texas in that secondary, which are going to be how do we cover without Derek Williams, our best covered safety for the first half. What are our adjustments? Is it moving today bear into safety? What is it going to be? Let's right now, because our, because if you look at the Washington and the Texas offense, honestly, there's a very, there's a doppelganger feel to it. Washington's offense operates a little slower. They're about 75th in the country in plays per minute. Um, so Sark likes to operate a little bit more of tempo, but a lot of pre-snap motions and shifts. We know Sark loved the vertical shots before he had to curtail them. They are the most vertically centric offense in the country and really good at it. High level quarterbacks, really good. This is probably one of the top three best matchup for wide receiving cores in the country. Their DBs won't be surprised or, you know, awed by the great, um, skill, dynamic skill, talent of Texas wide receiving core because they face it in practice themselves. So I'm sure Kaylin DeBoer is doing some of the same things. Their weakness is their pass defense. It's a really doppelganger-like feel to these teams. 
And I bet Sark wanted to essentially troubleshoot his defense um, where he knows they're going to attack. And we know we everybody knows where they're going to attack. Yeah. <laughs> well, and Michael Penix is, a, is an elite thrower of the football. I mean, he yeah. really can throw it. And he's got three really good receivers. You know, as a, I want to get into this with you, Rod, as we move forward. We'll get to some what the facts coming up. Also, congratulate the Texas State Bobcats on their first ever bowl win hey. down there at Texas State. Props to Don Coriel, the AD, and yes, G.J. Kinney. What a night that was in Fort Worth or in, in Dallas. How about the fact that they drank the, uh, the place out of beer? By the third quarter. Is that is that real? That is real. Wow. The Texas State fans showed up and they ran out of beer at showed SMU. Showed up and pulled up. By third quarter. Like, by the third quarter. <laughs> showed up and pulled up. Is there up. anything more on brand than Texas State, <laughs> the party school, <laughs> drinking them out of beer? Uh, but that was pretty awesome. So we'll get to some of the other bowl games and what's the facts. But I want to get with you. You, uh, you. you prepared for a lot of good receivers as a cornerback in college in the pros. Uh, let's get some scouting reports on this on Roma Dunze and uh, uh, gosh, I mean this is a really good core Jaylen guys. Polk, Jalen McMillan, those, they're good. They're good, yeah. and I want your thoughts on them as a corner. But also, as you said, Texas can simulate that for their corners in practice, right? You can, can. you throw an X man an AD Mitchell, uh, Jay Witt. They can throw some really good three NFL receivers of their own at these guys to go good on good and try to sharpen this for, for what should be a heck of a game on Monday night. We'll come back, hit that. We go all morning. We got uh, five hours of tremendous conversation this morning, getting ready for Washington and Texas in the Sugar Bowl, plus the other bowl games. Week 16 in the NFL, all part of a busy Thursday. You're on Hook em Up with Ian Rodby. Aaron Hogan, Rod Babers, Hook Em Up, 1019 AM 1260, The Horn. Start spreading the news, I'm leaving today. I want All right, Rod Babers, you ready for some What the Facts, including the uh, Big 12, off to a 3-0 start so far in their hey. bowl game, 3-0 start. Congrats to the Big 12, baby. West Virginia 30, North Carolina 10, Oklahoma State 31, Texas A&M 23 last night. Kansas rolled over UNLV out there in the uh, guaranteed rate bowl in Phoenix 49-36. Uh, so 3-0. Guaranteed so, rate bowl? Yes, sir. Wow. There you go. Yes. How much do these bowl sponsorships cost? Uh, it depends on the bowl. I'm not sure. I'm surprised that, like, Barstool had jumped on one of these. They do I'm have sure one. I'm sure they will. Do they Barstool have one? does? The Arizona Bowl is the Barstool Bowl now. All right, oh, I think it already. It I, I think uh, it might be coming up soon. I, it might have happened. I don't know. Bowl season doesn't mean the same to me anymore. I, I, like I said I don't pay attention, so I don't really. If your school's in much. it, I mean, because somebody mentioned Texas State. I mean, we mentioned Texas State. I mean, give props to that was huge for that program. I mean, uh, uh, to to be you know that was a day after Christmas night game uh, or late afternoon into the evening uh, up there in Dallas, and you know that's the first time that program's ever been in a bowl. So it, it does mean a lot to them. And it was good for G.J. Kinney to get some national eyeballs on his program, how fast they play, how uh, aggressive they play. And uh, now their defensive coordinator, by the way, is off to uh, to work where it, he got hired, where he got hired somewhere. Um, 
Um, oh, Manny Diaz hired him at Duke. Mm, okay. to come in, uh, the defense coordinator at Texas State. So, you know, that that's good. But, again, for in a large measure, measure, bowl games don't mean what they used to. Same time, Big 12's 3-0 and so far. 3-0. and three beautiful and thing. 3-0. and uh, Yeah, you're right, Ty. It was a 2022 Arizona Bowl, so they already jumped on it. I'm late. They I'm might not be doing it this year. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. You, they, you, I don't you know, know how they I roll. Think, it's very uh, – it's it was a commit miss. to the bit thing. Commit yeah. to the bit. They, they, they had the Big bit. Cat, if you know who Big Cat Dan Katz is. Yeah. He sung the national anthem, and they had, like, okay. one of their employees uh, come in on, uh, like, he he dropped in from a plane before the game. And nice. They did it. They had a few of their employees call the game. It was cool. Nice. All right. Well, I remember, tickets, our friends at Ticket City had a bowl game for a while. That's Ticket right. City Bowl up Shout in out. Dallas. Played at the Cotton Bowl. Yeah. Shout out to Ticket City. <laughs> you can get one. Pop-Tarts has one now. Pop-Tart. That'll be the Pop-Tart Bowl. The Pop-Tart Bowl. Pop-Tart's making a comeback or something? Like, I guess. I don't know that they ever went away. My yeah. kids love Pop-Tarts. The weirdest one to me is how the Tostitos, like, I think of Tostitos Fiesta Bowl, and now it's the PlayStation Fiesta Bowl. That doesn't, oh, yeah. that doesn't well, roll yeah, off the that, tongue that, as much as well. Well, that's, well, like, none of them. I mean, that, that Pop-Tart Bowl, which is tonight or today, was the Camping World Bowl, and it was yeah. the, you know, right. this and that bowl. It's been, you know, they, they're, they're looking for a sponsor every year. Yeah, exactly. They, they like, I think they like rotating the sponsorships, actually, now, instead of having, like, one main sponsor, because you have so much obligation to try to please that sponsor and, you know, to uh, the exclusivity yeah, right, yeah, yeah. of having that one sponsor. Now they're like, no, we can pitch it to anybody. We can yeah. pitch to anybody, and we can pitch to any industry. Now it ain't just one industry or one company. No, no, no. We can – anybody. We're up for grabs pretty much. Well, and, you know – We're a you, billboard. Well, look, remember, think about <laughs> next year. Like, if you think the bowl games this year are, are not as uh, meaningful and, and they've been trending this direction, next year when there's a 12-team playoff and there are playoff games mm-hmm. through December – because I've always said one of the reasons there are so many bowl games is ESPN, mainly ESPN, was looking for TV programming during a slow yeah, time so of the holiday that, season. Right about that. Uh, so they'll, they'll help back them, and they're looking for TV programming. When people are taking off time from work through the holidays, uh, you flip on the TV and it's just on, um, whether you're really paying attention to it or not. Uh, but, you know, now, like, you know, ESPN is going to be in on, you know, potentially carrying these playoff games. SMU plays year. at 10 a.m. today. Yeah, in the Fenway Bowl in oh, Boston. That's, uh, you know what, that's kind of fun. Well, but nobody's going to watch it. Well, I'm going to start watching it during the show and pop it on. That's 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. It'll be on here, Rod. We'll, we'll put it on the main screen here. There you go. But uh, I will say that uh, you know, that game is at 10 o'clock today. Is that, I mean, you played in bowl games, Rod. But to, if you're SMU and you had a great season, you're going to Boston in December. Mm. Come on, man. Yeah, I'm, I, I was watching Virginia Tech play good. somebody yesterday in the rain. You wonder uh, why guys are opting out and tra- you know oh, yeah. what I mean? and transferring before the bowl. Why don't they want the bowl? Because some of these bowls are not well, attractive. If you turn it, it was the military bowl yesterday. It was in Annapolis, Maryland. It was like mm. 50 degrees and pouring down rain. Come on, man. And Tulane was playing uh, oh. Virginia Tech. And I was like, is that even miserable. a treat? It sounds yeah. horrible. It's exactly. You know, players are like, I don't want to go to that bowl. These, these bowls are not in exotic, exotic locations and stuff like that or picturesque locales. No. Oh, uh, they're in places where nobody wants Send to visit. Send me to the beach. In the, exactly. In the wood. Hey, I want to go to that bowl. What's the uh, bowl the that Bahamas uh, bowl. Coach Tim Beck went to? Was that it? Oh, Tim the Beck? Hawaii. Hawaii. Yeah, uh, the, the Hawaii. Hawaii. He had yeah. his shirt off. And he, with the cheerleaders, the, the dance team. <laughs> yeah. I want to go to that bowl. Yes. <laughs> the less guys opted out. Speaking of opted out, how about this? And nearly 40 players um, have combined um, to opt out or transfer out of the Orange Bowl between uh, with Georgia. And Georgia Florida and Florida State. State. Georgia and Florida State. Tate, Ro- Tate Rodemaker is the yeah. latest, the quarterback. Yeah, they're close to 40 players, like transferring uh, either or opting out in yes. this bowl game. So, yes. Man. Yikes. Depleted uh, rosters. I think the game today, K-State playing uh, uh, NC State, 32 players in that game have opted out and are, are either are in the portal. <laughs> That's just, uh, yeah, I mean, exactly. He's, he's, I mean, and some of these bowls are actually, I mean, Orange Bowl is a nice bowl. But it just, a, it just doesn't beat. matter to these guys. They got Their priority is we got to get on the roster. I got to get me a scholarship via transfer portal. Or if I'm, you know, deciding to opt out, it's because I'm going to the NFL, and that's my priority. I'm Speaking about the of league. the NFL, Rod, you know, uh, we know the NFL's taken over everything. You know, the NBA used to own Christmas Day. Nah, used yeah. to own Christmas Day. Was their day it's to kind of launch? It's the NFL's now, man. Well, yeah. they happen to have a Monday triple header on Christmas Day. Sports calendar. They just take – they want to monopolize it all. They want to – literally. Like Monopoly. So there were five <laughs> big NBA games on that day. And if you add up all the viewers for those five games, it doesn't even come close to matching one of the NFL games. I mean, it's it's minuscule in comparison. The, the biggest rating the NBA got was the Warriors-Nuggets game, Denver and Golden State. Yeah. A lot of, you know, that's the defending champions against Steph and the, and the Warriors. A little over four million people tuned into that game. 
The Chiefs played the Raiders. Almost 30 million people tuned into the Chiefs Raiders on Christmas Day. Obviously, the Raiders got the big upset. And that, that one, that was also on Nickelodeon. That was the first game at noon. That game topped out at almost 38 million, 38 million people tuning in if you're on Nickelodeon and on um, yeah. The adults are watching that, too, because they're watching to see what all of the different tricks uh, that <laughs> yeah. they're trying to – these candy cigarettes the NFL is throwing out there, trying to get the yeah. viewership of the kids and viewership of young girls uh, to, to increase for the NFL. It, it, and they're doing a good job. They're it, doing a good job of it. It was a Christmas miracle for me. I, I, oh. I, I secured my budget for, for New Orleans. I'll be having a good time. Oh, you did? Yeah, I picked you, up every, every, every underdog. Play, or I had – Baltimore money line, or Raiders money line, and and the Giants with the points. And nice. It was it was coming off a night in which if the Cowboys would have won, I would have made the most money I've ever made in my life sports betting. So it was <laughs> it, it was a good day. It was a good day. If yeah. the Cowboys would have won, that's a well, famous no, last word. Well, Going no, I mean to... that's what I'm saying. The next day, I had a Christmas Day miracle. I made everything back, and then plus some. Now I'm gonna have How a fun the time. Raiders? in New Antonio Pierce, big win. The Chiefs are a mess. But, yeah, 30 million people or so tuned into that game. Giants, Eagles, Ravens, Niners, which was a big surprise. I wanted and- to see Taylor Swift. And, 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 and you know what? There's a great gift now. I'm sure you saw it, Ty, of Taylor Swift consoling Brittany Mahomes. <laughs> and they're shocked by the loss. Oh, I, 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 the tide oh, is brilliant. finally turning, starting to turn. I'm, I've been telling you all this for weeks. She's She's getting close to people not liking her. I mean, my yeah, but that's why the ratings are still high, though. Oh, I know. I know. My, my girlfriend, she's one of them. She's like, I used to like Taylor Swift, and now I can't stand her. So yeah. it's it's happening. Just just watch out, guys. By this time next year, she'll be canceled, probably. Uh, you know what? Canceled. Everybody everybody hates billionaires. Once you become a billionaire, everybody's going to hate you, and yeah. she's already on the cusp of being a billionaire, already a billionaire. Are, are any of our billionaires liked? Who likes the billionaires? It's going to be like, yeah. the, Elon like Musk, the Elon Musk effect yeah. where everyone loved him, everyone loved him, and he makes yeah, one wrong exactly. move, one All wrong move, and like everyone that, hates though. him. All the billionaires are like that. All the billionaires were beloved at one time, and then they end up being hated. It's like, what happened? No, we hate them. Because we just hate people who accomplish and achieve that much. It's well, natural. That's natural. Yeah. It is. And plus, and if they're on the center of attention, like Taylor Swift has been for the last 15 years, yeah. I mean, she was a star at if, 18. There's a lot to hate about you if you're that rich. Yeah. And, you, <laughs> and that, that front center for that long, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, just the way that goes. Yeah. I would also say Mark Cuban's a billionaire, and now he's even a further billionaire. Yesterday, yeah. the NBA – Speaking of the NBA, the uh, the governors approved the, the sale. Governor. The governors approved the sale of his Dallas Mavericks to the uh, the Sands Casino family. How much? The Adelsons, three and a half billion. Oh, that's, I thought that, I thought it'd be a little bit higher actually. And it's such a weird deal. Oh, I thought it'd be a little bit Mark higher. Mark Cuban was holding court with the media yesterday, talking about how this is going to work. That he doesn't have an official accepted title of head of basketball operations, but. He says, I've been told. They told me I'm in charge of basketball. They're, he, not, they're not basketball Is he keeping any stake in it? A small minority stake? Very small. Very small. But he's selling almost all of his majority yeah. stake. The in sale it. and okay. agreement does not outline a specific Maybe role for Maybe that's why it's Cuban. not as big because it's not, not total on Patrick state. Dumont will be the team's governor. So he's the owner. The governor. The, families, the Dumont family and the uh, Adelson family have bought the Mavericks. And Mark Cuban is still in charge, I guess, until he's not. I don't know. I don't know what's it's going weird. on with that deal. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's never happened before where an owner sells his team, but he stays in control of the product for now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, exactly. Something something weird is happening. It feels like it. It feels like something, something shady is going on. All right, we'll <laughs> come back. We'll hook him up. That's one hour down, four to go on a Thursday. Ian Rodby, Ty as well.
Hook them up with Ian Rodby rolls on on a Thursday. Good to be back. It's also good to have a few days away and then join the holiday. Rod went down to Houston and everybody wanted to uh, take pictures with the baby. Yes, sir. Your phone is now full of pictures. You need what you say? You need a new. You need a new phone or you need a new plan for your phone? No, I need like, a new phone. You got new, need more memory and I whatnot. Need more memory, yeah, my memory's done. It's just <laughs> Washington stuff, and baby stuff, pretty much on my phone. So I got, I got to get it though. I'm not getting rid of my my content, my material. Got to save it all. You got too much save in there. It all. I got too much good stuff, especially the baby's photos. So I'm not getting rid of them. Just gonna get a new phone. I need a new memory anyway. Hey, you can also can download it onto memory sticks and those kind of things. That's too. what the cloud's That's for. Sure the, yeah, I don't even know how the cloud works. I'll help you out with that. It's like 99 what? cents a month. It'll get you some more memory. I, no, I got the cloud. Everybody has the cloud. I don't know how it works. I don't know how to access it. I don't even know really what it does. I don't know where it is. Like, I don't know. It's up in the clouds. Any, exactly. I've no, I've, nobody really knows anything about how the cloud works. They just know that the cloud is there. You need to pay for the cloud. That's it. Can you know how to access the cloud? Can I know how to retrieve all my stuff from the cloud? Everything that's on your phone, on the photos, it's not actually on your phone. It's just in the cloud. <laughs> that's the way I understand it. Exactly. Everybody understands the cloud. I don't know. The cloud. It's in the cloud. And so you just know that it's never lost. It's in the cloud. This is how guys are getting caught cheating, too, because it's all in the cloud. Yep. And your, your, your wife has, and your women have access to that cloud. It's really, the cloud, I, I think it's, I don't know. I don't like the cloud. It's too much mystery about the cloud. It's too vague. When you've seen the have these Hollywood actresses get their 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 nudie pics in yeah, the cloud. Yeah, you know what I mean? Jennifer How Lawrence. They it? It, was, it was in the cloud. Was in the cloud. Oh, they had it in the cloud. Act. That's why it's always <laughs> good it to do like a quarterly purge of your of your camera roll, or at least for me as a young man. <laughs> well, yeah, if you got stuff like you and I ain't got nothing in mind that anybody wants other than <laughs> stats, nuggets. You got junk photos and photos. Uh, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe. I don't yeah, know. pictures of, that ladies have sent you that you've saved, and that's good stuff. But I'm past. <laughs> my wife don't send me stuff like that anymore. Yeah, we had those times when we first got together. Your dad sent now me stuff like that. Uh, yeah, she's she, a mama. She's a mama. She don't send them. Yeah, she may send photos, but they're not what they used to be. <laughs> <laughs> Look what the baby did. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Hey, the best word of advice my dad ever gave me is once you, he's like, once you post something on the internet, it's there forever. And that, that's and right. That, and that's, that's, that's even more true these days. That's the cloud. It's there. That's the cloud. It's, yeah. uh, lives, it lives, it lives in, in, uh, in all its glory or in infamy. You know what yeah, I mean? Whichever exactly one it might be. Right. All right, so a lot to do this hour. Rod will have his first rant of two today. We'll also uh, talk, obviously, more Texas, Washington. Uh, next couple of days into Monday will be uh, essentially a, a you know, four-day pregame, five-day pregame into the Longhorns yep. and Washington and the Sugar Bowl as we get you ready for it. We've also talked about the uh, the two uh, portal, one portal and one high school edition that came in for the Longhorns while we were out on break. Uh, the Longhorns with 23 high school players to officially round out the early window. Also, the UTSA edge rusher, Trey Moore, nation's number one rated edge rusher in the portal, according to On3 Sports, chose Texas over the weekend um, on Saturday. Mm -hmm. So the Horns are going to have 26 new players on their roster for 2024, and 21 of them, Rod, will be here in January, uh, which is just incredible yeah. as they're getting ready for this game. Also, we'll tell you, we'll be on live today and tomorrow. Also, Patrick Davis in the Sports Complex tomorrow, uh, t this afternoon and tomorrow afternoon, full shows into the weekend. And then Monday morning we'll be out because it's New Year's Day, but uh, won't be on the morning show. But we will have a full pregame show. Yes, sir. Uh, and, you know, and, and coverage from New Orleans. want to thank our friends at Hayes City Store and Ice House and Taste on Maine and Buda as our travel partners to get us to New Orleans and make sure this happens to get some live coverage. And it's uh, official now, Rod, right on, on that uh, Monday from 4 to 7. Um, ahead of the kickoff of Texas and, uh, and Washington and Sugar Bowl. Uh, I will be my part of the pregame show with you and Patrick Davis back here. Uh, Ty and myself and uh, the crew will be at Manning's Restaurant Ooh, in New Orleans. Doing it big. Which is right over by Harrah's, the casino, if you know where that yeah. is, at the end of uh, Canal. Um, you know, the Mannings have a great sports bar and restaurant there. Of course um, they do. Archie, Archie Manning actually opened that. And it's a great spot, so we'll be there live. Uh, Bobby Burton and the On Texas football crew will be there as well, so we'll have a lot of fun. So if you're looking for a spot ahead of the game, get over to Manning's on, on uh, Monday, mm -hmm. and we'll be there getting you cranked up for that. And then, of course, on Tuesday morning, uh, you'll be here, but I'll be coming live from the uh, – uh, the, the Sugar Bowl and the the media center and the main media hotel. So live coverage from New Orleans, taking you there to the Sugar Bowl if you're not going. Thanks to our friends at Hayes City Store and Taste on Main in Buda, who will be telling you all about. Got Ooh. to get out to a great dinner at uh, Taste on Main during my downtime, which was phenomenal. 
It's going to be a party going on. It's going to be a party. It's going to be a party. Yeah. It's New Orleans. It's New Year's. It's the Sugar Bowl, which is fun in itself. Ty's hitting down there. Now you tell me. Now, now did you tell us, Ty, that you're, you're angling on trying to get to a pregame party, not, not at Manning's Restaurant, but a, the Manning ho- home, the home of the Mannings. Is this right? Is this what, what I'm hearing? Uh, oh, yeah. Potentially? I'm, I'm trying to work myself in. I was told that <laughs> it's a pretty good chance. Uh, you know, the Taft family, the good family friends of mine, and that's, that's where they will be pregaming. Taft Daddy. So uh, uh, his older brother is one of my best friends. I've been known him for my entire life pretty much. So I'm going to try to make it there, do some wasted networking. Mm-hmm. All right. And, and as of right now, this Thursday morning, Ty, you still don't have a ticket to the game. No, I've been offered a few face value um, tickets. It's just, you know, I, I, I it's going to be a last minute call. I do have a friend that's bringing a wheelchair to New Orleans and he has a plan to sneak into the game. And I, I don't know if I want to be part of that. Uh, I'll have to tell it. That might be a 10 o'clock story, his plan to get in. But it, it's we had an hour long conversation yesterday. And it was him talking about through a few different scenarios on, on how he's going to get into the game without paying for a ticket. Hold on, Man, he's going to use a wheelchair to do it. I mean, we're going full committing to the bid here. Yeah, wow. yeah. You're going to use a potential the perception of a disability. Yeah, this, this, get this might be over the line. Game. <laughs> might, this is over the line. Dude, this is way man. over the line. Okay, okay. No, man. Let me, let me that's pre- bad karma let, right let, there, let bro. Me that's preface bad karma. This guy. It's like, it's, it's like, is that worse than parking in a, a, a handicap spot? Oh, no, <laughs> no, because you're not oh, you're not taking anything I, away from anybody at that point. You're just that is fair. What are you going to do with the wheelchair once you get in? You have to you Which, have to commit to it and stay yeah, in it the whole time. Yeah, but yeah, you can't pretending to have a disability. Come on. I don't know. This guy, he went up to Fort Worth for the TCU game this year, and he, I don't know if I believe him. He he says he went through a sewer and came out in the stadium. So Ooh, I, 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 <laughs> this, this guy, he's one of the crazy. I've known him my whole entire life. He's one of the craziest people I know. So I don't doubt it. And I, I don't doubt that he's going to get in either. I don't think it'll work for me, but I'm sure it'll work for him. It might work for him. I mean, some people, it, you know, they they can pull off stuff like that. They, I, I, I don't think I have the confidence to go that. I used to be able to do stuff, like just be able to get into a club, but I've never think the disability to get into stuff like that. I will say that wow. uh, the last time the Longhorns played for the national championship, and that, not, not, not the last time, the time they won the national championship last, 2005, oh, five, the yeah. 06 Rose Bowl. Man. My great friend uh, Tom Gimble, he used to be the, uh, the general manager at Austin City Limits Television, now living in New York. He finagled his way in. He didn't do it uh, that covert, <laughs> but he ended up because he couldn't get a ticket. Did he fake a disability? No, he he faked being one of the beer vendors. He somehow oh. got a hold of one because like, he didn't have a ticket, and That's he couldn't find good. find one. Like and that. right as ki- the game was kicking off, he was uh. hanging around and found his way in as a beer vendor. That's I've seen a lot of people do that brilliant. for ACL. Like you that put on you put on like brilliant. a security vest or just one of those reflective and it's vests. It's funny. It's one of those. He was just thinking. He was looking for an angle, and he kind of just stumbled into it, and wow. it's like it worked. That's, you got to see the Rose Bowl. You know Bowl. what? I'm not going to lie. That's brilliant. Hey, and just that to clarify brilliant. to all the texters out there already railing me for, for this wheelchair <laughs> thing. Rightfully uh, so. Uh, you're not doing that. This is not my idea. I was just. And uh, you're not doing it. No, I am not doing it. This is one of my but crazy this, friends the, here. But he oh, is. Wow. Uh, he's actually going to haul a wheelchair to. That Nola. was one of. I, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you all the ideas he had later. But it, that was just one oh. of the many, many creative ideas he had to get into the game. Wow. Too creative much. slash Too awful. Much. Uh, yeah, yeah, I want to say awful. awful, awful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This guy's like on the show Jackass or something. You know what I mean, I'm saying? I can say he's committing to it. Man, the wheelchair to, to get in there. And then, oh, uh, you know what? I'm not even going to talk about it. I was like, what if he did get in? Does he stay in the wheelchair? Is he going to abandon the wheelchair? I think at that point, you, you, you abandon the wheelchair, right? You abandon <laughs> <laughs> Mission accomplished, You abandon it. Right? Where are you going to leave it? I was saying, I don't know, to like, the Give it to security. Leave it in the bathroom. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, you leave it in the stall. You go into the stalls, with a, you know, into the handicapped stall, and I guess you just. But then leave it's in it the way when someone is actually handicapped comes that in. That is true. I'm agreeing with you. Hey, listen, I'm, I don't know how to think like a sociopath here. I'm just trying. <laughs> I think you're right about that. <laughs> hey, let's get to the headlines real quick. Then Rod will have a rant as we uh, find ways to finagle ourselves into the Sugar Bowl. Top Gun Reynolds and a lot of bring it to you. Start with college football. Third-ranked Longhorns have arrived in New Orleans for the final few days of on-site prep for their showdown with second-ranked Washington in the All-State Sugar Bowl. Of course, semifinal round of the college football playoff. We'll have much more on that coming up throughout the morning. Also, some college football. There were four bowl games yesterday. A pair of boons for the Big 12 down in Houston last night. Oklahoma State took down Texas A&M 41-23 in the Texas Bowl. Quarterback Alan Bowman for the Cowboys threw for 404 yards, a pair of touchdowns. Ollie Gordon ran for 118 yards and a score. 
I can say shorthanded Aggie scene only had uh, under 50 scholarship players dressed for that game last night. Also last night, USC top Louisville 42-28 in the Holiday Bowl. Uh, West Virginia rolled past uh, North Carolina in the Duke's Mayo Bowl 30-10. to And Virginia Tech upset Tulane in the Military Bowl. Four more bowl games today starting at 10 a.m. this morning. SMU will face Boston College at the Fenway Bowl in Beantown. Rutgers in Miami in the Pinstripe Bowl in New York. NC State meets K-State in the Pop-Tart Bowl in Orlando. And tonight, good game down in San Antonio, the always fun Alamo Bowl. 12th ranked Oklahoma facing 14th ranked Arizona. If you missed it on Tuesday night, congratulations to the Texas State Bobcats. They rolled it up on um, in the first responders bowl as the uh, the Bobcats get their first ever bowl win, 45 to 21. Uh, their linebacker Brian Holloway, the fifth year player, returned two interceptions for touchdowns. Also Jamal Jeter. Ran for three scores in that game as they beat the Rice Owls and win their uh, bowl game. But in the NBA last night, Phoenix down Houston, 129-113. Dallas, the Mavericks lost at home to Cleveland, 113-110. How about the local product, Jared Allen, the lifetime Longhorn, uh, 24 points, 23 rebounds in that game. Earlier in the day, the uh, Mavericks were officially sold. NBA owners officially, officially approved the sale of controlling interest of the Mavericks from Mark Cuban to the family that runs the Las Vegas Sands Casino Company for somewhere in the neighborhood of $3.5 billion. College Hoops, fifth-ranked Texas women, finished their non Conference schedule a perfect 13-0 yesterday. They whipped Jackson State at the Moody Center 97-52. Rory Harmon did not play in that game with an undisclosed injury. Longhorns will open Big 12 Conference play on Saturday uh, afternoon, hosting 10th-ranked Baylor and NFL Week 16. Kicks off tonight in Cleveland. Joe Flacco and the resurgent Browns hosting the New York Jets. Um, we'll get into some uh, Texas, more Texas-Washington discussion um, here coming up in Raj Round the Day. Uh, but can we talk about the Cowboys a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Let's, because uh, NFL Week 16 does kick off tonight. Let's talk about uh, the Cowboys a little bit. Let's dive into Rod's rant. I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Find out what happens when people stop being polite and start getting real. You ain't keeping it real. My God, okay, it's happening. Everybody stay calm. Oh, no, you've done it, it now. It's time for Rod's Rant of the Day. Hold on to your butts. Uh, all right, before we get back to uh, Texas versus Washington, so most of the show will be devoted to, uh, we got to talk about the Cowboys. we got to talk about the Cowboys just a little bit because um, – I'm not going to say that you foreshadowed that Miami loss, E, but you did give the little nugget that the, the Cowboys hadn't won a road game against a double-digit win team of significance. Yeah. Of significance, because there were some times where it, I guess the opposing team it was already in the playoffs and their seating was already determined and they didn't even play their starters the whole game and the Cowboys may have won one of those games. Uh, but you pointed out they hadn't beaten a double-digit team um, on the road and in, it was in December? Yeah, since 2009 when they beat Drew Brees. Of significance. Of so, significance, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because the other ones, like I said, didn't matter. Yeah, a game that was really, really important to both teams. Yes, that mattered to both teams. And it showed up again. It showed up again for the Cowboys, uh, just not being able to make enough plays in critical moments to be able to win that game against Miami. And Miami is a, a, a good team. I mean, that's a, a, a team. 11 and 4 now. Yeah, that, that's a good team. But um, it, it, I think it's a cultural thing. You go, that stat going all the way back to 2009. That's, that's, uh, that's coaches, that's you know, multiple starting quarterbacks, different coaches. Obviously, the makeup of the roster has changed a ton in that time. Uh, the leadership hasn't changed that much. Still got Jerry Jones there, but uh, to me, that's it's some something that the Cowboys have to deal with culturally. And I don't know if um if this season they're gonna figure that out because they haven't really all the playoff teams they've been all the teams projected to be in the playoffs. Um, they pretty much they the the Philadelphia Eagles win is the only one I believe where they have beaten a, a team that's projected to go to the playoffs. Um, that's a problem for the Cowboys. Because uh, they got to go on the road, and they want to win a game on the road in the playoffs, and they got to beat good teams on the road in the playoffs. And here's the stat that stood out to me for the Cowboys: um, the Cowboys are now one in seven in their last eight road games against nine plus win teams. They beat the Vikings, the only thirteen win team with a negative scoring differential in NFL history. 
uh, last year. They beat them forty to three. Yeah, that was the, that's they won. That's they won. They won in seven in the last eight road games against teams with nine plus wins, and their one win was against a team that inexplicably was able to win thirteen games with the worst scoring differential for a thirteen win team in NFL history. So I, I I love what the Cowboys have done. It's I'm not sure it's enough for them to compete for a Super Bowl. Can they get to the NFC title game still? Maybe. Well, and you know, you combine the loss to Miami with the loss to Buffalo the week previous when they were really lame and weren't even competitive. At least against Miami on Saturday or Sunday, they were I mean it was twenty two I mean they they lost on a walk off field goal. I mean twenty two twenty is a heartbreaker. But, you know, again, it was a, a team that was inconsistent. They got the big touchdown pass to C.D. Lamb to put the first touchdown on the board, and they really went to sleep offensively for the next two quarters and found themselves down 19-10 to 10 and then yep. had to rally. And I give, you know, Dak and the offense credit. They took the lead, right? Uh, Brandon Aubrey, and they got a touchdown to Brandon Cooks and took the lead 20-19, to 19, but they left 327 on the clock in the NFL on the road. That's – you know, typically the a good team. to step up, and they didn't. Yeah, and they couldn't get a, get a stop of Tua, uh, and they moved it down the field and uh, obviously were able to do exactly what they wanted to do. They bled, they bled every second of the 327 and kicked a field goal as time expired with Jason Sanders, and that's how the game ended. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a foreshadowing of what's to come in January when you have to go on the road, and they couldn't run the ball rod. And R- Rico Dowdle didn't play, and, you know, Tony Pollard, 12 carries, 38 yards. Uh, so the run game is still not where you want it. I know they played without Tyron Smith in that game, but that was a banged-up Dolphins team, too. Oh, yeah, that O-line was a mass unit, man. The Dolphins played with three or four three injured starters. offensive yeah, linemen. I was say, they had a couple of starters And out. then Jalen Waddle got hurt pretty early in the game. Um, Tyreek Hill was back, but they didn't have a full complement uh, of their offensive linemen and some key guys on defense. So that was a huge win for Miami and another disappointing big you know road loss in December for the Cowboys. Chance to showcase uh, that they were a different back to team. Back. Yeah, that they have a different kind of uh, football culture now. And I listen, I think they are. I, I love the strides they've made. I'm still not sure if they're good enough to make it to the NFC title game. We'll see. I think I think they, they're right there. I mean, they're second or third best team well, in the NFC. A, trust me, Saturday night's game will be a, a, an indicator too. Now, the Lions have already clinched the division. Uh, they did that last week with their win. Lions come in with Dan Campbell and Jared Goff, and that'll be a home game where the Cowboys have been beyond dominant this year. Uh, but this is a double-digit win team themselves who just want to want to you know. A, and with the 49ers loss, yeah, which I mean, the, the Detroit oh, Lions have a shot at the number one the, seed. Detroit Lions have a now shot at need, the one seed. Yeah, they need. Like I said they got a shot at the top seed. They need the uh, 49ers to to lose again. Yeah. Uh, um, but which could happen. <laughs> um, but they, they, but Brock Purdy would have to have an implosion like he had versus the Ravens. Um, but uh, that was another performance too that we can talk yeah, about. Yeah, we'll get into that one because, because I mean, the, both the Niners and the Lions are both eleven and four, and so there's you know the Lions have a lot to play for in this game, and the Cowboys are as we sit here this morning sitting in the five seed. The Eagles are in the in the two spot behind the Niners. But yeah, that Niners game, you know, four Brock Purdy interceptions. Mm-hmm. The you know the I mean as much as you know the Niners. It was surprising. You got to give the Ravens a ton of credit to go on the road, and they took it personal that they were a big underdog in that game. They took it personal that people were giving them no chance to win that game. And I think John Harbaugh really played that up, and uh, Lamar Jackson really played that up. And they played it. They didn't just beat the Niners; they drove the Niners. Man, they, they dominated the Niners. Yeah, no, it's that was uh, really impressive. Well, football is about matchups, and that ended up being a bad matchup for the Forty ers Now, who thought that was a bad matchup for the Forty Miners? But and this honestly kind of leads us to a Texas-Washington discussion because I've said this before. On paper, the 49ers were a better team. On paper, they were a better team. There's no question. Go look at all the all-pros they have. Go look at the way Brock Purdy was playing. Um, overall, you could say they had more advantages. If you check, check more boxes. But the advantages that the Ravens have were uh, more distinct, <laughs> and I think their uh, advantages – were much more um, effective and impactful than the advantage that the, the, the 49ers had. They had the best quarterback in that matchup. That was Lamar Jackson. You can argue they had the better head coach in that matchup, John Harbaugh, because he's accomplished more than my man Shano. Uh, and you could argue that their their strength, Baltimore Ravens' strength as an offense, was specifically matched up against a – a, a a point of vulnerability for the 49ers because the 49ers are built on their pass rush will get home. That's why they got so many damn pass rushers. Right. My man Shadow has stacked the right he stacked that defensive front with the best pass rush, complement of pass rushers in the league. 
All right, so that's what they're pretty much built on, that their front will get home in the passing game. But you got a, a, a quarterback like Lamar Jackson, whose strength is he's the greatest potential athlete at the quarterback position ever, and he can extend plays. So your pass rush, although getting pressure, doesn't convert to sacks and doesn't get home. He can extend the play, and then he can exploit your secondary, which is your biggest weakness. Because you don't have all pros all, all throughout your secondary. You're all pros on your front seven. Yeah, That's where all your all pros are. That's where your elite pass rushers are. So once he neutralizes that with his ability to run around and extend the play, oh, man, easy pickings, baby. We're going after that secondary. And they did. Now, this is how it relates to the Texas-Washington game. Texas is a better team on paper. They are. But Washington has advantages where? Quarterback? Head coach. Their, their strength is their passing game. I mean, the best passing offense in the country. And what is the weakness of Texas specifically? Passing defense. So that's why it's a better matchup than, than even on paper and even here and, you know, in terms of the analysis that we can break down is because we don't know which one of those advantages Texas is being a better overall roster and team or them having the better quarterback potentially better, not potentially, that better head coach because Ken DeBoer, I mean, he's 100, what, 103 and 11 or something like that. <laughs> I mean, he's damn good. Sark's ascending, but so is he. And he's the coach of the year this year. Um, and their passing game. If, if As you pointed out, Texas can't even get to Michael Penix like they did in last season. Yeah, they didn't sack Penix once last year. No negative it'll be a, plays. It'll be a long game. It will be. Well, look, I mean, uh, you they know. They won the Joe Moore Award, by the way, for the best offensive line, which is something we'll get to. Yeah, here. Washington. And I'd say this for the 49ers-Ravens game. I mean, if you look at it on paper, I mean, Christian McCaffrey had 130 yards from scrimmage and a touchdown. George Kittle had 126 yards receiving. Brandon Ayuk had 113 yards receiving. They moved the ball. It was just four turnovers. turnovers Brock Purdy threw four interceptions. Yep. And a couple of them were tips. A couple of them were off hands. But at the same time, they, you know. Gosh, the game Monday night, if either team wins the turnover battle 4 nothing, they're going to win the game. That's just period. It's End of football. story. Yeah. And that's what was really impressive to me on Monday night was that Ravens defense. I mean, the, the ability to force turnovers. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to say I gave up on the Ravens, but I soured a little bit on the Ravens when I saw them play the Rams. And the Rams, you know, went in there and the Ravens beat them. They beat them in overtime on a punt return. But they couldn't stop Matt Stafford, and they couldn't stop Puka Nakua, and they couldn't stop uh, Cooper Cup. They were just going up and down the field on him. And I thought, man, that, that, that defense I thought was elite. Maybe it's not as elite as I thought. Uh, but here we are against the Niners where they gave up yards, but they forced turnovers. They changed the game uh, by, by, by flipping the field the other way. And Lamar Jackson didn't have to be Superman. Lamar Jackson was good with 250 yards and two touchdowns. But – uh, and as you said, avoiding the pass rush, he didn't make the big mistakes. No. He didn't turn the football over. No, he did. And he, he, I think he just extended plays, which wore down the front. Yes. It wore down that 49 front because he was chasing him all over the damn field. So by the time yeah. he got five, six plays in, that front was worn out. Yeah, he it ran was, for 45 and yeah, threw so for they, 250. They just, it just like great. That's why football's about matchups, man. It's just, it was a, that's a bad matchup for the 49ers when you break it down and look at it just because of Lamar Jackson. And getting back to that defense about the Ravens, though, that Ravens defense has faced uh, two of the NFL's four teams with 11 wins this season. They beat the Lions 38-6, to beat the 49ers 33-19. to Wow. And we know Lamar Jackson's record versus NFC teams. Was he 20-1 and now? Yeah. Versus NFC teams. If you only see him once a year, it, it really does. You're shell-shocked, man, to see that kind of speed yeah. at quarterback, and it's hard to bring him down. It's hard to say the Ravens right now can't beat any team in the league. Well, and right now the AFC and the trip to the Super Bowl from that conference goes through Baltimore. Goes through Baltimore uh, now. Whether you're Miami or obviously Kansas City fading in a big, big way, whoever wins the, the you know, the, the South with Jacksonville, Houston. I mean, they're not, they're not really a threat to Jacksonville's Baltimore. Jacksonville's struggling now, man. Jacksonville, Ooh, Indianapolis, Houston. Uh, how about Cleveland? I mean, throw the Cleveland Browns in that conversation because the way Joe Flacco is playing, mm -hmm. three straight 300-yard games, oh, yeah. you know, Amari Cooper – with a huge game against the Texans on Saturday, on Saturday, on Sunday, I mean, uh, you know, all of a sudden that 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 Browns team with the number one defense in the in all of football, yep. and a, a, all this resurgent Joe Flacco, who's not just managing, he's playing great football right now. Uh, that's incredible what they've done to get the double digit wins in Cleveland. They could be a threat to Baltimore because they play them all the time, right? They're they're in the same division. They do know them that D, and they got the defense to neutralize them. I don't know if they have the offense, yeah, well. to go up against that defense right now. The way that 
when that Ravens defense is playing. Yeah, uh, and obviously against Houston, they went up against Case Keenum and Davis Mills in that game. Uh, Houston will have C.J. Stroud back when they play a really big game. Remember the Ravens held this Houston at nine points, and back then without uh, Houston's offense, it's just yeah. it's going to be lackluster. Turns out the offense was really good. That Ravens defense is just pretty damn good. They are really good. They show up, man. They look yeah. like the, uh, without a doubt, the team to beat uh, with a couple games to go in the regular season. In the ASC, NFC, uh, it's, it's in, you know, three teams at 11 and four, Eagles, Niners, and Lions. Now Lions play the Cowboys Saturday night. All right, we'll come back. Good stuff in Rod's rant from the NFL weekend. We'll take your thoughts, Cowboys fans. What say you? Back-to-back road losses to winning teams. Needed to uh, prove you could win one of those games. They couldn't. Now they come home to host the Lions. Uh, Texans hosting the uh, Tennessee Titans on Sunday with C.J. Stroud back as their starting quarterback and still a playoff spot out there. If Houston, by the way, if Houston beats Tennessee and then beats Indianapolis, my math says they're in as a playoff wow. team. But they got to do both of those. they got to beat Tennessee at home, then they have to go on the road and beat Indianapolis. If they do that, they'll get to 10 wins and be 10-7, and seven, and I think they're in as a wild card. Will they get C.J. back to do it? They do. C.J. will be back this week. There you go. He's practicing at least. He's out practicing. He's on the field. I think they feel like he's going to get through the concussion protocols and be ready to go for that game. Uh, all right, we'll come back. We'll pick it up with uh, Texas and Washington chatter. It is a Thursday edition of Hook em Up with Ian Rodby.
Aaron Hogan, Rod Babers. Hook them up. 1019 AM 1260. The Horn. Appreciate your uh, conversation on the text line 512 447 3776. This says, guys, in the Cowboys game, don't forget about the fumble on the one. You know, that was. Uh, mm. You know, it was one play after Tony Pollard I thought should have gotten in the end zone. I mean, he, he just doesn't have a known nose for the end zone, Rod. Yeah, he's not a uh, great short yardage goal line back. He looked like he had the edge, and uh, we've seen that all year where he, he comes up just short. I don't know um, how he missed that. And, good, you know, it was good effort play by the linebacker for the Dolphins, but, yeah, it came up just an inch short, and then they tried to hand it to the fullback and fumbled it uh, Le- mm. Le- Lepke on the next play, and obviously those were seven points the Cowboys could never get back. And, uh, that was critical. And that's what we've talked about a lot with the Cowboys, Rod. The, the second guess is, you know, they didn't go after a Derrick Henry. They didn't address, you know, kind of a power running back in the draft or in free agency or even in the tr- before the trade deadline. And I think it's come back to get him. They didn't have Rico Dowdle for that game. And he's been their better goal line player yeah. this year. And trust me, as somebody who's, as a fantasy owner of Tony Pollard, we saw that all year where he couldn't find the end zone. He did score some touchdowns, but not nearly what uh, – Not in short yardage. Like Zeke Elliott had like 13 touchdowns last year for the Cowboys, yeah. if I remember right. And Ty talked about that, that they they just didn't have a short yardage back. And that I think that's hurt him a couple. It hurt him in the Eagles game when they lost on the road at Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Hurt him at Arizona when they lost to the Cardinals earlier this year on the road where they couldn't pound one in when they needed to. I mean, Dak Prescott didn't turn the ball over in that game. Outside of – he didn't throw a pick. I know that. And they still lost the game 22-20. That was tough. This says Jets have to be kicking themselves for not signing Joe Flacco. I think there's a lot of Jets fans wondering, well, why didn't we sign Joe Flacco when Aaron Rodgers got hurt on the fourth play of the season? Yeah, because their blueprint could be very similar to the Browns. Yes. Like really good defense, keeps you in the game. You see the quarterback that can, you know, either go win the game for you when you need to or be able to put together some sustained drives to give your defense a break. That's what Flacco's doing. He's playing winning football. It's almost like they He's playing winning football. Kevin did Stavosky they really think Zach great, Wilson yeah. was going to be better? Is that really uh, what they thought? Uh, it, they had they, he was the backup. Well, I think so, I think two things happened over the weekend with the NFL. I think Lamar Jackson is now your clear leader for MVP. Yeah, which and you know what, and it's not a statistical for him to. It, I don't think it's statistically why he is separating himself from the pack. Right? It ain't statistics. It's now that he has the biggest wins. Yes. And his team now is the front runner to get the number one seed. This would be a good year for a co MVP. Yeah. It'd be a good year for it. You know what I mean? Give it to somebody who actually has achieved statistically. And you know what? I wouldn't even care if it's somebody who's not a quarterback. Well, that's for Christian McCaffrey. He had a big game against the Ravens. Yeah, he didn't throw any interceptions. Yeah, you can do it. Give it to him. Well, and uh, Ravens, I mean, John Harbaugh said that was an MVP-like performance he had. He had almost 300 total yards against that Ravens defense uh, through the air and on the ground. And I think in that Browns game against the Texans on Sunday, on Sunday you know, I think Kevin Stefanski is your coach of the year. I mean, that guy, what that guy's done, and not like they haven't had injuries, Rod. I mean, they've lost no. Nick Chubb. They've lost key guys. They've lost both their tackles, uh, two or three big offensive linemen that they've lost. And here they are at 10 and 5. And, you know, Joe Flacco is playing great. And he's, I mean, he's playing really good. He made some high level throws in that. Te- I mean, the Texans couldn't cover Amari Cooper, who went for, gosh, mm-hmm. 265 yards receiving in that game. That's right. Come on, man. They couldn't stop one guy. I mean, game wrecked. Uh, that's on I mean, D'Amico. Yeah. Come on, man. You got to find somebody. Yeah. I mean, you got good players out there. Can we can we not let this one guy shred us? Because the the Browns couldn't run the ball. Uh, you know, they didn't run the ball at all. They just attacked that secondary. And Joe Flacco with three sixty eight, two sixty five of them to one guy. Yeah, that's why I I, I kind of feel like, and I said this a couple weeks ago. I kind of feel like the Texans were peaking, and that that is not a bad thing. That's for the team that they have already, you know, exceeded expectations. Uh, but I, I don't know. I feel like now you're starting to see them play some of their worst football defensively, and that's D'Amico's well, side you of the get ball. Into the set that they've played so many different players, they've been so banged up. Yeah, and so many. And in that game alone, they, they lost Jonathan Gennard went out in that game. Yeah, they just keep. There's like a mash unit. They got to figure out in their training room this off season. What the heck, man? You get, was it just a bad luck, or you, you guys? Why are you getting so many injuries? You know what? It's unbelievable. That is something to consider because the 49ers have had some of the worst injury luck in the NFL in the last five years. Uh, the the Ravens actually were in that situation too a couple of years ago. Remember how bad their injury luck was? Yeah. Um, and I wonder if D'Amico, some of the things that he's taken from the 49ers maybe add to some of the injury rates, but that's obviously just a hypothesis. Nothing, nothing there's yeah. no evidence to back just, it up. But it is, you're right. They they've used the second most unique players in the NFL behind like the Panthers. So it's amazing what they've done. But getting back to Kevin Stefanski and how it remarkable. Remember this guy, they were talking about him getting fired. Yes. Like his job was going to be on the line. And now they're talking about him winning coach of the year. I, I'm with you. I think he has solidified his case. 
that not only have started four different quarterbacks, and this is a team that's winning double digit games is going to be a playoff team, but also this is a team with 26%, 26% of their salary cap is on injured reserve. In Cleveland. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, more than a quarter. That's crazy. And, you know, and they'd be getting ripped in Cleveland big time if, if, because Baker Mayfield's playing great, right? He is and, playing and, great. But Joe, Joe Flacco has come off his mom's couch and is saving him. And yeah. he's playing good football. Baker Mayfield might be being comeback player of the year. I think he's going to be. I think he's going to be. And Baker Mayfield and the Buccaneers, who might do the Cowboys play in the uh, wild card round of the playoffs in a few weeks. I know. And Mike Evans is balling, too. He is. is All right. So there's some NFL coming off a, uh, a long weekend. A lot of uh, eyeballs on the NFL this weekend, without a doubt, including that uh, that Cowboys game, one of the most viewed games of the year, Cowboys-Dolphins on uh, Christmas Eve. Always evening. is. Oh, man, that was that was a heck of a finish, uh, without a doubt. But, Rod, we're all uh, drilling down and getting into this uh, Texas-Washington game, obviously four days out now, four days and, you know, 12 hours or 14 hours, whatever it is now, mm-hmm. to the 745 kick at the Sugar Bowl. You've kind of said all month you think Texas is going to win the game. Are you still are you feeling good? Or where are you, what's your yeah, level still, of uh, confidence in this game? For no, I still feel good. I, I do believe Texas is going to win the game, but I do believe it's still, it's, it's going to come down to the wire. I mean, I think it's going to come down to potentially the last drive of the game who has the ball last. Uh, and yeah, Michael Penix has got the clutch gene. They have the clutch gene as a team, actually. Uh, Washington has made clutch plays in clutch moments all year. I think he's got – five four, uh, game-winning drives in his career. Two of those have come this season, uh, one against Oregon early on in the year. Uh, and we've seen Texas in the fourth quarter play some of their best football. I think it actually is going to come down to whoever can make those uh, clutch plays in critical moments down the stretch. One thing I was looking at, because I know their defense gets a lot of uh, criticism. People have talked about how bad their defense is, and it's not a great defense. It's not a well-rounded defense, and it's not necessarily consistent defense. But I've, I've looked at some of the games. I've looked at most of their games, actually, and their defense has made clutch plays in big games and timely plays in big games. You go look at that that Arizona game. They it was like thirty one seventeen Washington um, up in the fourth quarter, and then uh, Washington gets an interception. Uh, and I believe while Arizona's driving in the fourth quarter, uh, and they held Arizona to zero points after a thirteen uh, play drive in that game uh, versus Oregon. They held Oregon. We all remember famously to zero of three, zero for on those fourth down conversions. That potentially won the game for Washington along with Penix and his clutch play. Arizona State, people talk about that one. That's the one game that uh, Washington, uh, I think, didn't even score an offensive touchdown. They right. won 15-7 to because they had a pick six in the second half, and uh, in the fourth quarter, they forced, I think, three, uh, three and out the next drive right after that pick six. Defense basically went out and won the game for them. Uh, no offensive touchdowns. Four turnovers for that Washington offense in that game. They, man, that was basically their worst offensive performance, but the defense went and won the game for them. Uh, that Utah game, they won 35-28, three three and outs in the second half for the defense. Uh, they had two interceptions uh, and a safety force by the defense in the second half. That was big. Uh, 22-20 win over Oregon State. Um, in that game, I think it was 9-7. Washington was up by two points because the defense had a safety in the first half. Uh, three takeaways in that game for the defense. So they've made clutch plays. Uh, they're just not a good defense, but I've seen them come up big in yeah, critical I mean, moments. Yeah, the, the clutch is the key. And, you know, their defensive coordinator is Bob Gregory, who was was promoted to that role when Pete Kwiatkowski left to come to Texas. Hmm. So he was with Pete, with PK, yeah. uh, and Kalen, Kalen DeBoer kept him. And, you know, we got the job, so, you know, I like this guy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, again, the, statistically not great. But, again, let's say this about Washington. Everybody, you know, Texas fans will point out uh, – yeah, I keep talking to Longhorn fans who point out how uh, their close losses and instead of their quality yep. wins being 13-0. and You also point out their pass defense, but they played three of the top five pass offenses in the country this year. Yep. And they beat them, right? They, they still won the game. Yeah. Uh, that's important. So, the stats – you know, what is, what is it? It's – Bill Parcells, stats are for losers. You know what I mean? Stats, but yeah, <laughs> that's a stat. This crazy. You said that Chris Peterson described the defense as that. He said this is a stats are for losers defense. Yeah, well, it, because again, I watched the entire Oregon game the first time, and their red zone defense is why they won the game. They they kept Bo Nix out of the end zone. Now, now uh, Dan Lanning probably should kick some field goals in that game. Instead, yep. he kept going for it, going trying to get the touchdown. But their their goal, their red zone defense was outstanding in that game. Uh, and you know, gosh, you think about when when they. 
that played Washington, played Oregon again in the in the Pac-12 championship game. They got out to the big lead, but then it looked like Oregon had taken control of the game, come back, and we're going to win the game. Their defense stepped up big time in the fourth yeah. quarter of that game. So that's what you have. You have two really resilient teams that have a lot of high football character that find ways to win. And as you said to start this conversation, it's the team that makes those those big plays in critical moments. Both of these teams, if you you know take away a couple of plays against Oklahoma, Texas has made critical plays in big moments this year to avoid losses and to win games. Uh, Washington's done the same. Uh, speaking of coaches that were retained by Kevin DeBoer when he came on as when he came on as head coach, Scott Huff is another one who was the offensive line coach. They kept him from uh, that Jimmy Lake regime uh, there before Kevin DeBoer got there. And now this offensive line has claimed the Joe Moore Award, which is the uh, award given to the best overall offensive line in the country. And here's the crazy part. That his offensive line has featured seven different players and four different lineups throughout the season. And they uh, believe they're fifth in fewest sacks allowed in the country, only 11 sacks. But the offensive line has only been responsible for five sacks total. Uh, Roger Rosen, Garden, he is the right tackle. He's allowed zero sacks uh, all season long. And I believe uh, Fau Tanu uh, is the other tackle. And he's allowed, I believe, two sacks all season long. The, the biggest surprise has been the center because they had a sixth-year center who initially started the season he was uh, Mateo Mele. He was the he started at the first game and he got hurt in week two. They had to move Parker Brailsford over. He was a redshirt freshman guard. They moved over to center. Everybody assumed, man, this is going to be a disaster. Um, it was not. It was actually the opposite. It solidified the offensive line. They put two fifth-year juniors at guard, Nate Kalepo and Julius Bulo. And those guys, although they've had some injuries in there a couple of times uh, so far this season, they have really been uh, kind of the stabilizing force for that young center who's in there. And he's the, he the young center everybody's talking about who's 280 pounds. <laughs> yeah. He's probably up to about 285 pounds right now. But Bros has been great, and they really do hide him really well. They don't overburden him. Usually when he's going to make a block, it'll be they'll give him help with one of those guards. It'll be a duo block. Um, they, do, they do an interesting – uh, inside run concept, or at least they execute one where they will duo block at the point of attack and they will zone block the rest. Really helps out that young center. I think that's why they do it. But keep in mind that's that's their offensive line. Although a kind of strange path to get there, they're considered to be the best O line in the country, and they're the best pass blocking O line in the country. That's why that matchup between uh, Texas defensive line, defensive front, and this O line. As Chris Peterson said, it could easily come down to being the determining factor in the matchup. Good stuff right there. Yeah, pressure on Phoenix will be key, but they don't give up a lot of pressure. That's why they won the Joe Moore Award. I think a lot of interior pressure. You've talked about second-level interior yeah. pressure, an Anthony Hill type of thing. Uh, Jalen Ford maybe coming on some uh, – uh, some blitzes up the middle, trying to get at Phoenix yep. uh, a little bit to force him out of the pocket. Uh, but you can't let him get comfortable. He's too good. And I'm assuming the Washington fans are anything about Quinn Ewers, too. they got to get to him or else Quinn Ewers will pick him apart uh, in that secondary. Yep. All right, we'll talk about it more as we move forward. Texas and Washington uh, we will hit some bullish or BS coming back as well uh, ahead of the end of our second hour of our five-hour Thursday morning conversation. Good to be back with you here on Hook'em Up with Ian Rodby.
Come up. 1019 AM 1260. The Horn. Hook 'em Up is back, and we appreciate uh, you being back with us. Hope you had a, good, a great holiday season, whatever it entailed for you. Travel or just uh, gathering with family and friends and celebrating the season. Tis the season. Tis and, uh, the season. Certainly bullish on a couple days down, and... Uh, Actually, arrived with a couple of days off. I just I, like almost specifically put my phone away. Just didn't really want to take much in because we've been grinding pretty good through this football season, uh, five hours a day, every single day. But uh, it's great to be back and really locked in and ready to go for this game, uh, Texas and Washington. Time for bullish and BS. And this text on the line on the uh, text line, Rod says, I think the Horns win the line of scrimmage too physical. Are you bullish or BS on that statement? That having I went back and watched the Washington Oregon game. The one thing that stands out, Oregon is a very smallish defensive front but they're quick and they're fast, they're athletic. Yeah. Texas, we know, this is the biggest and most physical defensive front they've faced. Yes. Uh, Utah, I guess, would be the closest thing to it. Uh, but even, I mean, no one has what, what Texas has with Devondre De- Sweat and Byron Murphy and the physicality of this Texas front. Mm-hmm. That that needs to be an advantage for Texas. They really need to. Last time Washington was in the 14 playoff with Chris Peterson was 2016, and they played Alabama, mm-hmm. and they couldn't handle the physicality and yeah. the speed of that Alabama team. Yeah, uh, I think I don't think the speed will be anything for uh, Washington to have to adjust to. Uh, certainly, the uh, imposing presence of Tabundre Sweat, best interior uh, D tackle in the country, and also another top ten D tackle in the country, Byron Murphy, is something to deal with. I, I think Kalen DeBoer and his coaching staff we just talked about the offensive line. Uh, they've allowed eighteen sacks. In the last two years, uh, only – It's a pretty stunning number, by the yeah, way. Yeah, only 11 sacks they've allowed this entire season. They, they're really good. And only, I think, nine less than 9.5% of all of the pressure on Penix is converted into a sack. He's really good at getting rid of the football. He's so comfortable in his system. He's been in his system, guys, for how long? Six I years. Think, I mean, I mean he's he been in the system Indiana, for a really long Washington, time. Yeah. yeah, so think about that. Was the, the only quarterback to beat Texas was a quarterback who had been working in the system – for like five Dylan years. Dylan Gabriel, yeah. All right. Comfort. There's a comfort level in that system because you know it so well. So you're not panicked. You're not freaking out when, you know, things aren't operating or things aren't on schedule. And that, and I think him getting rid of the football analytics will tell you most sacks are actually attributed to the quarterback position. He doesn't allow uh, the pressure to convert into sacks. He gets rid of the football pretty quickly because of his comfort in that system, and he can move around. They move the pocket, and they will on Texas. They will move that pocket. I even wonder, getting back to the Oklahoma uh, matchup, if they'll try to go up-tempo at times. They don't because usually they're operating, I think, you know, at a slower pace because they want to do a lot of pre-snap movement and shifts. But they could go up-tempo just to surprise Texas to break tendency every now and then to try to wear out that defense or front a little bit early on for Texas when they don't expect it. That's what happened in that Oklahoma game, that tempo wore Texas defense or front out a little bit late in that game. They were not as effective. Yeah, well, and to your point, I mean, to the point we've said, I mean, they Texas didn't have a sack last year. I know last year doesn't matter, but it is. It would be silly not to use that game as just a, you know, oh, yeah. to, to watch the film and see the Straight matchups. Great starting point. Uh, to because look, Texas, you know, they're better on the front this year uh, under Bo Davis, but a lot of the same guys, right? Uh, and they handled the physicality last year uh, pretty darn well. So that becomes in mm-hmm. and, and, and as you said, you can't just Kalen Board is the board is not going to leave him back there. No, to, to, for him to get. They gonna, will address to Andre. There will be a plan, and a yes. contingency plan for Sweat and Byron Murphy. I assure you. Yeah, and yeah. to your question of how many, uh, he, he he didn't start in 2018 at Indiana, but he did uh, get in, you know, he did play in some games, uh, in at Indiana in 2018, but was the full time starter in 2019, 2020, 2021 at Indiana, and then transferred to Washington. So this is about the sixth year in the system for him. Yeah, he's like I said, he's wor- he, he knows this system really well. And you can tell watching him. He, there's a comfort level that he has. Uh, but Texas, Texas game plan last year, guys, was a good game plan. They just allowed too many rushing yards, which they won't this year, and they allowed too many third down and fourth down conversions, which they won't this year. Those are top five categories defensive in Texas. Last year they were but middle of the road, average to below average. And, that, and you know, again, the, the comp is, as we say, you know, in bullish or BS, um, you know, you know, mat- matchups make fights. And, yes, and they, they looked, as you, you said, the last time Texas played a quarterback that was just familiar with the system was Dylan Gabriel. This team, you know, looks like that type of offense, right? Yeah. Uh, with a quarterback and receivers and maybe, not maybe, they're, they're more talented on the outside than what Oklahoma had in that football game. And I'll give you this little fact, a little fact in Bullish or BS, Rod. 
uh, in his career, at either in Indiana or Washington, uh, Michael Penix has att- attempted nearly 1,600 passes, 1,596. He's been sacked 31 times. Well, say that again. In 1,596 attempts in his career, he's been sacked 31 times. He's a hard guy to get to. He is a hard guy to get to. That's not all offensive line. No, it is because early on in his career, I think he was more mobile. He was a track star coming out of high school, guys. He was. He was a track guy. And then he hurt so he blew his run. knee out and against he, Michigan. Yeah, then he kept hurting his knees, so he became less mobile. But he can move, and now he's got an offensive line that to add to complement his ability to extend plays, move around a little bit. Yeah, and he's left-handed, which is kind of awkward, a little bit awkward. So I think that helps him a little bit too. That's a that's an eye popper. Thirty one sacks all in his 31? career. Thirty one. Yeah. yeah. He just his sack avoidance is one of his X man abilities. He avoids sacks really well. Yeah. Which keeps plays alive and allows him to push the ball down the field. You talk about the the, the vertical passing game they like to employ. Got to have time and you got to be able to avoid rush and move in the pocket to be able to push the ball down the field. That's exactly those right. those aren't quick plays, right? Oh no, man, takes time. Takes time. Takes time. All right, Rod, you ready for hour three of our five-hour conversation? It'll include some behind the burn orange curtain. We'll hear more from Sark. Fun, baby. Sark and the Longhorns landed in NOLA yesterday, and then uh, Sark's met with the media, so we'll hear more from that coming up. Also, Kalen DeBoer, uh, same thing. We'll hear his thoughts on Texas. Uh, we'll get to all of it. We'll also talk more Cowboys. NFL Week 16 kicks off tonight. Got a lot going on. It's Hook em Up with Ian Rodby.
We're rolling TK, we're rolling to take over to Iron. Double jump. Hook him up with Ian Rodby. Indeed rolls on. It is uh, a lot of Texas-Washington talk. We're from Kalen DeBoer coming up, head coach of the Washington Huskies, the AP Coach of the Year, 13-0. Not easy to do. 13-0 season for the Huskies, Pac-12 champions, and um, just, what, 11-2 and in year one for Kalen DeBoer. So what a start to his Washington tenure. The guy can win, and uh, that's the long ones we'll have to deal with. Steve Sarkeesian, the Big 12's Coach of the Year, according to the AP. But uh, and has had a, had a heck of a run with his Longhorn. So what a matchup it is on Monday night. We were just talking in the break uh, behind the scenes about uh, plans in New Orleans when we get there, Rod. Ty's going, I'm going, part of the Horn crew. You were going to go, but you've got a baby at home. Got so. a baby. Got a baby. That changes the, work. the abilities. And uh, you got to work. Uh, well, I'll be working there. We'll be doing live shows on Monday and Tuesday morning from NOLA and uh, bring you live coverage. But uh, I'm going to get there on Saturday. And uh, Ty was asking what I was going to do on Saturday. Uh, wife's going and uh, my son Nolan and a friend of his, so we'll have a carload. But uh, we already got a plan to go over to maybe the to either the Mannings or the Harris to watch the Cowboys game because mm. you know there is no Monday Night Football game this week in Week 16, Rob. There is no Monday Night Football game. Okay, that's the Longhorns. Longhorns are Monday Night Football playing the Sugar Bowl. You know what I mean? <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's New Prime Year's time, Day, baby. So they're moving the not moving. They're they, I guess you could consider the Saturday Night game Cowboys v Lions is kind of a Monday Night game. Respect the playoff. They, they respect the playoff. The NFL is going to respect the playoff. Yeah. Uh, Give them some love. Usually yeah. the NFL wants to boss hog every part of the sports calendar. We talked about that, how, you know, the NFL looks at the sports calendar like a monopoly board. They're always trying to buy more property. Which it they've took, done. took Christmas from the NBA, and the NBA is like, what do we ever do to you? Well, nothing. We just want to monopolize everything. I'm going to give college football Monday night. Good for them. They've taken over Saturday, too, when college fo- football is done. They just take, they just start moving into Saturday. Uh, each of <laughs> random the, Saturday to your games. point, each of the three Monday NFL games, noon, three thirty, and the night game mm-hmm. uh, on Monday, which of course was Ravens Niners, averaged nearly thirty million viewers. There you go. Each of the five NBA games averaged nearly three million viewers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they know. They're like, now nah, we're gonna steal. We're gonna steal a little but bit. But on Monday, show. it is the national semifinals, right? The yeah. Rose Bowl, oh, game middle of the afternoon with Maybe. Alabama and Michigan. Huge, two huge brands, two huge names, and Nick Saban, Jim Harbaugh, all that's gone on with Michigan this year. What a matchup that is. And, of oh, course, yeah. am, uh, the sexy matchup of Washington and Texas on uh, Sugar Bowl on New Year's Eve night. Am I yeah. wrong, no. or was a few years ago that, like the, the narrative that the NBA was overtaking the NFL in viewership or popularity? <sighs> there was, like, with the whole concussion thing, I feel like that they – I don't know if that was the NBA well, just the, pushing I mean, there their were own those, thing, There were but. those who, who were claiming the NFL was going to, you know, evaporate because of the – you know, the Star Spangled Banner flap and the national anthem stuff and all that. It was an existential crisis for there them. Was. They there was. They had to deal with some issues. And I do I – mean, I, what did Mark Cuban had, you know, talked about how, you know, you, you get too high, pigs get slaughtered or something mm-hmm. like that yep. uh, in business. But at the same time, it's Mark Cuban who's selling his team <laughs> and out of the NBA now. Now he's still running the team somehow. Yeah. But he sold his team. Uh, but yes, I mean, yeah, I mean, the NFL is a mod. Look, I mean, it's a Goliath, but at the same time, what's the second most popular sport by revenue and ratings in North America? It's college football. I mean, yeah. it's one and two, but it's not close. It's not close, yeah, but, it's it, but, not, it, it's but, but, but the end the, 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 the brand of college football, if you look at its TV ratings and the revenue it generates and ticket sales and things of that nature, it's but, the second most popular sport in this country. But college football is, uh, it's about to hit a boom. There's, it's a, there's a boom happening in college football, and we know this because of all the realignment, and that's why all of the, the broadcasters, all these television networks, they are right now gearing up or at least positioning themselves for this college football boom that's atop, about to take place. And it's mostly because the entertainment ecosystem has changed so drastically, and sports now is top three um, in terms of e- event watching, things that people want to watch live. They don't want to watch it DVR. They don't want to watch it recorded. They have to watch it live. And these broadcast networks, they want live eyeballs. And sports can guarantee you live eyeballs. That news 
uh, I think disaster porn's in that category, like uh, e- election coverage, stuff sure. like election that. Sure, election night. Yeah. Well, and look, I mean, it's live eyeballs. Well, it's interesting because if you if you dive into the metrics of Major League Baseball, which is my one of my, I'm a baseball guy. The, the, the industry's healthy. I mean, the ratings are good. You know, stadiums yeah. are full. I mean, it's yeah. not perfect. I mean, they've yeah. got serious salary, you know, their, their markets that aren't trying to compete and they're, you know, the, the haves and have nots. But the, the industry is, as a whole is healthy. Yeah. NBA is an industry. It's pretty healthy. Mm-hmm. But it just can't compete. You just have to eliminate football. I mean, from yeah. the conversation. Yeah. They compete with one another. Don't compare yourself. They compete to, to be second or third or fourth, right? Um, but that's where college football is. I, I mean, if you look at – the revenues, and this is why people who still argue about the NIL and players making money on this thing, come on, it's the second most revenue-generating sport in our country. It's doing really well. It's, it's, <laughs> not, it's not close. I mean, uh, the, the reports are Michigan's offered Jim Harbaugh a, a $12 million a year contract. Double-digit years, $12 million a year to stay at Michigan and not go off to the NFL. He might be underpaid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's mm. crazy. And you're right, there's about to be a bigger boom because – there's a 12-team playoff coming next year and the mm-hmm. conference realignment or the consolidation of the conferences yeah. to where it's going to be the, the top 70 teams each year in the four big conferences. Sexier matchups. Bigger matchups. Yep. Texas and Oklahoma. I don't know if you saw the hype video, Rod, the SEC put out about Texas and, and uh, Oklahoma joining the SEC officially. Uh, that's out there now. So, yes, I mean, it's uh, USC, UCLA, Washington, Oregon joining the Big Ten. I mean, you can, as a fan, or, you know, you can be against all that. But, man, you, you can't argue as a business side it's going to be a boon for the product There's and no for ads. the interest in the product. Uh, but, well, you know, that's where we are. Uh, and that's why there will be no Monday Night Football game. They're going to let the uh, four-team playoff stand alone on New Year's Day, and the Cowboys will play on Saturday night and get a lot of eyeballs. A lot of eyeballs. When they play Dan Campbell, the former Cowboy, hey. and the Detroit Lions. Big game, baby. Big, oh, man, it's one of the big – got to say, when was the last time the Lions had a game that big? And it is a huge game for the Lions. Because I mean, you're they, talking about one of the biggest games in Lions history. Probably the, the last time the Lions played the Cowboys in the playoffs with Matt Stafford. Yeah, Matt Stafford. Matt Stafford no, game. Yeah, I'm yeah, serious. Yeah, I agree that's with that. that. Like, that's, this, that's probably true. This is a big game. Lions, the Lions fandom, they're talking about this game a lot. I've been, well, the Cowboys are coming in off a two-game losing streak into that game and uh, kind of limping in kind of feeling down a little bit. And, uh, you know, here come the Lions who just won their conference for the first time in 30 years, Rod. Last time they won the conference was 1993. Unbelievable. Now, 1993? I don't, I don't expect you all to know this off the top of your head, but I, cause I don't. But when's, when's the last time the Cowboys lost three games in a row that oh, they had their starting quarterback? Well, I would quarterback. expect the Cowboys to win this game at home, but at the same time, the Lions have a lot to play for. The Lions are one of three teams at 11-4 and four in, the, uh, in the NFC right now. Yeah. The, the Niners, the Lions were the big winner of the weekend in the NFC. The The you know, the, the the Lions won and clinched their division. The Niners lost, which helped them a lot. Now, the Eagles yep. won and survived the Giants. But at the same time, the Cowboys took a loss. Uh, and so they're right there for maybe the one seed. Can you imagine? Now, they got to beat the Dallas Cowboys. Niners play the uh, Cardinals this weekend while the Eagles play the, the – uh, no, the Eagles yeah. play the Cardinals. Uh, who, who do the Niners play this weekend? It's somebody that they're going to beat. <laughs> it's, oh, especially I think they after might play they the Rams, right? I know one of these oh, last two not games. The Rams. One of these last it's two games the for them is against the Rams. It is so. their last game, I think, is the Rams. I believe that that's true. Be, uh, that's but I will tell game. you, the Niners play. It's a big game. Let me give you the Niners real quick. Eagles, Eagles will host Arizona. Okay, uh, which that's a game they should win with Jalen Hurts, and uh, they're at eleven and four. Lions play in Dallas. And San Francisco plays Washington in Washington. Did y'all watch that Eagles game this week? That was kind of the worst game of the day. I did. Jalen Hurts is – I mean, I I know I'm a hater. He might not be healthy, but he does not – he's not playing well at all. No, he's not. I think that's that's, – his turnovers have been a big problem for the Eagles this year. Without a doubt. All right, can we get to the quick headlines, and then we'll hear from Kalen DeBoer, the Washington coach, upon landing in New Orleans with his team. Headlines, Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment bring you the headlines. Be listening to about a new location of Top Gun Rentals that's coming online. Excited to tell you about that in the new year. Uh, we'll start with the college football. Longhorns, of course, as we said, on the ground in New Orleans. Landed yesterday. Huge send-off here in town as the Longhorns uh, uh, got a, a, a hero's send-off when they left the campus yesterday. Now they're in New Orleans. The game prep practices begin today for the Longhorns this afternoon in New Orleans. Hard to drill down four days out to that big game with Washington. Last night there were four bowl games, including a pair of wins for the Big 12. Down in Houston last night, Oklahoma State uh, took down A&M, Texas A&M, 31-23 in the Texas Bowl. Alan Bowman had a huge night. Their quarterback, 404 yards and a pair of touchdowns. Ollie Gordon ran for 118 in a score against the shorthanded Aggies. Aggies dressed under 40, under 
50 scholarship players for that game last night. Also last night, without Caleb Williams, USC top Louisville, 42-28 in the Holiday Bowl. West Virginia rolled past the Drake Mayless North Carolina Tar Heels in the Dukes Mayo Bowl, 30-10. Virginia Tech upset the Willie Fritzless Tulane Green Wave in the Military Bowl. Four more bowl games today, starting this morning at 10 a.m. in Beantown. SMU will face Boston College at the Fenway Bowl. That's followed by Rutgers and Miami in the Pinstripe Bowl in New York. NC State meets Kansas State in the Pop-Tart Bowl in Orlando. And then tonight, good one down in San Antonio. They always find Alamo Bowl, 12th-ranked Oklahoma facing 14th-ranked Arizona. If you missed it on Tuesday night, congratulations to Texas State and the Bobcats. Their fifth-year linebacker, Brian Holloway, returned two interceptions for touchdowns. Jamil Jeter ran for three scores to lead the Cats to a 45-21 win over the Rice Owls in the first responder bowl in Dallas. Their first-ever win for that program in a bowl game. Pretty awesome stuff. NBA last night, Phoenix down the Rockets, 120. 9-113. How about the game for Jared Allen, the former Longhorn? 24 points, 23 rebounds for the local product. Mavericks lost at home. Uh, yes, we had Mavericks lost at home to Cleveland. That was the big game for Jared Allen. Houston lost to Phoenix. Earlier in the day, yesterday, NBA governors officially approved the sale of controlling interest of the Mavericks from Mark Cuban to the families that run the Las Vegas Sands Casino Company, somewhere in the neighborhood of $3.5 billion. And in college hoops, fifth-ranked Texas women finished off their non-conference schedule, a perfect 13-0. They whipped Jackson State yesterday at Moody Center, 97-52. They'll open Big 12 Conference play this Saturday afternoon. Big win hosting 10th ranked Baylor. All right. Uh, I know we got to get to uh, the behind the burn orange curtain here so we can hear from Kaylin DeBoer, head coach of the Washington Huskies. Uh, one thing also uh, we haven't really talked a, a ton about, I want to get into a little bit too, is the uh, the Texans. You talked about how they're still in playoff contention. Uh, we got to talk a little bit about them because if the Texans actually make the playoffs, man, and it would suck because I don't think that's enough to get D'Amico Ryan the coach of the year. It'll definitely get Nick Casario executive of the year. Um, and C.J. Stroud has been a lock for rookie of the year for a while now, actually. And but, I'm watching some video right here of C.J. Stroud back on the practice field, throwing the ball around, which means he's out of the concussion protocol. And did you hear that they say that there's a report that maybe he got hurt in a uh, in a game prior to the the one who actually was taken out of, that he has to, it may have had some issues prior to that? There's a report circling that the, this con- his concussion symptoms may have uh, – some of them may have occurred prior to him being – um, well, side, I did read the, 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 the I mean, Texas, put in protocol. I mean, he suffered a really severe concussion in the Jets game. I don't know if there was already something there. Yeah. But, I mean, they, I mean it was one of those two uh, was scary. I mean, he got thrown back. Quinn and Williams, the big defensive tackle for the Jets, hit him. Huge, and yeah. he, you know, went back and whiplashed the back of his head on the turf there in, in, um, in New Jersey. And you could see him, and he was, he was immediately unconscious, and his legs were kind of shaking a little bit, like like uh, uh, really out cold. Yeah. And um, you know, he's it's, it's taken him two full weeks. And as you said, even leading into the Browns game, when they're hopefully get back, he still was sensitive to light uh, and bright light. So yeah, it was a pretty severe concussion. I don't know if he had symptoms leading up to that um, that made it made it made it a little worse. But at the same time, it was a pretty severe concussion he dealt with. But they've been careful with him. He's missed two games. They won one of those in Tennessee, and then lost to the Browns on Sunday. Uh, but it looks like he'll be back for the Tennessee game this Sunday. Yeah, they weren't going to be – I mean, the Browns, not the way they're playing. The Browns are playing really good football right now. Crazy to say that with Joe Flacco. And that d- Browns defense, they might have the defensive player of the year and the head, and the coach of the year, actually. On well, I mean, that they're – I mean, the, the problem – Miles Garrett didn't have a sack, I don't think, in the Texans game. But they put so much focus on Miles Garrett that Adarius uh, – Gosh, who's the guy they brought in from the Packers? I mean, he he is just a – Oh, uh, uh, Darius Smith? Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, you're right about that. Is it Darius I, yeah, Smith? I think you're right oh about that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And they got Jadavian Clowney, uh, who kind of gets, gets in there and rushes the passer on pass rushing downs. I mean, and their secondary is really good. That Browns team, they're, they're number one defense in the league. And they'll be a problem for the AFC in the playoffs. Who it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, whether playing the Dolphins or – the Chiefs, uh, whoever it's going to be, the Browns will be a problem because Joe Flacco is playing really good football. Um, gosh, he's got over a thousand yards the last three games, Rob. I mean, it's not like he's coming in there being a game manager. He is. They're well, they're winning through the air with Man, Joe Flacco. What happens when they make the playoffs and make a run with Joe Flacco? 
after paying Deshaun Watson a fully <laughs> guaranteed deal. I mean, Deshaun Watson is already dealing with a lot of like just. I, I think he he has a lot of insecurity as well. He should about now not being well liked and not being a fan favorite when he was a fan favorite for most of his career. Now he's a villain, and I think psychologically has had a devastating effect on him and his self esteem as a player. What's this going to do to his self-esteem now that Joe Flacco came in there? And in that same locker room, Joe Fl- I don't even know if Deshaun Watson's hanging out in the locker room that much anymore. Well, you know what's funny? Well, the, the funny you say that because the word out of Cleveland is not only is he playing great, he is so well-liked in oh, their right. locker room. Everybody loves him. Everybody loves him. Like, about, everybody loves a quarterback that's winning. Well, <laughs> even, even Kevin Stefanski, because Kevin Stefanski, the coach, is not much older than him. And you know, he, Stefanski was quoted as saying, "You know, I'm I'm North Jersey. He's down. We're we're we're, we're the same guy. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, he was like Delaware. Or yeah, something. he Joe went Flacco to the Blue Hen. Yeah. Oh and, and man. They kind of look alike, Flacco and Stefanski, and it's like like they're buddies yeah. now. I was like, it, 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 it's it, like it, a, it's like a Matt Stafford, uh, uh, Sean, Sean McVay, McVay friendship well, kind of yeah. deal. No, it's <laughs> it's obviously working. My point is when it when it's done, and oh, like I don't I said, we don't know how long it's gonna last. Hell, they they're gonna make a playoff run. I do think. I don't know if they're gonna win a Super Bowl. I don't know if they'll get that far. But when it's all said and done, and Joe Flacco is the one that was able to get you know show the team or achieve more with the team than Deshaun Watson was. I'm just saying, what are, what's gonna be the 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 butterfly effect? What's gonna be the impact of that Second in the and locker third room? level effects? I don't know. Right? I can't you can't answer that because that's it, so awkward. When we say that Joe is so well liked, you gonna let, you gonna let Joe go? Or you are you going to keep him around as a backup and then keep the influence of him there even more? Like what do you do? Well, because that's the other part is you know Deshaun Watson's now hated by fans, but he also isn't that well liked in his own locker room apparently. Exactly. <laughs> or by the team, he, he saved the coach's job. Joe Flacco just saved Kevin Stefanski's job, arguably. Yeah, and Baker May because Baker May, Baker Mayfield's on his way to come back Player of the Year. So that would that, that wouldn't look good. That also don't look good either. No. That's what I'm saying. It just the oh man, the perception now I think it's just going to be crushing for it. I'm, I'm not I'm not sympathizing with Deshaun Watson, y'all. I'm not trust, trust me. No. I'm no tear shit at all. I'm just discussing it. And how interesting and intriguing that's going to be, and how, as a coach, how do you, you, you I mean, how do you play that in the locker room? Like, how do you decide to balance that? And, and he has the only guaranteed contract in all of football. Now, the the, the Deshaun Watson trade goes down as one of the worst trades ever. It's at this that's point. That's why Nick Casario is going to be in, win executive of the year. <laughs> and one of the best trades for Houston. Yeah. Flip side of that is there's Russell Wilson now, who's going to be benched oh, that's this week too. in favor of Jared Stidham. And there's a report that this is going to lead to his re- his release when the yeah. season is over. He's had one year with Sean Payton, and it's going to be over. Sean Payton, I would say I like Sean Payton, but he has been trying to sabotage this relationship for a while. Yes, he, he, and I think he just he wants to separate, emancipate himself from Russell Wilson, and I think he wants the management or the ownership now, new ownership, to back him in this move, even though it is going to severely handicap them. Salary cap wise, with a dead money for at least a year, maybe two. Well, y- yes, uh, you got to pay him the money. You got to pay him, but he's going to be gone. He's going to uh, be gone. He's going to be gone, and that goes down. I mean, in addition to the two hundred and fifty, what, what, how much did they sign him for? A crazy amount oh, of money. Oh man! Um, but they, you know, Houston has kind of rebuilt themselves through that trade and the draft picks acquired. The Seattle Seahawks mm-hmm. traded Russell Wilson to the Broncos. For a fit for two first, two seconds, fifth round, and a fifth round pick, and quarterback Drew Locke, and tight end Noah Fance, and defensive lineman Shelby Harris. So. By the way, Drew Locke just led them to a big win hey. <laughs> last week. He's still playing. Get the and, bag, baby. Get the bag. Uh, Noah Fance, their starting tight end. And with the draft picks, they added their starting offensive tackle, Charles Cross. They added Devon Weatherspoon, the the corner, who's going to you know be an all rookie player this year. Uh, they they got like seven starters. Yeah, by trading and and, and that they're and they didn't have to sign Russell Wilson to this huge contract. Broncos are on the hook for that deal. Yeah, no, that was a savvy move by Seattle, and it's is that we've seen all these moves now. Kind of re that's that's how you rebuild on the fly. It is, and yet I think also it's kind of a subplot to all of this. We're talking about the quarterback decisions, and obviously uh, teams who are. Uh, it now, like the Browns, um, they are connected and they are tied to the Sean Watson no matter what. Like they can't get out of that. Seems like Seattle decided. Now you know what we're gonna we're gonna let Russ go because uh, we're ready to move on. And people thought that would be disastrous for the franchise, and it wasn't. The Lamar Jackson storyline of teams having the option to trade for Lamar Jackson when he was available. 
uh, on the uh, the franchise tag there when he was available yeah. to be traded for. Would have taken it would have taken two first round picks, and you would have to pay him a new contract, of course. Um, how is that not more of an indictment on some of these teams' decision making uh, when it comes to the quarterback? I agree position? with you because uh, you could have traded for him last off season. And before. remember, the teams were openly going going out of their way to tell reporters and members of the media, no, 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 we won't even inquire, we won't even research it, we won't even talk to him. We're not going to talk to him or his agent. We're not interested. Why isn't that malpractice? Yeah, leadership wise. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, look. It, it, Look, the Jets would have been a team that had been in on it, but they went after Aaron Rodgers. Oh, not man. a good idea. By the way, uh, Jets fans, why didn't why didn't the Jets go after Joe Flacco after Joe, Aaron Rodgers got hurt? That's an indictment, too. Uh, that is also – I do think the Washington football team would have been more interested if the sale wasn't pending and all that wasn't going down because that right. uh, D.C. is not far from Baltimore. That would have been a natural splash fit for the new owner, Josh yeah. Harris. I remember Atlanta saying, no, nope, not interested. Yeah, we're good with Desmond Ritter. Like, really? Uh, <laughs> Uh, what? <laughs> Excuse me? Like I say, I'm not saying that they would have been able to make it happen because you would have had to pay them a contract, two and first round them. picks, a lot of capital. I get that. But for teams to openly come out in such an ignorant way and say, we're not even interested. No, we're not even going to research it. That, to me, shows you where the NFL is in regards to quarterbacks. You see how stubborn they are about, oh, no, we can make this work. No, no. Well, when you have a proven commodity at quarterback, take it. Who's 26? Take it. Who might win the MVP this year? Even um, Joe Flacco showing, hey, I did it once. I can, hey, I can come out. I can get off the couch and do it again for a few games. I mean, I got to do it for the whole season. I can do it for a few games. If if you've got a proven commodity at quarterback, take it because going with a Zach Wilson as your backup for the oh, uh, for the Jets not, was obviously a, a miscalculation. Commodity. Exactly. Well, listen, I'll say this because uh, Cleveland plays tonight uh, with Joe Flacco. The, if they can throw the football on the Jets tonight, because the Jets aren't a good team. I mean, they're, no. they're, they're they're not good. But at home, we've seen them beat the Eagles, beat the Texans. They they play better at home, and their defense, you know, Sauce Gardner and that secondary are outstanding. So yes. I'll be yeah. interested to see Joe Flacco tonight on a short week against a very good pass defense. That'll be Week 16 kickoff tonight. Uh, but to your point about Baltimore, yes, everybody that, that decided they didn't want to be interested in Lamar Jackson oh. because he's injury prone or whatever, he's going to win the MVP this year. The I mean, Commanders. The Falcons. Yeah, a lot of teams. Uh, the, oh, yeah. The, oh, man, I cannot believe that. Yeah, I forgot about the Panthers, too. Oh, they had the first have... pick. They went up and got the first pick and t- took, uh, uh, took, took Bryce, Bryce Young. Young. None of, I mean, listen, I like Bryce Young, but, hey, he ain't improving too much. You know, by Vegas. Vegas went after Jimmy Garoppolo. Well, I thought that was right. a good, I thought <laughs> I thought that was that a better was a idea. Move. Come on, man. Yeah, uh, and what Lamar Jackson. Going on? Might, Lamar Jackson may get the last laugh because he might win the MVP and they might be in the Super Bowl. So twice he has been counted out. The first one got drafted with 32nd overall mm-hmm. like that, the bottom of the first round. He's asking him to work as a receiver. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be a receiver. He wins the unanimous MVP after that, and then teams uh, don't want to trade for him. Actually, don't even want to inquire about him, and he's going to win the MVP again after that potentially? Come on, man. Come when on, when man. y'all going to stop counting out Lamar Jackson? Come on. Yes. Don't do it. Uh, listen, and for the Broncos, think about this. They're going to release, uh, you know, back to that quarterback debacle. If the Broncos release uh, uh, mm. Russell Wilson by March 17th, it will result in a $49.6 million cap hit. It's already, 40, they're, already, they're already projected to be $18 million over the cap. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah, they're going to be in cap hell for at least one season, maybe two. If they designate him as a post-June 1 release, they will owe Wilson his entire – $35.4 million salary, but save for the future. Okay. So, they're, so they're trying to make him a po- – and here's the problem. This is why they're not going to play him these next two weeks because it, as far as his contract goes, if he can't pass a physical, which means if he gets hurt between in any of these games – Then and he's they, guaranteed the money. Then he's guaranteed the money. Yeah. And they can't get out of the cap jail. Yeah. So they're, they're, yeah. they're taking – they're going to not roll the dice and not let him get hurt yep. on the football field and let uh, Jarrett Stidham finish the season for them because they're not going to make the playoffs. And, yes, they're going to take a hit financially to pay him to get rid of him, but it's not going to be the cap hit that it would if he were to get injured. That's interesting. Yeah, because I want to say one of the reports where they asked him to waive that though that injury clause right and he obviously refused yeah. <laughs> which gonna... means you're not playing <laughs> sit down you're not playing. <laughs> yeah hey, you know what russ smart move man smart move well russ, some of the team will take a chance on russ that's the question who's going to take a chance on russ take a chance on me <laughs> somebody will uh, take a chance, well take i will a say i gotta give chance, you if my chance. buddy james is listening he's, he's the biggest seahawks fan i know and when they made this trade and i was like oh my gosh he was like thank you because he's, I've watched every game. He's not. He's he's fading. He's not the same player he used to be. And James, you were right, my friend. You yeah. were right, my friend. No, and the Broncos right, but... are now dealing with the ramifications of that. Plus, he's a diva, 
and wanted his own office and wanted Jordan rules somehow yeah. in Denver. Is, he, uh, uh, is Russell Wilson going to – so he's not a Hall of Famer now. He was on his path to being a Hall of Famer. Think about that, right? He was on a path to being a Hall of Famer. And is Joe Flacco putting himself back in Hall of Fame conversation, oh, baby? Come on. That's a great point. <laughs> you know what, what if he wins the Super Bowl? Come on, man. If he wins the Super Bowl, yeah, he's going to be back because he had two. No, there's a long way between a now long and then. Way, but but uh, it is fun conversation because now forever the Deshaun Watson – Versus oh. Russell Wilson trades will be debated as are they where they rank among the worst trades of what all time. What about the Trey Lance one? Oh, Trey Lance one is just as bad for San Francisco. Some of these have been horrible <laughs> trades, but obviously certain San Fran survived that one because of Brock Purdy. It just shows, goes to the quarterback desperation of yeah, the league. It, it also goes to the point nobody knows what the hell they're doing. Yeah, so everybody's just throwing blank at the wall and seeing if it sticks when it comes to. And the if quarterback. you get a hold of that quarterback, keep him. Keep him. Hey, we'll come back. Get him weapons. Uh, we Kansas will City. pick this up with behind the burn orange curtain. We will hear from Kalen DeBoer in addition to Steve Sarkeesian getting you ready for Texas and Washington. We're four days and change out to the Sugar Bowl in the national championship semifinal. We're coming back. Hook him up with Ian Rodby. Oh, man, it is uh, at the turn, meaning halfway through our Thursday conversation, two and a half hours in, two and a half to go of our five-hour morning conversation. If you're playing golf, you're nine holes in, right? You're at the turn, and you're mm -hmm. turning and headed home. Uh, played with the outward nine. Now it's time to play the inward nine. And uh, the big story of golf, Rod, is that it's uh, the 28th of December, which means we've got three days to the – Deadline uh, for the PGA Tour and the Saudi partnership. Is it a mirage oh, yeah. or is it something that's going to happen? Uh, the deadline looms. Six months ago, there was the shocking announcement of the partnership that was coming between the uh, Saudi Royal Fund and P the PGA Tour. 
but um, still nothing official. And apparently there's a self-imposed deadline of New Year's, what, December 31st to find agreement and reach agreement yeah. on whatever this new structure is going to be. And so now, uh, as they say, deadlines make deals. Will yeah, do. the deadline make a deal? We'll keep you posted here in, at the turn. Mm, yeah. Um, it's, it's just weird how it's all played out. It sure is. It just doesn't make a lot of well, sense. Well, there was so much br- blowback from all – and the PGA Tour and Jay Monahan said, "Look, we just, this is what we had to do. We were, they're going to bleed us dry with legal, you know, lawsuits and legal fees. And uh, they have an unlimited supply of money. We don't. And uh, you know, they did their best, or at least they say they did their best in the PGA Tour to raise the the purses and put the more marquee events and get the buy-in from the players. But at the same time, uh, you know, when they made this announcement, there was just." In this country, there was just so much blowback from the golf community, from the corporate community, and the, the, the longtime PGA Tour partners saying, wait a second. So, again, there's just – it's one of those – a lot of uh, – you know, a lot, a lot of hurdles to climb to yep. make this thing happen. And it's going to make, make, make some, you know, a deal. So, we'll keep an eye on it. Obviously, John Rahm's big decision earlier in the month – um, and we'll really sent the, the thing into a tailspin. So uh, we'll see where this goes. We'll keep you posted here in At The Turn. Also in At The Turn, Rod, we're a couple days out uh, to the end of the December, which means Gray Rock, who has been our course of the month with uh, um, you know, our tour of Central Texas Golf Courses, brought to you by Callahan's General Store. You can still go watch that great video with myself and Omar Uresti out of Gray Rock playing some holes and learning about their restoration and all they did to, uh, to bring that course into perfect shape into 2024. Uh, so go watch that, and we'll have a new course coming up in January, Rod. New nice. course. Beautiful. To start 2024. So we'll tell you about that in the new year. And thank you to our friends at Callahan's General Store. As we say, get on over there and get you – I always say this, get, get get all the stuff you need for the for the hard freeze that's going to come. Get it – you know, you got some downtime now. Maybe you're off work. you you got some some extra time. Get over there. You know it's coming. Get all – yeah, you know it's coming. You know I mean, it's coming. Get, <laughs> go over there. Talk to the great people. They'll get you the faucet covers, the spigot drips, and everything you need for that first hard freeze for your plants and your pets and your pipes. And then you'll have it. And then you don't have to go on the mad dash when, uh-oh, it's going to freeze. It's going to be 20 degrees. There's a 10 degrees tonight. And then you go out to, to Callahan's, and they're all out of everything. And then you're like, oh, damn. Mm-hmm. Then it's too late. That's right. Once the freeze hits, it's too late, y'all. It's always all, it's what we tell you, man. Got Callahan's has got you ready to get your lawn winterized, to be ready. You, know, just, you don't just ignore your lawn through the winter. You want to keep it like a golf course. you got to keep working on it. They'll help you with that and get ready for those hard freezes that are coming into the new year. Callahan's General Store, and we'll keep you posted on the PGA Tour Saudi Partnership and the deadline. It's coming up in a couple of days. That's at the turn on Hook'em Up with Ian Rod B. All right, uh, the coaches, both uh, Steve Sarkeesian and Kellen DeBoer, coaches of Texas and Washington, are already in New Orleans with their team. I believe they got down on the 26th. Uh, both coaches spoke with the media for the introductory press conferences for the Sugar Bowl. We played Steve Sarkeesian's media availability earlier and spoke about that. This time, uh, this time, let's go over to the other side of the matchup and let's hear from Washington's head coach, Kellen DeBoer. Well, I, I, I think the, the thing you see is that he's had continual growth from a year ago. Um, and that's not just uh, Quinn, but also just the rest of the team. Um, you know, and he, along with his skill group, uh, are in, in sync. You can see that uh, they're executing an extremely high level. Um, I think he just his command of the offense uh, has continued to improve uh, from a year ago. And so... You know, we're expecting a, a, a much different football team than we saw, which was a very good football team even a year ago. And so, um, you know, he's protected. Uh, he understands, I think, just from a, from a football sense, um, you know, it's another year into your career. And so I've been, been very impressed. He can deliver the ball, put it wherever he wants. And, uh, you know, we'll have – we know we'll have our hands full, um, you know, trying to slow uh, Quinn and the offense down. All right, uh, that was a clip of Kalen DeBoer, thanks to my man Ty, uh, of him talking about Quinn Ewers, actually. Very yeah. complimentary of Quinn Ewers, too. Uh, but he, you'll hear that piece of audio within the uh, the much longer piece of audio. It's about eight minutes of Kalen DeBoer meeting with the media, discussing not only Quinn Ewers, but a lot of other things. But, yeah, he, he actually, you can tell yeah. he likes Quinn Ewers, though. 
Yeah, he does. And, yeah. and, and knows this Texas offense will be more dynamic and better than what they saw last year in the Alamo Bowl. And uh, uh, you're better, Quinn, yours, a better running game. A.D. Mitchell's now part of the passing game. Yep. And by the way, Rod, in New Orleans today, uh, 930 this morning, to, uh, the defensive coordinators will be available. So, P.K., uh, and then, of course, PK's former linebackers coach now is the defensive coordinator with the Huskies. Yeah. Plus, Longhorn players Byron Murphy, Tavondre Sweat, uh, Jalen Ford, Jade Barron, Baron Sorrell will all be uh, we talking. We never to hear me. from PK. You know, yeah. Sark doesn't make his coordinators really available. Right. That this often. is probably the first time since the beginning of the season. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Like right before the season starts, Sark lets you know, lets his coordinators and coaches do an availability. That's it. That's it. Other than that, he's the one voice that you hear. I think that, and obviously that's deliberate. He we wants. I I think he wants to unburden them <laughs> um, having to do that. But also, I believe he just wants one message out there answering all the questions. I think he learned that from Saban because I think Saban does a very similar does thing. Too. Yeah, okay. Makes sense. Uh, all right, well, here is Kalen DeBoer, the head coach of the Washington Huskies, meeting with the media during the introductory uh, media availability for the Sugar Bowl. Good evening, and uh, hope you all had a Merry Christmas. Um, Today, uh, just uh, had a practice this morning and hopped on a flight here, and everything went pretty smooth. So guys are excited to finally get to this point. Uh, you know, you, you win uh, the Pac-12 championship, and um, it seems like forever down the road. Uh, you know, a lot of things before you get to this point, uh, including even academics, right? Guys taking finals and things like that. But uh, here we are, and, uh, you know, really looking forward to a great week being down here, uh, continue preparation for Texas, and uh, just uh, you know, a lot of a uh, lot of new adventures for our guys. You know, being uh, in this particular game in a national semifinal game, um, first uh, Pac-12, not just the first UW team, but first Pac-12 team to ever be in the Sugar Bowl. So, a um, lot of exciting things. Um, I know our fans are excited to get down here and get a taste of New Orleans, and uh, also you know, be ready for the game. So I'm um, looking forward to an awesome week being here. We're going to go to some questions now. Please wait for a microphone if you could. It's going to request Ted, Ted here. And we'll to get him right. Coach, you've been in bowl games before, but this is the first time in a, a playoff game, at least at this level. Are you um, approaching this any different than you would a regular bowl trip? And if so or if not, have you talked to maybe coaches who have been in the, the playoffs? Uh, yeah, I think I think there's definitely a bit different feel to it. I think even the the setup of the bowl itself, uh, you know, with you know the activities and so forth. I think there's um, I think in our guys' mind probably more of a business like approach to it. Um, you know, uh, never really had had conversations or worries about uh, guys maybe not even thinking about playing. Um, they worked extremely hard uh, to get to this point, and this is what it was all about. Is is uh, having the chance to, to be in a cha national championship. And so um, I think there is a more of a business-like approach. Um, I know our staff has a lot of, uh, you know, peers throughout uh, college football, myself included, that um, just kind of get an idea of just the things to be ready for, uh, the, the way that the schedule might uh, be set up. But um, I think there's a lot of experience our staff has, and we've sorted through all that and had a good schedule in place up to this point and, and looking forward to a good week. Coach, what uh, what do you know from watching film on Quinn Ewers, and what, what do you have to do to try to contain him or stop him? Well, I, I I think the the thing you see is that he's had continual growth from a year ago, um, and that's not just uh, Quinn, but also just the rest of the team. Um, you know, and he, along with his skill group, uh, are in in sync. You can see that uh, they're executing at an extremely high level. Um, I think he just his command of the offense uh, has continued to improve uh, from a year ago. And so, you know, we're expecting a, a, a much different football team than we saw, which was very good football team even a year ago. And so, um, you know, he's protected. Uh, he understands, I think, just from a from a football sense, um, you know, it's another year into your career. And so been been very impressed. He can deliver the ball, put it wherever he wants. And, uh, you know, we'll have, we know we'll have our hands full, um, you know, trying to slow uh, Quinn and the offense down. If you want to prepare for the gas shortage,
That's Cody DeBoer talking uh, to the media about Texas and uh, what he thought was um, kind of the keys to the matchup there. Um, I know there's a little bit more, but it's it's all right. We'll uh, we'll get back to it a little bit later on because we we can just discuss uh, kind of Kalen DeBoer. I don't think he goes into too much detail about um, the matchup as well. Um, I thought something else that we haven't discussed enough is how Kalen DeBoer is going to try to you know uh, attack this Texas off Texas defense. Um, I think ultimately, and I heard Chris Peterson talk about this. I've referenced that interview a couple of times, um, saying that this pass, this pass protection offensive line, and maybe the best pass protecting offensive line in the country. They've only allowed 11 sacks so far this season, and they've only allowed 46, I believe, tackles for loss the entire season. Um, e brought up the fact that Texas didn't have a lot of splash plays defensively, uh, didn't force a lot of negative plays last season against uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Washington offense and against um, the uh, Michael Penix and the offense. So I think this season, one of the big, at least this game, I should say, one of the big issues will be the matchup between the offensive line, Joe Moore Award winning offensive line for Washington, and the defensive front for Texas. How they get pressure, how they try to either blitz or how. They manufacture pressure against Michael Penix will probably end up being one of the biggest keys. Um, Chris Peterson said it, it's going to be the biggest key once Texas either stops the running game or neutralizes the running game. What will be Washington's answer? And it will probably be just to throw the football. I think they'll come out throwing the football anyway. Remember last year, their first play was a deep shot. It was a flea flicker. They threw the ball deep downfield. I think they'll come out throwing it. You want to take advantage of Derek Williams being out of that secondary um, early on in this contest, and if I am Washington, I might come out throwing and testing that secondary early to see if they're going to hold up in coverage. Yeah, we heard Sark earlier talking about uh, the same thing, right? We we we've been testing our guys, try to get up to game speed, right? Uh, we 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 I mean, if you're if you're Sark and you watch this team on film and you saw them a little bit last year, you know what they can do. You know, you need to use your speed and your receivers to prime your secondary, right? Yep, get them ready. Get them ready. Uh, sharpen the steel with your steel. You can simulate as close to anybody as what Washington has outside. And so you've really got to, you, you know, go good on good here, especially in the secondary, um, you know, and, and on the D-line, right? I mean, you, you got to get pressure on Michael Penix. This is a heck of a matchup, man. The more we drill into it and talk about it, last year's game was 27-20. Um, you feel you know you feel like this will be a close game that comes to the wire. I agree with you. I think you know I think Texas has the overall talent advantage and the mm -hmm. physicality advantage. But I'll tell you this about Washington, Rob: they're very experienced, man. Their their roster is full of super seniors and COVID holdovers and uh, guys who played a lot of college football. Even from the the coach Jimmy Lake administration there at Washington, that there's some Chris Peterson guys on this team. Yeah, think about yeah, that. They are. You're right about that. <laughs> I mean, that's I'm with you. I think their experience, especially in the system, we talked about that. Michael Penix has been in this system for about four years, uh, from uh, Kalen DeBoer's time there at Indiana when he won the job initially. That's why he wanted this guy here. So they fit. They're really compatible. But the wide receiving core, they've been uh, together uh, in this system with Michael Penix with Kalen DeBoer since he got to Washington. So is there second year in it there was some injuries early on but man this wide receiving core is going to be a problem uh for texas uh, across the board that's just the biggest uh, advantage for them their biggest strength is their passing game it's because of the synchronicity that exists between the wide receivers and between the quarterback and that that sophisticated passing game romo Dunze is the guy that texas has to make sure that they roll coverage or they bracket or they double team that guy he's got uh, 62 10 plus yard receptions are plays from scrimmage. Uh, just to give Jeez. you a little bit of uh, some perspective on that, Xavier Worthy is at 41. And Xavier Worthy is one of the most explosive receivers in the country. But this guy's a real deal. Um, I saw Daniel Jeremiah said that of all the receivers in this draft, he's his favorite. Uh, Daniel Jeremiah said his favorite receiver is Romo Dunze. And I know why. He's got 17 consistent catches. That's tied for the most in the FBS uh, this season, which means those are 50-50 balls. You throw it up if you're in man-to-man -man coverage. He believes that his guy's going to win. That also works against Penix because Penix has six interceptions on the season when throwing to Romo Dunze. He's only got nine picks on the season, six of those. Oh, and he's targeting uh, Romo Dunze. So we really trust that guy. If he's in man-to-man -man coverage, he's going to throw it up to him. And why not? He's caught more than 70% of his contested targets this season. 70%. So there are times where he would just give his guy a chance. It's not even a great throw and not accurate. He just gives his guy a chance, and Romo Dunze does the rest. 
That's what Texas has to watch. He's a real deal. He's 6'3", 215, very likely going to be a first-round wide receiver taken uh, in the upcoming draft. He's got, if you go look at it, he is uh, second in 20-plus yard plays from scrimmage. Uh, he's tied for fifth in 30-plus yard plays from scrimmage. Uh, he is an explosive wide receiver. Jalen Polk is tied for sixth um, with, I think he's got 11 of those uh, uh, like uh, 30 plus yard plays from scrimmage. These guys are explosive vertical threats. Yeah, big plays. Uh, and they don't turn it over and they don't get sacked. I mean, as you said, only no. 30, only uh, what's the number? 18 sacks the last two years? 18 in the last two years, man. And uh, Michael Penix, as I mentioned, has only been sacked 31 times in his whole career. That's crazy. So they don't uh, give up negative plays very often and none to Texas last year. And then they can go explosive down the field. That's what the Longhorns will deal with. In this game, we know the Longhorns can be very explosive as well, and we're playing their most explosive football uh, at the end of the season with Quinn Ewers in this offense. Could be a shootout on Monday night uh, for sure. All right, coming up, uh, we'll get to some off the record, including Mark Cuban. It's official now. The uh, The Sands Casino family now owns the, the Dallas Mavericks. And is Mark Cuban ahead of the curve on casino gambling in Texas, Rod? I want to ask you this question. There's a lot of people asking this question now, and I'll give you a piece of evidence that may indicate that maybe Cuban – Kind of, you know, he's a smart guy. He knows where he's going with things. But uh, there, there could be some more evidence of that coming up. Also, the other off the record topic stories maybe you've missed, but you need to know about because they'll be talked about. It took him up with Ian Rodby.
All right, it's actually Ty. off the record time, Ty. Ooh, off the record. It's been a few days. <laughs> it's been a few days. <laughs> and I was like, oh, hold up. We here already? Man. It's I, yeah. almost 10 o'clock. I don't know. We flew by. I don't know. Sorry. Let's see. We, right. Can we do off the record? Or do we That's need to do right. that? Are we, we going to flip them today? What are we doing? What are we doing, Ty? Ooh. There <laughs> we go. We got it. DD Mega Doo Doo. I'm sorry. Mangoodoo. Mangoodoo. Once it's turned on, the sign will spell out Deli Cat Essen. Well, well I don't get a day of rain, day and cold. Well, congratulations. Yeah, Continue good sex in, the, good sex in the Big East. Thank you, Jimmy. And boom goes the dynamite. It's time for another edition of. Off the record. Do it live. I can. I'll write it and we'll do it live. And thing sucks. Off the record time and uh, some stories you need to hear about that uh, Rod and I dig up and find for you because uh, you know kind of you know, off the off the grid a little bit. A little off the celebrating grid. Christmas, it's been a while. Celebrating the holiday season. All right. So officially yesterday, the NBA voted uh, to approve the sale of uh, the Dallas Mavericks to. Miriam Adelson and the family and the Patrick Dumont family. Okay. Uh, if you're a Mavericks fan or an NBA fan, here's the deal. Uh, this is one of the richest women in the world, the fifth richest woman in the world. Oh, yeah. So Sheldon Adelson, uh, her husband, uh, the late Sheldon Adelson, he's a casino tycoon who built the Venetian, the Palazzo in Las Vegas, several of the casino resorts in Singapore wow. and around the world. Okay. And as of uh, this year, Sheldon Adelson's widow, Miriam, is uh, – the 35th richest person on the planet and the fifth richest woman in the world, estimated worth of $32.3 billion. 35th richest person in the world? Yeah. Fifth richest woman. Yeah. I like she, it. She's got money. Damn and right. she now, she along with the me. Dumont family, own the Mavericks. And now, but apparently, according to Mark Cuban, uh, even though he doesn't have the, the official title through this agreement, he will stay in control of the Mavericks. Basketball side. Basketball okay. ops. All right. The thing he told the media yesterday, Rod, is that uh, we'll be able to pay the luxury tax moving forward because we have such rich owners now. We don't have to worry about the luxury tax. And it basically says, I want to win, and they want to win. So now, because we, we've seen what Matt Ishbia has done in Phoenix, mm -hmm. the billionaire. Oh, yeah. And he's not afraid of the luxury tax, no. and they went and He'll got Kev, Kevin Durant. Golden State Warriors did that for a while. Yes. They just paid the luxury tax. And so that's part of it. And, yeah. and, and, and you know, when asked about, you know, what about the fact that, you know, you're – you're still in control, but you're not the owner anymore. He said, uh, they're not basketball people. They're not basketball people, mm -hmm. but they're casino people. Okay. Now, I will point this out, Rod. Las Vegas-based casino company has bought 100-plus acres of land near the Cowboys' old stadium, the old Texas stadium in Irving. And in it, the, according to Dallas Texas TV, it confirms that a resort is being planned. Okay. So. so the same family has now bought 100-plus acres of land near the old Cowboys Stadium. Not the current one, but the old one with the hole in the roof. And Mark, Mark Cuban also, um, so, so it says, they, uh, did it, for now it appears, though, Adelson and Dumont won't do so as far as bringing someone else in, not Mark Cuban. That was part of the logic behind the partnership. The Mavericks want to build a new arena and casino district. And Casino District, as we state here this morning, sp gambling is illegal in Texas. Casinos yes, are illegal in Texas. Yeah. Unless you're on a reservation. Yes. Does Mark Cuban know something that's trending that we don't know? Mm. Is this a get a Remember, you and I both watched the show Billions on Showtime, right? Where oh, yeah. The lead characters, I mean, it was the original Axe tried to buy a baseball team. Mm -hmm. Brian, uh, a lot of insider trading going on. Yeah, like there's a lot of things behind the scenes they know that we don't know. Yeah, a lot of inside information being exchanged. So I remember the, the, the Michael, Manning, Michael Prince, right? He, he wanted to get, bring the Olympics to New York and things like that. It's kind of like when Peyton Manning bought all those Papa John's franchises and bought in Papa John's yes. right on the verge of the Colorado legalizing marijuana, yes. recreational marijuana. Like he he knew he was like, oh, it's all these, all these potheads. They're gonna want something to eat. So Papa, Papa John's. John's, and then he sold them all right after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he mm -hmm. knew, he knew. So Cuban gets in bed with the Adelsons. Mm -hmm. Now they've bought 100 acres of land out in Irving, mm -hmm. um, perfect for a resort and casino. Hey. Just, you know, that you know. usually the billionaires thought, know before we know. We always thought Texas would be one of the last states to legalize recreational marijuana and legalize gambling. But at this point, there have been so many other conservative states that have done it. I could see Texas doing it just because of the cash flow. 
because the cash flow from the that kind of the tax dollars, yeah, the commerce that you create from uh, well, legalizing many, marijuana or legalizing, you know, well, how gambling? many Longhorn fans are going to stop in Lake Charles, right over the border, of Louisiana, do some gambling on their way to New Orleans? Yeah, that's nothing. How much commerce <laughs> are you losing? How yes. much money are you actually losing? Well, because if you go Very up, good. if you go up uh, a little, my daughter goes to North Texas in Denton. All you got to do is go a little bit north across the border, and you are in. There's the Windstar World mm-hmm. Resort where you can do some gambling, right? Yeah. Uh, Lake Charles, right across the border in Louisiana. Same thing. Um, just pointing out, you know, Mark Cuban it's has now sold one. his team. They know. He wants to win, the and big, now they're buying land. The billionaires know. You see the latest conspiracy theories that people believe because they, they confirmed that Mark Zuckerberg was building like a a huge, like, I don't know, it was a bomb shelter or something like that. And yeah. it's, it's considered huge. They got pictures of it. And now the rumor is, and I'm sure my man Ty is on this because he's on the, the grassy knoll all the time, is that all the billionaires are building bomb shelters because they know something's going down. Yeah. Have you heard this conspiracy theory, Ty? Have you been on this one? Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I'm sh- I, everybody's got their hideaway hole, right? Everybody's got Anybody, their hideaway If you got not, the money. I, if you got the money, that's what I'm saying. You know, I, was, I, I personally do not either. <laughs> not everybody. No, I'm, I'm, headed, I'm headed to the Denver airport if the apocalypse ever happens. Denver airport. Oh, is that <laughs> what you think? That's where the, uh, the, the shelter is, the bunker? That's where they're hiding all the real paintings, famous paintings and stuff, all the Nazi treasure. Uh, uh, okay. The giant tunnels are there. Yeah, no, you should. Want, there's some good YouTube videos on the Denver airport if you haven't, if you haven't researched <laughs> he it. He said, uh, said, fellas, you know I work with the Texas legislators from Patrick. Uh, he says, near-term legalized gambling, sports casinos, or otherwise, he isn't going anywhere with Dan Patrick because our lieutenant governor, Cuban's looking go. at five to seven years out. There you go. Post Dan Patrick. So, uh, well, you know, done. but five to seven, they play the long game, these billionaires. That's why they're billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're. Now you got to buy their property early. Don't be if you if you're waiting like two years before it all happens. It's too late to buy the yeah, property. Well, now been, you buy it. We've been told that before. Dan Patrick is not moving off that. But same time, it's like man, you're missing out on a lot of revenue that can be generated. And a lot of billionaires revenue. that are pushing it because they're, you know down in Houston the Fertitta family is pushing it. They're all ready to go as soon as it's legal. Just tax it, man. Just tax the hell out of it. That's well, what they do with marijuana. Well, you know, they Bob, just tax the hell out of it. You know, Bobby Epstein. Pay for team. schools. Pay for, you know, Trust infrastructure. Me. You know, people, you know, Bobby Epstein and the team out of Coda, Circuit of the Americas, they're ready to go. Yeah. Everybody's ready to go on this thing. Jerry Jones is ready to go. Jerry Jones has been ready. Now the Sands family is bought in Texas, and they own an NBA team. Yeah. And the, billion, hey, the billionaires got a lot of influence now. They got to start buying some uh, some influence on that. They already own some on Capitol Hill. But I'm talking about sports betting influence on Capitol Hill, uh, or at least here in the local government. I should say. Got to get through the lieutenant governor, who used to be the when I was growing up and you were growing up in Houston, right? He was the sportscaster. And it's crazy that Dan Patrick was also <laughs> into sports broadcasting. Like well, he bought Dan radio Patrick. stations. Yeah, he bought radio stations. Yeah. Well. And he got to start talking about what he believes, and now he's the lieutenant governor. Yeah. See, he used to be into capitalism, and now he's like just he's into cronyism. Cronyism. <laughs> well, keep an eye on that. There's a reason the uh, the Sands family is now entrenched in Texas. Straight cash, homie. That's why. I want to get your off the records coming back, Rod. We'll pick those up. Uh, we went a little long through the whole segment. We'll also pick good. up the uh, the uh, who who said that will actually happen next hour, Rod. We'll also get another Rod's rant coming up. We're talking Texas and Washington. You're counting down the days now. It's four days and change out to Texas and Washington. Sugar Bowl coming back. Hook them up with Ian Rod B.
Thursday on the horn. Hook them up with Ian Rod B. Bowl game starting in one hour. If you're into uh, some oh. bowl game action, the Fenway Bowl from Fenway Park. I like that. AM Boston Bowl, College so. against SMU. Is SMU going to roll that team? SMU's really a good, good squad. Boston College is pretty good. But they are playing at home. I have to look at the weather in greater Boston this morning. Sucky, man. Who's playing Boston? It's like that Patriots Day game when the Red Sox oh, play yeah. at 10 o'clock in the morning. No, you don't want to. You, don't, you only want to play in Boston this late in the year when you're getting paid for it. Yes. <laughs> it's just, oh, here it is. It's not an exhibition game. <laughs> How about this? Uh, SMU's going. What the hell are we doing? Uh, it's 45 degrees in Boston right now, mm. drizzling, and rain is forecast 90 percent throughout nah, the day. Now we're good. Now nah, we're good. It's like watching Virginia Tech. And look, I. You know, good for those guys to get to go to Annapolis, Maryland, and see our uh, see the Naval Academy, and that's a beautiful that place. That actually is pretty cool. Great history. Yeah. Learn a lot there. But okay, send us home. I don't want to play a bowl game in the rain like they no. did yesterday, which mm-hmm. seems like the front that was in Annapolis yesterday has moved up the coast to Boston, and that's what they'll play in. That also probably means that's what they're going to play the Pinstripe Bowl in today with Rutgers and Miami. Don't play in the baseball stadium. Where's they play it at that Yankee now? Stadium. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's kind of cool. Is it for a minute? <laughs> for like the first, like half of the first quarter, and then you're like, all right, you know what, I'm done with this. This is why the bowl games hard to keep up with because you don't know who's playing in the bowl games anymore between transfers. Same and weather, in, same weather in New York today, by the way. Uh, Mid 40s and raining. Yeah, man, that's ugly. U G L Y. How about the Miami Hurricanes going? You sent us from Miami to go play in this? Hey, come on, man. Nah, man. Nah, I'm good. Hey, give, Ruck- me that, give me some of that Bahamas bowl. Hey, Rutgers, why don't you come play us? Mm-hmm. And we'll go to South Beach. I'm trying to play in one of them. <laughs> Seriously. God. Yeah, the oh. bowl games are – I would love to see the um, – at least the timeline of the viewership of the bowl games year after year. Oh. The annual viewership of bowl games. Going the way of the flip phone, Rod. But when you get the, the college football playoff back, the college football playoff ratings are going to go through the roof once, once they obviously yeah, the, go to 12 starting teams. Is, yeah, because they're going to do home sites for the first round. Yeah. Second round will actually be at bowl site. Be at bowl site. So then, that, that'll be a separate thing. We're talking about just these traditional bowl games that are now truly exhibition games now because you have a real playoff now. Uh, man, I think those ratings are just about to Well, plummet. and I think the numbers of bowls plummet. will plummet. Because I think I guess, I, I guess I give, ESPN has been a big part of this. Some would call them a culprit. Some would call it good business. They've funded these bowl games because they want programming during the holidays. That's a good point. They won't – because they're, if they're going to be involved in – which I think they are. They, they own the four-team playoff right now, ABC and Disney. They're going to want the 12-team playoff, right? Um, well, that's going to – then all of a sudden you don't want to fund all these bowl games. And you've got better TV uh, – I'm not saying they're all going away, but you can no, see them right. go from 40 to 20. The less relevant ones. Yes. The ones that are truly not relevant at all. Uh, and, yeah. and Pinstripe Fenway, they're playing a Pop-Tart Bowl today. Pop the Pop Tart Bowl. That's uh, NC State and Casey. I was going to ask you in honor of Pop Tarts. Are you a fan of Pop Tarts? Who's not a fan of Pop Tarts? Strawberry Frost, man. Strawberry to Frost. Oh, so good. Oh, my. I mean, that's... did you eat them without, or did you have to get them in the toaster? Uh, I could do either, and I was never really in the toaster because toaster actually they'd get too hot. I didn't want them too hot. I'd put mine. I was a microwave Pop Tart guy, and just a little bit. I'm talking about 15 to 20 seconds. I don't want it piping hot because I it's actually can't. Warm. Yes. Warm is good for me. I don't want it. Pi- I don't want it where I bite in a pipe tart and then burn the roof of my mouth. Yeah, because that, 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 that frosting frost- will burn you. Yeah, I'm like, no, nah, I'm good on that. I just need it, you know, lukewarm. I'm good on that because I can eat a, po- a cold pop tart too. And some people like to take the edges off the pop tart. That's the best part to me with the edges with the extra frosting on it. Oh, that was delicious. Yeah, my Ooh. kids love pop tarts. Those oh. were a staple at our house growing up. What's this, not to love when man. they were growing up to scrab them. Oh, and that goes back. I mean, pop tarts have never gone out of style. Ty, are you a Pop Tart guy? Because you're you're the youngest Seriously? member of our of our broadcast. Uh, I like the S'mores Pop Tarts. Those were Ooh, good. I never I, had I, one of those. I just recently acquired a toaster for the first time in a while. I, <laughs> hey, I, I don't think I've had you. one since I lived at my parents' house. So I bought some of those, you know, cinnamon raisin uh, English muffins. I was always Ooh. a big fan of those when I was a kid. I kind of got back on that train recently. I'm trying to think. My kids, like we that. had Pop Tarts, but they had to take it to a different level. They're, what are the things that are kind of like that? They're, they're pastries, but then they, they, they come with a package of the Toaster strudels. Put on. Toaster strudel. Yeah, you're right about that. That was even a bigger hit at my house than Pop Tarts. Those are way the better. Toaster, the Toaster strudel was, uh, and of course, my kids would leave the wrapper all over the counter and cream everywhere, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, I was more of, Pop Tarts are much more efficient. 
Oh, yeah. Just grab it and Come go. On, man. Yeah, it's, it. all, it's all there. All you need. Everything you need, man. Get your little sugar to- rush. But toaster strudel was a staple at our house. Toaster strudel. Yeah, it takes a little more. You can't take that on the bus with you, though. No. Mm-mm. Yeah, man, I guess you could, but then, you know, I, the, the pop tart is perfect for yeah, just, hey, you grab throw, and go ride the house. You can have one, and you put one in your backpack for later. Mm-hmm. Great. Oh, it's great. oh, yeah, because it, it basically be dessert for something later on, That's too, right. for lunch. Oh, it's a little dessert there, man. Oh, love me some Pop-Tarts. And then it's good at lunch because you could use it as barter. You could trade for something else, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever do that when you're trading for food? Oh, all the time, <laughs> Yes, man. sir. All the time. Especially when they had, like, those special items uh, that you could oh. get at lunchtime. <laughs> like cinnamon rolls and stuff like that. Oh, I oh yeah. That, man. It's time to bargain, baby. Sugar up at school. <laughs> uh, best game of the night will be down in uh, San Antonio. That's Arizona and Oklahoma in the Alamo Bowl. That's almost a dead even game. And I mentioned earlier, Brent Venables fanned some Longhorn flames by saying that uh, watching Arizona and prepping for the Wildcats, this may be the best team we've played all year. Maybe the best team we've played all year. Hey, taking the shot. <laughs> Taking a shot at Texas. That, hey, someone's a loving for Remember, remember, people. He's talking to his constituency. They, he's talking to his constituents, his people. Yes. When he take, makes that comment, so don't take offense to it, Longhorn fans. He's talking to Sooners and Sooners that want to believe that. And if you do, you're delusional Sooner because they're not the best team you played. I don't even know. I mean, that might be two teams better than Arizona in the Big Twelve. I mean, I, I mean Texas obviously is. Now, uh, Oklahoma State looked pretty good last night Oklahoma when State they beat double, the Aggies. Now got the, to double digit wins again, right? Yeah, the Aggies uh, playing in the Texas Bowl. They, I thought I saw where they had a total. I think of forty eight scholarship players dressed for the game. Unbelievable! Because <laughs> like, of all the opt outs and what is it coming to? <laughs> oh yeah, I mean that's just it's the way it, it's the way of the world now. People hated it, and everybody was totally right when they said this is Pandora's box uh, about guys opting out of bowl games. No question, because now at the transfer portal, they used to be opting out because it was all about their pro Injury, pro- yeah. yeah, they're exactly right. It was their pro prospects, the opportunity to play at the pro level, and you wanted to safeguard against injury. Now, guys are opting out of bowl games because they want to hit the transfer portal so they can hit have better opportunity to make a roster or to get a scholarship Malik elsewhere. Malik Murphy, right? Malik Murphy's yeah. not in this is a championship game for Texas, oh. and Arch Manning is a play away from being in this game. Yeah. Being the guy. The guy. Being the guy. We've yeah. seen that happen for Texas in a championship scenario before. Let's not remind them. I will say for Arizona, they went 9-3 and three this year. Jed Fish, their young coach, is one of the one of the rising names yeah. in coaching. He was up for coach of the year, too. He's a good one. He's in, And they've played a really tough schedule. You know, they played Washington, Washington State, Oregon State this year. Uh, Oregon. So, no, this, this is the battle-tested team. Actually, they did not play Oregon this year in their Pac-10 schedule, or Pac-12 schedule, which is now the Pac-2. Pack they played UCLA? They did. Okay. Uh, they beat UCLA 27-10. to 10. Okay. They beat Utah 42-18. to 18. That Oh, that's impressive. Yeah. They beat USC. They lost to Washington 31-24. to 24. Mm-hmm. So Played Washington really tough. Their too. losses were to Washington Mississippi game. State in overtime to start the year. Wow. That one hurt. How did they lose to Mississippi State? You know, early on in the year. Yeah, sometimes. first of the year. Yeah, it's, it's hard. You don't know who you are as a team. Yeah, I mean, look at Oklahoma State. How they, we just talked about them. Yeah, they're, they're three losses. Games. One of these things is not like the other. They lost to USC, Washington, and Mississippi State. Yeah. And now they'll play the Sooners. Damn, they really, that Mississippi State. I guess, you know, it didn't hurt them as much because still in the conference they ended up losing two games, so they couldn't go to the conference championship because that conference was – Pac-12 was the best it had been in decades. You got an undefeated <laughs> conference champion in Washington. Yeah. Uh, the Pop-Tart Bowl is pretty sweet. The, uh, the trophy for the Pop-Tart Bowl, guys, the ah. football has slots to put Pop-Tarts in. That's okay. true. Is that, it? it can't be true. <laughs> that cannot be true. Is it? You know what? It should be. I'm I like, hope so. That'd be awesome. These bowl sponsorships should have, you know, a better okay. sense of humor about themselves. Well, this was the Camping World Bowl at last check. Yeah. It was also the something else bowl. Uh, Didn't Ma- was it Mac Brown lost to Mayo Bowl? Was that the, the, the Mayo, Duke's Mayo the Bowl? Duke's Mayo Bowl where West Virginia. Neil uh, Brown. Remember, Neil Brown saved his job this year. Remember, everybody thought Neil Brown was going to end up yeah, fired before a good year. the end of the year. He ended up having a good year, beating Mac in the Duke's Mayo Bowl. And that was beat Mac in in Charlotte. I mean, that's Carolina territory. Oh, is it? In, I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't that know game's that's in Charlotte. Okay, that's where, that's, I think that's where the Duke's Mayo headquarters mm. is, Charlotte. Uh, so, yes, I, I, I think it, did they have to dump? Cause I oh, know they did. They got him. They, they, they dumped him. They dumped Neil Brown so in Mayo. I saw it. That's it was, so gross. It, it was disgusting. Lincoln Riley got dumped with eggnog. Last night out at the Sugar, but at the Holiday Bowl. Oh, was that is that a Holiday Bowl tradition? I don't remember. It was Direct TV Holiday. I Bowl. went to the Holiday Bowl twice. I don't remember the eggnog uh, drenching. Mac never got drenched in eggnog. We went to the Holiday yeah, Bowl. Yeah, I saw this. That's just a, good, a picture of uh, that's Lincoln a, Riley. That's with a eggnog. quality bowl of all the bowls that are like the subpar bowls that are not you know elite uh, bowls. The, I will admit Holiday Bowl 
for the players, it's not bad. Well, they're hanging out in San Diego. There, there it is. There it is. Somebody sent us the trophy. It looks a lot like the uh, – it's like a gold football on a stand with two slots with two Pop-Tarts. Uh, what, what am I, why am I putting Pop-Tarts in the trophy? Because uh, it's a sponsor. Oh. <laughs> so, so, like, okay, I got gotcha. you. So, then you – I got I, I, Okay. It's the same I, thing I, with, I, like, I the I cheese it Bowl. Yes, uh, cheese yes. it bowl. But Rod, okay. I was going to ask you when you were in the Holiday Bowl. Has it always been in Petco Park, the baseball stadium? No, it was, no, it no. was. You know, it was in that terrible place of charge baseball play. stadium. Oh. Raymond, was it? What was the no, place it Quan, 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 Qualcomm. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in yeah. baseball parlance, we called that the Murph. It was <laughs> yeah. Jack Murphy Stadium yeah. forever. The Murph the in Murph. San Diego. Uh, but yeah, that was an old baseball stadium. Yeah, we always played Nail Chargers Stadium, and it was it was bad. It was run down. Not a good stadium. It was not great. Not a good stadium. It's not fun. That's why they built that beautiful. It's a beautiful spot right in downtown. And they right had a downtown. Super Bowl there in like the early two thousands. They did. I believe you are correct. My mom went to that yes, one. Sir. Yeah, she. Yeah, that, that's weird. But you, but you went to a couple holidays. You liked that. It was a good bowl trip, right? You go to the oh, zoo. Oh, no, it was a quality bowl trip. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. We went to zoo. They went to Sea World uh, out there at the time. That's San Diego is beautiful. But San Diego's just gorgeous. Outside malls and stuff. I mean, San Diego's just gorgeous. You yeah, just... we've covered it a couple times. I oh, the games amazing. you were in. It's a good spot. It's a great spot. That was back when they were calling Mac Brown the Culligan Man. Culligan Man. Oh man, <laughs> Mac was either that. Mac between the Holiday Bowl, the Cotton Bowl. Mac was in a lot of Cotton Bowls. I played in two bowls, Cotton Bowl and Holiday Bowl. When I was there, that's it. Because he went to the Cotton Bowl, Bowl, and then the oh, then the Alamo Bowl lately has was that bowl. And, well, the Texas Bowl, oh, and then it elevates to the Alamo Bowl. The Alamo Bowl. The Alamo Bowl. Texas had been Alamo Bowl like what three, four times. Recently? Yeah. There's been a lot of Alamo Bowls. Hey, what's the Alamo Bowl like last six, year? I think like six <laughs> in 2010. <laughs> There's been a lot of Alamo Bowls, man. Yeah. That's how that's how the Holiday Bowl was. was their last played. year. See He's them their last to year. Washington. Yeah. Well, now these teams are going to play in New Orleans for the National. Or a chance to play for the National. I know. And basically, Washington played a road game last year. Ended up beating Texas. That was a road game for them. It was a home game for Texas, essentially playing in San Antonio. Same thing again this year. It'll be Washington, essentially, on the road playing in New Orleans because there'll be a lot more Longhorn fans there. And if they... You know, if they can make it to the national title, once again, they'd be playing home games, <laughs> yeah. essentially. Yeah. It would be home stretches well, for Houston Texas. will be unbelievably yeah. partisan. And this would yeah. probably be 65. A 12 title game was basically a oh. home game. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, Rod, uh, can I run these through? Then we'll get to your your, uh, your, rant, your rant for the 9 o'clock hour. Let's do it. Um, finalists for the 2024 Pro Football Hall of Fame around. Oh, let's do it. This is going to be sad. Uh, these are some guys you played with. I know. I would that's imagine. Why I <laughs> that's why I say. <laughs> well, uh, there are a couple no-brainers. Julius Peppers. Yeah, he's in. Yeah. Yeah, he's in. Do you know that he was the draft pick that the Houston Texans should have made, not Dave, David Carr? Uh, yeah, that, you're right about that. I pl- we played against him. Remember that was that uh was that it was that wasn't the Cole Pimmy game. I'm sure maybe it was the Cole Pimmy. Yeah, game. when he played we had North uh, North Carolina. North Carolina, he was playing basketball and playing football. Played against Jay. He was a bad dude. Uh, yeah, I remember he 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 was such a freak that I remember guys getting off like the bench. Um, during like we were supposed to be obviously doing adjustments and why the offense on the field and going up to try to watch Julius Peppers because he was that much of a freak. Like, oh, all right, we did adjustments. All right, I'm going to watch. I, I covered him <laughs> playing playing basketball for North Carolina in the Sweet 16 yeah. here in Austin. Yeah, man, he was definitely he was that kind of an athlete. He's like, now nah, I got to get eyes on this. And team. the our Houston Texans took David Carr with their first ever dra- Ooh, draft pick, David Carr, David, who still has the record for the most being the most sacked quarterback yes. in NFL yes. history. Yes. Yeah. Julius Peppers was probably the right pick there. Now that he's going to be in the first ballot Hall of Famer, <laughs> I think uh, so. Antonio Gates. Oh man, his first year of eligibility. I'm not sure. I got to look at them stats on that tight end position real quick, but he's got a good case tight end wise, no doubt. Uh, other members of the uh, finalists: Jared Allen. Remember him? This is a great pass rusher with the Vikings yeah, and the Chiefs. Yeah, just based on his stats, I want to say he's top ten all time, if I'm not mistaken, in sacks. He's like he's a, he's among those. Let me Another go member of that 2002 draft class: top ten pick Dwight Freeney. Dwight Freeney is a finalist. That's why there's getting, you know, that's kind of a log jam there because I want to say the the pass sack rushers. leaders, the pass rushers, all those guys, all the guys that are ranked ahead of them are in. Uh, Eric Allen, uh, cornerback, also uh, Dwight. Yeah, Julius Peppers is fifth uh, all time in sacks. All the guys ahead of him are in. Um, who else did you say, Jared Allen? He is 16th all time in sacks. Everybody ahead of him except for Julius Peppers and except for Terrell Suggs. Are in, and who was the other one you said there? Other pass Dwight rusher, Dwight Freeney. 
Uh, Dwight, he's a little bit farther down. Yeah, Dwight Freeney may not have a great case because there are several guys ahead of him. Jim Marshall, Coy Bacon, Al Baker, Leslie O'Neill, John Abraham that are ahead of him that are not in. Jared Allen, great case. Not sure about Dwight Freeney. Rodney Harris, Devin Hester. Can Devin Hester go in He's as a in. specialist? Great. Yeah. I mean, he might be the greatest return of all time. Yeah. He's in. He was a game changer. Yeah. But how about our guy for the Texans, Andre Johnson? Now, listen, Andre Johnson's got a great case. You know what's holding back Andre Johnson? Touchdown receptions. Yep. Because he is close to being top 10 to top 15 in almost all of the major categories, receiving yards, receiving yards per game, receptions, but touchdowns. He's really low down the list in touchdowns. Well, there are two guys, I believe, as a, as a Texan. I mean, the Cowboys and Texans have somebody to lobby for because I would lobby. I'd stand on the table for Andre Johnson. He's one of the two or three. Bet, he's probably the, one of the top two players in, in franchise history. Oh, he is, yeah. In 22 years. And Darren Woodson is nominated for the Cowboys. Darren Woodson, so someone who covered those teams. I was not a Cowboys fan, but Darren Woodson was such a great player for them in the back end. I don't know that he's ever going to get in the Hall of Fame. I think he's worthy of the Hall of Fame. I am a huge Darren Woodson fan. Also, Patrick Willis. How about Patrick Willis? Oh, Patrick Willis. I mean, I know he didn't play long because he retired early, but if you're looking at impact, impact, I want to say all pros. He made like what, three or four all pros in this thing's short career. I mean, that's hard to do. Okay, so Andre Johnson, how about this? 11th all-time, we're talking about all-time here, 11th all-time in receptions, 11th all-time in, make sure I get this right here, 11th all-time in receiving yards, <laughs> um, but if you look at receiving touchdowns, oh man, here we go. Uh, let's go down. Andre Johnson, let's go down. Uh, it, 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 I, it, I may not be able to find it on there. Well, that's because he played with <laughs> crappy quarterbacks his he whole played career. With terrible, and that, that should be part of his case to get in, is that look at the terrible quarterbacks he played with, but we never saw him really in the playoffs. No. Nope. And then you never saw him, you know, you know obviously make, make big plays in big games. He was like, they would throw it to him, and he's like Adrian Peterson out on the outside. He's like 230 pounds. He's and a he receiver. He's beast. I was supposed to play against him in the national title game, and we didn't. No, we y'all. We <laughs> were supposed to play. We would lose to Colorado. We were supposed Miami. to play in Miami that year. And even though we probably would have gotten beaten, I would have loved the challenge of playing against Andre Johnson. Yeah, okay, so he's 53rd oh. all time in touchdown receptions. That's going to hurt him and the case that he hasn't played in the playoff games. That's real, any playoff games, really any I don't think I, maybe he's played in one or two, but nothing really impactful on terms of his overall resume. I'm going to attribute that to bad quarterback play, but I you know, that's, I mean, he played on some bad teams in Houston. Really bad teams. Uh, and meanwhile, Darren Woodson played on some great teams. Darren Woodson Dallas should show. be in. I love that guy. But I just thought be, he's such a good player. Yeah, just because of the uh, the brand of the Cowboys, sometimes that brand it helps out the Cowboys who are on the on the verge. Right there on the cusp. Uh, he, but he also gets hurt because they already have so many guys from those teams in the Hall of Fame. So That's like, a great point. So it's too. like, eh, how many guys can we put in? Hey, Rod, can we get Rod's rant for the 9 o'clock hour? Hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Find out what happens when people stop being polite. And start getting real. You ain't keeping it real. Oh my God! Okay, it's happening. Everybody, stay calm. Oh, well, you've procedure. done it now. It's time for Rod's no. rant of the day. Hold on to your butts. Uh, let's talk about the offensive line for the Washington Huskies. Um, while, while we were on break, they actually won the Joe Moore Award for the best offensive line in the country. Texas was in the conversation as well. I believe Texas was a. Uh, Texas was a finalist or a semifinalist for the Joe Moore Award, too. So the Texas offensive line, um, also one of the better ones in the country. But there's a case to be made that the Washington offensive line is the best in the country overall. They just won the Joe Moore Award, period. Uh, Chris Peterson says it's the best pass protection unit in all of college football. They've only allowed 11 sacks this season, seven all of last season, 46 tackles for loss this season is what they've allowed. Uh, so they're top five in the country and fewest sacks allowed. And one of the strangest kind of storylines about this offensive line is that they lost their starting center for the season. Uh, his name, uh, he was a sixth-year senior, actually. Uh, and he was Me, uh, Mele uh, Mateo, I believe, was his name. Yeah, me, sorry, Mateo Mele. I mixed it up. Uh, Mateo Mele, he was a sixth-year senior. He had a season-ending injury in week two, and that's when they moved the 270, at the time, 270-pound uh, freshman, uh, redshirt freshman right guard to center 
Parker Brailsford. And everybody assumed that this would be extremely detrimental and it would put them at a severe disadvantage. I think it did for a while before they adjusted. Uh, but now that offensive line is playing uh, like the best offensive line in the country, or one of them. Uh, the pair of fifth-year juniors, Nate Kalepo and Julius Bulo, they're the ones who solidified the interior because they're both now the starting guards. Um, so they book in Parker Brailsford, which helps him out a lot. They don't overburden the young man. Uh, but that offensive line with uh, Roger Rosengarten, playing the right tackle. He is uh, really good. He's going to play in the league. He's an NFL guy. Did not allow a sack all season long. Uh, Troy uh, Fautanu is the left uh, tackle. He's a star. He was a... he was a first-team All-Conference pick. He's third-team All-American. He's also a guy that will play on Sundays. I mean, he's they, those two tackles are NFL guys. And it, what makes it even more extraordinary is that, you know, everybody assumed that the interior offensive line for, would be a weakness for them after losing three of their 2022 starters from the interior. They lost Jackson Kirkland, uh, Corey Luciano, and Henry uh, Bainvalu. They were all starters in the interior line. When Texas played them in the Alamo Bowl, they had a different group of uh, starting interior offensive linemen, lost that group, replaced them with uh, a couple of guys who were inexperienced, and then even lost that guy. Uh, in terms of the veterans they had in the interior and had to replace them with a redshirt freshman, and yet they've kept they've kept the uh, the the standard pretty high that they're playing at for that offensive line. They also one of the other I think subplots that's really interesting when Kevin DeBoer came in two years ago, he actually kept the offensive line coach Scott Huff from the previous regime. And there was no real reason for him to keep them because that offensive line had underachieved. I mean, they went 4-8. and eight. They were 120th in the FBS in yards per rush that season at 3.19. Uh, their pass protection was in shambles. You know, a lot of people would have thought, oh, you go in there, you bring in your own offensive line coach. That was not the case. They kept Scott Huff around, and it's paying huge dividends because they've been one of the better O-lines in the country the last two seasons. This could end up being, at least Chris Peterson, former Washington coach, thinks this could end up being the determining factor in the game. And I think when you look at how the game might play out, and I think it will play out, Texas will make Washington one-dimensional because they made every team one-dimensional by taking away the run, and Texas is a top-five rush defense. When they do that, uh, when they take away the run and force Washington into being one-dimensional, where Washington is perfectly comfortable because they're a, pa- they're a passing first team anyway. I think the month of November, their pass uh, ratio, or you look at their pass rate, is about 55%. So they're passing more than they're running anyway in the month of November. I think you're going to see that up even more. They're probably going to lose the balance they have in the offense with the running game, maybe try more unconventional methods to run the football, whether it be wide receiver reverses and ends around, and maybe they'll go with some quarterback draw, some some, of the, uh, some ways, maybe the extension of the running game, the screen game, uh, the quick game. But I think Texas will stop the traditional run game and that's when it'll come down to can they pass protect against Texas pass rush? And if Texas can't get there organically, how often will they blitz? And when you blitz, your corners and your DBs are on an island. And for how long are you going to leave them on that island if you're blitzing before you got to get home? Because last year they didn't get home once. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, uh, it is. it feels like as Chris Peterson, as you cited that interview, he was such a good coach. He was such a meat and potatoes. Came from Boise State. Mm-hmm. He, you know, he was lines of scrimmage. You know, just attention to detail, toughness. That's what his programs were built on. And then Jimmy Lake and kind of kept that going with Pete Kwiatkowski. And it feels like you know bringing in Kalen DeBoer has you know what will really changed it is he's brought in the dynamic quarterback, and he retained Roma Dunze. Right, right. Yep. He was a Rome was a big time recruit out of Las Vegas. Um, you know, but through the coaching changes, that's a guy that could have jumped out of there. Yeah. Uh, and he stayed. And now you've got these three NFL receivers. And so it's like Kalen DeBoer's brought the – kind of like Sark brought the, the offensive mind uh, and at a quarterback to what Chris Peterson and Jimmy Lake were already doing, which was being really solid. Just, you know, not, Washington's never going to over-talent you. They no. What would you say? They don't have any five stars on no the team. No five stars. They have more three stars than anybody in the college football playoff on their roster. So, And that's how Chris Peterson won at Boise State, right? You have to you have, you have to develop coach them up, develop them up, get, get, get guys to different levels. Uh, they've done that at Washington, but they never had the dynamic offense and the dynamic quarterback. Well, now they do. 
So you're mixing the two, and Kalen DeBoer has done a real good job of that. It was the right hire. Sark has, you know, with the coaching staff he hired to build the lines of scrimmage, and then he brings the offensive mind, right? And PK uh, has really, you know, developed that defense, and, you know, it looks like they're going to develop it even further down the line with the acquisitions yep. they've made in the portal and the recruiting classes. But I think you see where these teams are going. That's why it's going to be a fun game. Both teams are really, really solid up front on both sides. Both teams – you know, their pass defenses can be had if the quarterbacks get time. And so both teams have really good quarterbacks with uh, offensive-minded coaches. Um, you know, he who gets pressure probably wins this game. Yeah. And uh, the running game, you know, on both sides, not sure how much of a role it is going to play um, because of the pass defense, how susceptible they are. But keep in mind, Washington's offensive line, um, they actually look at yards before contact. They're one of the better run blocking units in the country, too. Uh, they were top 10 in yards before contact per rush. If you look at versus uh, FBS opponents, now, this was through week 12, uh, but as accurate as and accurate uh, as we could get, as recent as we could get, they were top 10, um, averaging 3.1 yards before contact per rush. Texas is really good, too. Um, Texas was at 2.4, but let's you know that they, they get a push. Will they get anything similar to that against Texas? I don't think they will. Um, just letting you know that that offensive line, not not totally a finesse offensive line. Uh, they like to get in there and run the rock, and you saw that versus teams like USC uh, and versus Oregon late in the year. Well, to your point all the time, they'll they'll break tendency. Uh, they've done it a lot this year. When you think they're going to do one thing, they go a different direction. That's good coaching. All right, we'll come back. When we do, uh, Pete Wachowski, speaking of him, who was at Washington and now one of his uh, former coaches, the D.C. at uh, Washington, they'll be taking the podium there and the stage in New Orleans. We'll be talking to the D.C.s. We'll keep an eye on the wire on that. If anything of note comes from the uh, defensive conversations today, hear from the offense tomorrow ahead of the Sugar Bowl on Monday. We'll also come back and uh, for the top of the hour, a little who said that, Rod? Who, who said, said it that? from the long weekend? It took him up. With Ian Rodby. Sunny days are ahead in Iowa. Aaron Hogan, Rod Babers, 
Hook Em Up. 1019 AM 1260. The Horn. All right. This texter on our text line says, I love San Diego. Fortunate to be stationed at Pendleton for a long time. Ooh, love me. Yeah. You're talking about the oh, Rod's man. trips to the Holiday Bowl. That's a great city. It, it is really a good city. Is. It's expensive. I was going to say, if I can afford to live there, I would. But it's expensive. Well, you Austin, know what? Austin's not cheap. Anymore. I was going to say, yeah, it used to be way more expensive than Austin, but I was like, I don't know if it's that much more expensive than Austin anymore. Maybe I should think about moving, but I love Austin now too much. No Austin question. doesn't have the ocean now. Doesn't, doesn't have, have the, the Pacific ocean. ocean. Does not have the ocean. Location, so location, location, Amen location, weather. Brother. Yeah. Weather's pretty good, but mm-hmm. you do have to live in California. So, you know. That's true. <laughs> That's a great point. You got to deal with California politics. It's yeah. like, you know what? I'm good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Texas politics, politics I know, but still. And taxes, by the way. Uh, so that's out there this morning. We go, uh, who said that before the top of the hour? Who said that? Uh, but coming off the rant, Kay, t- uh, Ty, I just sent you a great uh, piece of audio from Kalen DeBoer's press conference. We heard some of this earlier, but can I play this for you? He was asked about the Texas defensive line, and we talk about he who gets pressure in this game and impacts you know negative mm-hmm. plays, sacks, uh, forcing Quinn Ewers and our Michael Penix off their spot, uh, hold the ball a half a second longer behind it. Uh, here was Kalen DeBoer yesterday in New Orleans when asked about the Texas defensive front anchored by uh, Devondre Sweat, obviously Byron Murphy right there with him, and that uh, rotation of linemen, bigger and more physical than I think Washington has seen so far this year. But here's Kalen DeBoer's take on what they're dealing with Monday night. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, it's pretty evident, uh, you know, what they are up front. And, um, you know, just uh, guys that uh, stuff the run and, um, you know, I think just as a unit, get after your quarterback and get a push at the line of scrimmage, um, getting the – quarterback's face and we know that that would be a great challenge for offensive line uh coach huff's done a great job with our guys and you know all season long and looking forward to that challenge uh we know it'll be a great one but um you know that's certainly a big piece of uh their defense is uh what happens up front uh, not just at the line of scrimmage but all with, also with the second level at the linebacker level all right there's uh caitlin yeah. devore the front seven Texas. their strength without a doubt yeah, they'll be ready. I think I think Washington will have a plan. I don't know if the plan will work, right? Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Uh, but they will have uh, plan A, plan B, plan C for neutralizing Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy. I think they'll, they, they naturally move the pocket anyway. They love moving the pocket. They move the pocket probably a quarter of the time anyway. So you'll see them move the pocket even more. They did that against Oregon State, against Arizona State, when they were really effective with interior pressure. Texas will be more effective than those schools with interior pressure, and maybe even organically. They brought it from the second level, though. They blitzed and brought second-level pressures in the interior. Still worked really well to get Michael Penix off his spot and force him on the move so that he throws in a much more of that erratic uh, fashion, get him, get him out of his comfort zone. So I think Texas – you know, they're going to stick with that game plan. I think they'll try to get some interior pressure. I mean, if you watched any film on him, that's where he – if every quarterback, I think. But that's where he has struggled this season, uh, specifically, is when teams can get pressure up the gut. So, I think Texas will go that route. And if they do, expect the DBs to play some outside leverage. The reason, if you're going to get interior pressure, it's going to force the quarterback out – of the pocket. He's going to be rolling to his left or his right, but he's a left-handed quarterback, rolling to his left or his right, and he's going to be looking for those outside throws Yeah, because he's rolling on the run. If you force him to throw inside across his body, those throws are not going to be accurate, Okay, no matter how strong his arm is. But you, if you let him throw outside while on the move, those throws are going to be accurate because he can throw on the move he's outside. Really, he's got a cannon. Yeah, really good thrower of the football. So those are like little details that Texas is going to have to be you well, know, mindful of. As we heard Kalen DeBoer say earlier, as the year's gone on, we've seen Quinn Ewers get more and more comfortable. And if Quinn, as you've said, if, if that first option is there, there's not as you know, Quinn Ewers is going to put it on the money. Every time. He's going to make that throw. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, that's what Washington's job is going to be, to get him off to his second and third progression. Mm-hmm. Uh, that That's the challenge for both sides. Yep. Uh, this says, guys, um, uh, we do bullish or BS, but this says, I used to put butter – on my hot pop tart, but uh, oh wow! See, I'm t- what flavor are we talking about here? When you put butter on the hot pop tart, what flavor? That's that's key. That's key, right? Because I, it's one of those things I can't really have an opinion on because I haven't tried it. I don't know that I would want to, but I can't butter. say it'd be terrible. Butter, butter on most things is good. That is true. <laughs> but butter on a pop tart. I've never heard of it. You know what? I'll allow it. Never you- heard of it. Uh, it can't. Like you said, what's the worst could happen? Butter on a pop tart. 
What's the worst going to happen? <laughs> right. What's the worst thing going to happen? It's like putting gravy on something. What's yeah, the worst yeah, thing going to happen? It's like adding bacon to it. It's like, all right, well, I, don't, I wouldn't okay. usually add bacon to that, but you're not going to mess it up adding bacon no, to it. No. So Might not be my go. favorite thing, but I'll eat it. I'll uh, all I mean, right. What age did you start? All right, that's the question I have. Though. What age did you start adding butter to your Pop-Tart? Because that's a pretty mature thing to do, but it sounds like you did it as a youngster because nobody starts eating Pop-Tarts at, when they're older. That's a young Thing in hey, life, right? nothing. Thing. I've talked about this before. It's been a while, but nothing beats a, just a flour tortilla with some butter on it in the microwave. Now, or maybe, I don't disagree with that. And if you're a little, if you're feeling a little dessert version of that, you can put a little sugar in there too. My wife does that's that. It. Yeah, that's a that's a poor man's dessert. Right I here. grew I like up that. on that. That's yeah. good. Just see if it's a fresh tortilla and a oh, little butter. Oh man. Oh, that's yeah. good. That's 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 under that's underappreciated. It'll melt in your mouth. It's oh, a fresh so good. Yeah, it's real good. I'm with you. Mm. How about this though? NBA player Michael Bridges oh, no. has revealed that he's eaten Chipotle every day for the last ten years. For the last ten years, <laughs> Chipotle. So he says. Does he have a Chipotle endorsement? I don't. Is he in, is he advertising for Chipotle? Chipotle sucks now. NBA, what, why has it changed? Why does it suck now? Has portions, it always sucked? Portions, was, prices. Uh, uh, it's, it's, that, I've been, it's a big social media craze right now where people are getting bowls and burritos and comparing them to like their hands. I don't know. It's, it's, just, it's not a good place right now. I haven't been in a while, but I used to get me a bowl every now and again. Oh, wow. I've never, no, they had, they, they had the big, uh, they had the big, you know, scare. And what was it? People got sick, right? They got, uh, it's Chipotle. What'd you expect? Well, no, it was a, <laughs> they took a big hit with, uh, what was it? They had, Salmonella, or Salmonella, yeah, or listeria, or something, but whatever. I can't even remember the name. Like, like I said, but yeah, he's apparently he, he's uh, every day for ten years he's eating Chipotle. So he would disagree with you, Ty. Uh, yeah, that's well. You know what? He's an elite athlete too, so that's surprising. And he's got money. <laughs> not he's doing it because he chooses. And he could eat at the arena. At yeah, the, uh, at, the they have, at the facility, they have they have chefs that are preparing meals at facilities, and he makes a lot of money. So he's choosing to eat Chipotle because that's, in his opinion. <laughs> That's the best he could get. So it's, that's what he wants. It's not as bad as Chad Ojasinko saying that he's eating McDonald's every day for his entire yeah, life. That's true. And my friend Gene Watson no. just texted, who's listening this morning, said, uh, spring training 2002, I ate P.F. Chang's every day for 40 days. All right, Mark Davis. <laughs> P.F. Chang's is healthier than Chipotle. I like some P.F. Chang's. Mark Davis is a billionaire. Or I don't know. Is he a billionaire? He's close. But he eats, at P.F. Chang. he eats at P.F. Chang's, I, I think, the I love me like some three P. or four Chang. times a week. man. I'm down with P.F. Chang's. P.F. Chang's is healthier than Chipotle. Chipotle is healthier than McDonald's. Thank you. Fast food every day is like smoking cigarettes every day. Though. You, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't be smoking well, cigarettes. P.F. Chang's a little is oh, off. Oh, it's like P.F. Chang's is healthy. That's, yeah, that's not off. That's not that's fast not, food. That's not fast food. And Chipotle is borderline. Now, right there on the cusp of being what they Because you can do P.F. Chang's somewhat healthy, right? If you yeah. Get, you no, get the P.F. brown Chang's. rice. And you can do a Chipotle healthy. Get a protein without all the, yeah. uh, the the sauces and put it in a bowl. You can yeah. actually do that pretty healthy. Get Chipotle, some lettuce up in there. Get some veggies up in there. Not a lot of healthy options at McDonald's. I know they got some salads and stuff, but come on now. Okay. It's, it's still Mickey D's. I'm with you. I'm with you. Now. Hey, all right. So uh, as we get rolling here, we got at week 16 in the NFL kicking off tonight with the Browns and the Jets. Uh, Jet, by the way, did you see that Aaron Rodgers, I think, is going to be on the roster, won't play, though? Like, this he's is like, stupid. And this is so dumb. This is so stupid. This is why the <laughs> Jets are the Jets. This is, a, this is, this is so why the Jets didn't pick up Joe Flacco, the quarterback makes, they're going to face tonight. Like, what, what, what is the purpose of putting Aaron Rodgers on this active roster? What, what's the purpose? Seriously. Making his ego feel good. It's all about them getting attention. They just want attention. He wants attention. The Jets want attention. And it's always the wrong kind of attention. But they don't care. As long as they're getting some attention. And it's, like I said, I'm, I can't really even pay attention to it because I don't understand what's the football reason for putting him on the roster. Is there a football reason They chose reason to for it? activate their quarterback uh, a few days before Christmas. What's the football reason? And Aaron Rodgers was clear to say on his visit on the Pat McAfee show that this was a team decision. What my decision? <laughs> so he's saying like I'm, I'm not the idiot who's doing this. This is the team doing it. Why are they doing it though? To sell tickets? They're not gonna let them Aaron play. Aaron Rodgers said I assumed I was going on IR. I asked to be put on IR, but there was a conversation. Do you want to practice? I said not at the expense of somebody getting cut. I know how this works. I didn't feel like I needed to practice to continue my rehab. I could do the on field stuff on the side. Obviously, I got overruled. It is what it is. This was an interesting situation. I guess it's, so that, somebody got cut for him. It's just a bad organizational like decision. I well, don't look, I mean, get it. and the irony of it is they're going to be playing Joe Flacco, who has been phenomenal for the Cleveland Browns. And guess what? They could have signed him. Yeah. When Aaron Rodgers got hurt four plays into the season, they could have signed him. And not chose not to. Just 
And what do you always say about Jerry Jones? Don't 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 live on faith, right? Don't live on mm-hmm. hope. That's so no, that's no way to don't, operate an organization. Don't, don't, yeah. don't operate any business on hope. Nope. Uh, they hoped that Zach Wilson had taken a turn, maybe through osmosis, had learned to play quarterback from Aaron Rodgers during training camp. Pretty much. And didn't have a plan B. Remember we talked about trading for Kirk Cousins before he got hurt. Uh, Joe Flacco was hanging out at his mom's couch. A lot of options out there. <laughs> yeah. Joe Flacco was on their roster last year. He won games with them. He, he was. I mean, he could have came in there and stepped in and probably been better than he is on the Browns now. And right. knew that's the personnel. The, that's the number one. I mean, he was on that team. So he knew the players. He probably – well, now it was a new offense with Nathaniel Hackett. So, yeah. But you know, still, he knew some of the people. He knew yeah, some of the – Yeah, he could have built something around him. Uh, and the Browns have done that, and that's why I think Kevin Stefanski is right now the leader in the clubhouse for head coach of the year. Man, that team's ten and five. The team's ten and five. They beat the Niners. They beat the. They're beating winning teams. You know what I think it is though? Why they want Aaron Rodgers on that roster? I can. I, I think Robert Sala wants some help in really being able to coach up and motivate the locker room. Okay. Because that locker room it seems to be motivated by him. It seems to be like everything, everything was Aaron Rodgers-centric. It was yes. all about Aaron Rodgers. And even when he went down, it was like, man, he could come back. He could come back early. And it's like, why don't y'all focus on the season and winning some games? What are y'all worried about what he's going to come back for? And That speaks to ownership, though. Yes, it he's does. A, he's a nut. Right. But it, it goes to kind of what you just brought up about operating on hope and faith, and that's kind of what they're doing. But I think Robert Sala, they want him there because Robert Sala doesn't completely have – um, a connection, a a deep the team connection likes Aaron. with the locker room. Yeah, and they, they exactly. Aaron Rodgers coming there next to coach. Hey, guy, hey, walk next to me when I come in here, man. They go, you know, they like you. It is one of those things they keep. <laughs> I just kind of keep him around. So coach somebody Sala. got cut for this. Yeah, I think they got cut to keep up appearances so that Robin Sala. I'm that guy. It, I'm pissed. It, it makes him. It makes it easier for him to motivate the team, and it makes it easier for the team to view him in a very kind of authoritative way. Um, because without that, I think guys are questioning the culture. They're questioning the, you know, the coaching. They're probably questioning the motivation, incentive, all that. When Aaron Rodgers comes there and just repeats whatever the company line is that Robert Sala is saying, yeah, well, coach said. And it's like, yeah, man, Ro- Aaron Rodgers said yeah. it. So I think, I think more of it's one of it's, – it's a weird, like, I think perception optics kind of thing. And well, not for the media, a little bit for them, but more for the team. Well, in the last three games and wins over Jacksonville, Chicago, and Houston, wins that have gotten the Browns to 10 wins. They're 10 and 5 on the year. When, it's amazing. When they're on their fourth quarterback. Yeah, amazing. It really uh, is. Amazing. Can I give you uh, the numbers for, for, for Joe Flacco? 26% of the roster uh, of their salary cap is on IR. Yeah. Twenty of their salary cap. <laughs> so this means that their best players are all hurt. Their best players are all hurt. Including Deshaun Watson, who may not be one of their best no. players. But in those three games, those three wins, he has thrown for – 1,053 yards mm. and six touchdowns. Wow. 368 yards, 374 yards, 311 yards. No, not six touchdowns. He's thrown 10 touchdowns. Yeah, he's hot. 1,000 yards and 10 touchdowns. Now, yep. tonight, the Jets, the strength of their team is not their owner. It is their defense <laughs> and their pass defense specifically. So, this will be a real test. But Amari Cooper, over 260 mm-hmm. yards against the Texans last week. That was a hell and of my a man, performance. Joe Flacco, made some high-level throws. Some really he – he still has the big arm. He still has got big arm. But now, you know, it's weird. He's, he's playing, I think, with, uh, without pressure. Even though they're in the playoff hunt and everything, there was not a lot of expectation. No. For him coming in, just like man, just do do whatever you can, Joe. Just do whatever you can to just keep this keep this thing from sinking. We're just trying to keep the ship from sinking and keep ourselves in playoff contention. And it turns out, like you said, he's thriving. He's playing he's great. Thriving. He's playing great. All right, we'll come back. That'll be tonight. Of course, the Texans, and the Texans and Cowboys with huge games on Sunday. Actually, Cowboys play Saturday night with the Detroit Lions in a massive game. Hard, hard to believe. The last time the Lions won a division championship, Rod, I was in college. Oh yeah. Their That's quarterback crazy. was a guy named Eric Kramer. Wow, I remember 1993, Rod. Right? I remember that 1993. Man. That's the last time they won a division. Well, they'll come into Dallas as division champions of the NFC North. We'll come back. We'll play some Who Said That, some audio from around the landscape, and uh, see if we can figure out who said it. We also have the fabulous fifth hour on tap. It's Hook'em Up with Ian Rod B.
It says, Flacco, is this your Shane Falco? <laughs> Shane Falco, we've had a lot of quarterbacks play. Uh, one person pointed out the person who got cut for Aaron Rodgers was a vested vet, so his contract was guaranteed. He's been since picked up on the practice squad. But remember, Aaron Rodgers was quick to say it wasn't my decision. It was our organization. Don't blame me. Don't blame uh, me. Rod, what do you have for me and who said that? It's been a week or so since we've played some who said that and uh, a little audio that we have uh, – Neither of us have heard. And Ty, I, sent to you, who it is. I sent you a piece of audio. We can uh, dial that up and we play. Who said that? Yeah, because we're in the NFL. We play ball, you know, not to take away from that team, but you can't just discredit us. We grown men. We got to feed our family. And he can have his opinion, but just don't be just, just talking like that. You know, that's disrespectful. That's very disrespectful. But no... Not to take away from the 49ers at all, because like they're great all across the board. But we gonna come to play as well. You know, our record not no fluke. You know, um, we play ball and we showed that. You know, but he just need to just keep doing his job. But just don't just come come off like that towards us. You know, that's disrespectful. Like I said, because he ain't putting the pads on. You know, if he ain't putting the pads on, I feel like it would have been different for him. He wouldn't say that. He'd be respectful. You know, but cause, because because. I say that to say this, you know, we respectful to our opponents. Our opponents were respectful to us. But a guy who who not even playing against us just come out just, you know, just being disrespectful. I guess he wanted more views on his, on his little channel. We're going to leave it at that. There's <laughs> Lamar Jackson. Uh, getting petty. Hey, man, petty. We talked about how sports is getting more and more petty. He was petty on that one. Mike, I think he was – I think he was intentionally mispronouncing his name too at first. I think he knows who Mike Florio is. Yeah, well, uh, he they, he of course Florio went on his show and said there's the, the there's Niners, no way the Ravens that, have no yeah. chance to win the game. Which, it's going to be a, a boat race essentially. Yeah. Now sure. look, I went in that game thinking the Niners would win it. I think we all did. <laughs> uh, I, I think was we surprised. All did. Yeah. I was surprised, and obviously four picks later, it's amazing in that game when you look at the stats. I mean, you know, Christian McCaffrey had a big game. Ayuk had a big game. Kittle had a big game. Just the turnovers, and you give the Ravens credit. They forced the turnovers, and it obviously was the difference in the ball ballgame. Uh, it's not like they stopped the Niners' offense. They just forced turnovers and yep. created points off of it. Uh, mm-hmm. Pretty impressive. And, by the way, you've talked about the Ravens' defensive coordinator. Mike McDonald. He's legit, man. That was a great game plan. I mean, that was high-level stuff with Kyle Shanahan versus Brock Purdy. You know, Obviously, Mike, McD- Mike McDonald won. He did, and he, he matched wits, and I would say outwitted Chano, which is tough to do. Yeah, he really was. I mean, he's and he's done that with. Listen, remember they beat the Lions thirty-eight to six. Ben Johnson is supposed to be yes, the, the one of the best offensive minds in the game. He held them to six points. Held the 49ers to nineteen. Held the Texans to nine at the yeah. start of the year, and we now know the Texans are a pretty good offense. Exactly. So this is why the Ravens have now. Get what they play this weekend? Dolphins. Oh yeah, Dolphins. Yeah. He'll get another one. Of the, Shan- the Shanahan clan. Tua currently leads the NFL in. Uh, Mm-hmm. In you know passing yards. Yep. All right. Yeah, that's a prolific offense too. All right, I have this for you, Rod. This is uh, you know, I, I don't think you'll know this, but maybe you've seen it or heard it. But uh, here it is. This happened yesterday. A uh, a player coming home. Obviously, the the way the season's going for me, you know, emotionally kind of all over the place. You know, uh, like I said, it's always great to come home. You know, and, and for me, you know, as a player, you know, I think it, all players want to be wanted. You know, um, and so, you know, for for the Texans to, you know, to, to claim me, you know, it's a it's a, a full circle moment. You know, um, I mean, like I said, it's, it's it's always great to come home and play. Is it strange to be um, playing for someone you used to play with? Uh, I, I wouldn't say strange. You know, uh, it's it's kind of funny. Uh, I don't think any of the guys in here realize I played with him. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna keep that a secret. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll be, you know, kind of telling my age, but. Uh, I mean, it's not strange, you know, um, to see him in that position, you know, um, is, is uh, I mean, like I said, it's a, it's a full circle moment, you know, because uh, playing with him, I knew what type of leader he was. And, and to see him lead, you know, a team as a head coach now, you know, um, it, it's great. You love the game. All right, there you go. That's uh, who said that, Rod? Oh, Texans. That's good. I actually can't figure out who that is. Kareem Jackson. Kareem Jackson back, huh? Cornerback slash safety, DB. Yeah, of course, released by the Broncos. Okay, he had yeah. the suspension for the, uh, the the you know, targeting hits. Oh, yeah, he's a good player for him, too. And he's from Westside High School in Houston. Oh, I didn't realize he was from H-Town. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, so, and then went to Alabama. Oh, actually, he went. No, I, I'm wrong. He went. He's from Macon, Georgia. I thought he was Westside Houston. I was looking uh, okay. said him came home. But he was drafted by. He's out of Alabama, and so yeah, he, he and D'Amico Ryan's played in college and high school. And Dang, uh, that Alabama connection. Yeah, he likes some Alabama guys. Don't he? And he played nine <laughs> years in Houston from 2010 to 2018. Yep. And then Broncos the last you know three or four. And uh, now he's based 35 years old. Texans are looking for help in their secondary. We just talked about Joe Flacco mm-hmm. shredded yes. <laughs> the Texans last. I mean, own him. I mean, that's, you know, you're a prideful cornerback, Rod, to have a, a one dude, Amari Cooper, have 265 yards. You know, I, I mean. One guy. One guy Come had on, 265 to 365. Come on, coach. I mean, that that's that's on D'Amico more than the, the players, in my opinion. Yeah. You, you got you to be able to put a strategy together to at least take him out and force somebody else to beat you. If he gets 100-something, that's okay. But 200-something yards receiving? Setting records. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. There's no there's no excuse for that. And I love me some D'Amico. Um, all right. Uh, I sent you another, a couple other clips, Ty. You can dial up either one and we can play. Who said that? Were you supposed to be a captain? Because the team announces the three game captains, and you were the fourth, and you called the toss. What happened there? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's only suiting. You know, I don't think Coach knew I was from Charlotte. You know, so. So you just did that on your own. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, it was like a, you know, the guys backed me up. You know, so they, they knew I was from here. Did you realize you almost made a big mistake on the call, though? What I do? Well, you said we want to go on defense. Yeah. Which in theory could they could have said, then you're electing to kick to to uh, kick off, but you would have lost the opportunity then yeah. to receive in the second half. Yeah, no, I told them that uh, I said uh, I want I want our defense to be out there, and they all looked at me like I was crazy. I'm like, I mean, it's pretty simple what I said. Like I want the defense to be out there. They like you mean defer? I'm like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Did he, did he say that to you? Yeah, he did. The mic, the mic was on. Like, oh, what? Yeah, he, he heard you. Hear oh, really? No, nah, he was just like, defer. I was like, yeah. Everybody was like, yeah. Was like, everybody was laughing. I'm like, what are y'all laughing at? It's pretty <laughs> obvious what I'm asking for. So did anyone say anything to you when you got back to the no. sideline? <laughs> Why would they? <laughs> Uh, that's somebody for West Virginia, right? No, that is from the Green Bay Packers cornerback Jair Alexander. The Panth against the Panthers, he went out there uh, it, basically impromptu. He just did it on his own. He's from Charlotte. He's from Charlotte, and he wanted to be out there for the coin toss. He got people in the stands, so coach did not designate him to be a team captain, and yet he bum rushed the coin toss, and not only bum rusted, they just go out there to represent. He called it. He's like, I uh, want my defense out there. He's like, bro, if you're going to bum rush the coin toss when coach not designated you as a captain, shut up. Just go out there quietly and don't say anything. He went out there and took over the damn coin toss. Isn't that wild? He's, all, he's also been um, – He's been suspended <laughs> for one game for conduct detrimental to the team for crashing the coin toss. Never happened in the history of the NFL. That is amazing. I'm just looking at this story. The they, they, they suspended him. <laughs> He's great. Because he almost screwed up the thing. And that's he why did. the defense out there, man. He was like, what are you talking about? You did defer or are you taking the ball? Defense out there. <laughs> what? <laughs> what are we talking about? What is this Charlie Strong era stuff? Oh. Remember when Charlie Strong's team screwed up the coin toss? I do remember that. <laughs> was that UCLA? Yeah, it yeah, was. Up in, in Jerry, Jerry World. World. Yeah. Oh, man. Isn't that great, though? That he just went out there on his own. He was like, My they... players, have, my teammates have my back. <laughs> they have my back. I was like, What? You know what? You know who I'm really mad at? My captains. You're the leaders of this damn team. I chose you as captain. You're going to let this dude just go out there and just hijack the coin toss? No. Somebody needs to check him. Nobody checked him. Well, Brian Gutekunst, who uh, happens to oh, be uh, one of Aaron Rodgers' favorite people, That's says, as an organization, we have an expectation <laughs> that everyone puts the team first. While we are disappointed, we had a good conversation with Jair this morning, fully expecting to learn from this as oh, we move man. forward together. I love that dude. That was great. I said defense out there. That looked to me crazy. <laughs> defense out there, You know man. what's so funny about that is that, you know, sometimes the media, we get it wrong. But the media had it right, and he's like, what I do wrong? what I do wrong? Well, well, then why are the other captains laughing? <laughs> and why didn't one of the other captains step in and say, yo, bro? I, that's what I can't. Come I on, think, you come with us, but you can't say anything. I can't believe the other captains just let it go down and let him take over the coin toss. Let him direct it. That was wild. That is crazy. I've never heard that before. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. He bum rushed the just, coin toss. He just took it over, just and then it. screwed it up. And then all, yeah, Xavier messed it up for his team. <laughs> we want the defense. I love out him there. just playing ignorant with the media, like because they knew who the three captains were designated. 
And they said, well, you weren't on, on there. He's like, well, my, my team, my teammates got my back. I'm from Charlotte. I'm man. from Charlotte. I'm from Charlotte. Co- hey, you know what he said? I don't think Coach know I'm from Charlotte. <laughs> like, I mean, if Coach knew I was from Charlotte, Coach definitely would have made me a captain. So he put it on Coach a little bit, too. Like, hey, Coach, that was very inconsiderate of you. you think about going to, to the coach, uh, Matt LaFleur, and saying, hey, Coach, you know I'm from Charlotte. I'd love to be out there. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, hey, we same. roll on. Is the uh, fa- it's so good to be back and talking That's sports great. with Rod B. And you people, <laughs> let's take some uh, fabulous fifth hour text. Who knows what happens in the fifth hour? It will be a lot of Texas Washington talk. We know that Sugar Bowl is four days and change away. And we're also talking Cowboys, Lions, Texans, Titans, yes, sir. and tonight's game, Jets, Browns on uh, Thursday night football. Plus four bowl games today. One is getting underway in about three minutes. Let's talk about with Ian Rod B. Aaron Hogan, Rod Babers, Hook Em Up, 1019 AM 1260, The Horn. Uh, uh, Jair Alexander on the way to the break, that makes me laugh. At least he's honest about it. Because I'm, oh. I'm just not buying this Aaron Rodgers nonsense that he, this is an organizational decision that tonight he'll be active. Oh, you not, think Aaron Rodgers is in sure on this? he was part of it. Okay. He, and then he goes on McAfee on Tuesday and says that, uh, well, no, I, I said I don't I, I thought I was going to IR. But I don't know. Uh, not, but see, my thing is, him saying that makes the organization look even worse. You're right. I mean, it's just. I, like, why would he, he even saying that? Why would you go on and say that, Aaron? Why not just hey, say, hey, man, it's a decision that uh, that uh, organization and I have come <clears> to <throat> that I'll be act, on the active roster. So, Why throw them under the bus it, and be like, I thought I was going to be on IR. They, they decided different. Well, that's what he's trying to have it both ways. I'm sure Robert Sala is not going to come back out and say, no, we didn't. Aaron Rodgers came to us and said, well, you put me on the active roster. No, they won't do that. They won't do that. No. Because they want to keep him next year. Yeah, exactly. And I think, honestly, the fact that they – if they keep him next year, and we and we, we all said this before the season, they need to have an, a contingency plan behind him, ready to roll out in case he gets hurt whenever that may happen in the season. So they need to have backup quarterback, a competent backup quarterback ready to go, and then a competent third-string quarterback after him ready to roll. And I mean veterans, like a Joe Flacco. They could have had Joe Flacco as a third-string quarterback. Joe Flacco wouldn't care. He'd be like, oh, I'm cool with that. He ended up being the fourth starting quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. So I just if they're going to have him be the starting quarterback going forward next season, they better prepare for the worst. Yeah. They, just in they case better. it happens. 
but yeah, it's in a matchup for tonight with a team in Cleveland that's uh, absolutely persevered through injuries this year. They're their starting quarterback, their best running back, Nick Chubb, member of that horse, horrible injury. And uh, tonight, three fourths, three fifths of their offensive line that, that uh, is supposed to be pretty darn good is hurt. Yep. Uh, but the Browns are still finding ways to win. They're a double digit win team tonight. If they win tonight, they'll be 11 and 5. And, I, you know, watching that Browns team, and I watched them in Houston the week before as well, they're a team no one wants to play in the AFC playoffs. No. And I'll tell you who doesn't want to play them in the playoffs is Kansas City. No, Kansas City. Oof, that, the, the issues, it, they become more and more glaring. It gets uh, the worse and worse. into the season, man. They do. It they, feels like, yeah. to me, Rod, and, and, you know, and Ty will jump on and say it's Taylor Swift doing the Yoko Ono thing. <laughs> I, you know, I think the the, the – the evidence of their offensive ineptitude, especially on the outside, has been in full display before Taylor Swift came on the scene. Oh, it goes all yeah. the way back to Week One, no doubt. And this, this blaming is, Taylor Swift for that. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, <laughs> but it's been all year, and the fact that it's not getting better. Uh, Andy Reid has to be exacerbated, but at the same time, it's got to go to Eric Bieniemy at some level that they miss Eric Bieniemy and the thumb he kept go. on that offense because it's just not getting better. And gosh, against the Raiders, but Patrick Mahomes was horrible against the Raiders. He was bad. He was flat, but we have not seen Patrick Mahomes look that bad in a football game. No. Uh, where he was throwing pick sixes and just making bad decisions. And he, it's almost like he's lost hope. Well, I think he doesn't trust his wide receivers. Uh, yeah, that's right. It, it's and, and, really tough for a quarterback to operate the offense when you don't trust that your wide receivers will be there, number one. But if they are there, they'll catch the football. Yeah. I feel like on every play, he's like yelling at somebody. Yeah. While pointing, hey, you know, you were supposed to be here. And this has been all year. This is this, this Christmas week. Uh, yeah. I wonder it's, what the distraction could be. Well, but well, they were but they were bad before yeah. this all. I mean, go back to week one. Week one, they were terrible. They well, were according to you, that. this has been going on behind the scenes for a while, though. Well, no, the Taylor Swift thing happened right in the middle of the year. Um, you know, when she started showing up to games, but uh, that's that would only be that would be the, the, the distraction would have yep. begun. Um, now you call her a jinx if you want, but I don't. I, this offense it, it misses Eric Bieniemy badly, it miss, and it misses having more. I think more capable wide receivers too. Well, because now people are making – they're saying, well, you know, what did I see? A, a tweet or somebody saying or a story written that, you know, Patrick Mahomes without Tyreek Hill is Bill Belichick without Tom Brady. Well, they won a Super Bowl without yeah, Tyreek Hill. Yeah, I don't Hill. think that's fair. They won a Super Bowl without Tyreek Hill. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's uh, fair. And that, they, but Eric Bieniemy was still in charge of the offense mm -hmm. with the title, and it's pretty clear he ran a pretty tight ship with that team. And – uh, well, we you saw Travis Kelsey slamming his helmet the other day, and Andy yeah. Reid, you know, getting up in his face a little bit, mm -hmm. telling him to calm down, not letting him go back in the game. It feels like that 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 offsides penalty that they called on Kadarius Tony when he caught the touchdown that would have beaten Buffalo, that may have been the tipping point, Rod, for the Chiefs. That it was just since then, it's just been yeah, it's been all downhill, man. Like they, they were they they tried to to keep it under wraps and say the right thing and do the right thing about. You know, the receivers and Patrick Mahomes protecting them. And he will just keep working. feels like from that point on, it's just been really – that that was it. it was Even like, the defense has kind of dropped off. Well, you know, they, the they started the year. Great against we, the we, we kind of said they were, you know, one of the probably top five defenses with Chris Jones. And, you know, him missing that first game, it was evident that he was he was needed there on the defensive line. But I, I don't know. I just I haven't felt the same way in the Agent, past well, probably they, five they, weeks. They, 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 they lost twenty to fourteen. Aiden O'Connell, the, the quarterback for the Raiders, threw for sixty-two yards. That's my thing. Was if you hold an NFL team to twenty points and you're the Kansas City Chiefs, you have the best quarterback and the best arguably play caller and play designer in the game. But they held the Raiders I'm, to two hundred yards so, total. Well, so Aiden O'Connell didn't I, throw a complete a pass after the first quarter. I know. So how's the defense? My thing was that's not on the defense. Defense did their job. They did. It's the offense that not scoring enough points. I mean, yeah, ball control I mean, and they got they got run on. Zamir White. He. I mean, I think he, the the Raiders can say goodbye to Josh Jacobs and feel comfortable with him. Going as the number one back next year. Well, they scored two defensive touchdowns. That's true. Yeah. That's true. I mean, I mean. It, it, by the way, that's your guy, Jack Jones. Is that your guy that you got in a fight for the Westlake <laughs> team? The, that's I'd, that's I'd, the dude. I'd, yeah, right. Yeah, that's him. I wouldn't call him my guy, but I the yeah. unstable one. Well, I was thinking of you because you told us in high school he got in a fight with the at a seven on seven tournament, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Now, and did you see what he did on Christmas Day? The, Jack Jones. The Grinch thing. He said he said Jack that. Jack Jones. So no, what, on he, Christmas Day he gets a pick six of Patrick Mahomes. Mm -hmm. Gets in the end zone, walks, runs over to the side in Arrowhead Stadium, holds the football out for a kid like he's going to give it to him, and then the kid reaches out to take it, snatches it back. He, <laughs> said, he said he went on Twitter after and said, rewatch the video. There, he said there was an, an adult man trying to take the ball, so he was pulling away oh, from him. He said, watch the tape. Viral. But so I, did I he know. give it to the kid? I didn't see that it happen either. So I, <laughs> I don't know who to believe. Wow, 
that dude. Yeah. <laughs> he man. went. He did the whoop. He can't win for losing, I guess. If he did, if that was the right thing to do, then it looks really bad. <laughs> Let me also say, while we're criticizing the Chiefs and how dysfunctional they've been all year, let's give some credit to Antonio Pierce. That's a huge win. That's a huge oh, win. Oh, that's a big one. I mean, honestly – I wonder if he'll get a get a shot at the coaching job. I mean, I don't know. last time they had an interim coach there, they made the playoffs. Well, think about it. Because of the inter- interim coach. Well, think about it. If you didn't see this game, they had a direct snap to Isaiah Pacheco that he fumbled that got recovered for a mm-hmm. touchdown. Patrick Mahomes threw a pick six interception. Yeah. The, again, the Chiefs, the Raiders quarterback threw for 62 yards, and they beat the Chiefs in Arrowhead Stadium. In Arrowhead. That's how not, not only was the offense dysfunctional, it was giving points to the other team. You're right. In a 20-14 to 14 loss, uh, that's a problem, and Andy Reid's got to address it. I mean, they do not look like a team that is, is any threat of a Super Bowl right now. Uh, they were to try to hold it. If they had anybody in their division that was pressing them, they may not win the division for the first time in forever, uh, but they're still atop that division. Seeing them go on the road to infer- and play their first playoff game, it's oh. going to be really interesting. Yeah. I mean, Pat Mahomes never had to go that route to get no. to a Super Bowl. Well, that's why I say if they had to play the Browns in the playoffs, they wouldn't want any part of that. Mm-hmm. Browns' defense is too damn good for them. Yes. Browns' defense is yeah. legit. Yeah, I would take the, the Browns the... outright over, over Kansas City. I would, right too. I would, too. Ooh. Uh, yeah, it's hard not to right now. That's crazy to think. Really? Yeah. Oh, I told you all before I, the year started, I was I was bullish on the Browns. You like the Browns. Yeah, I, Even without, I, like the I think Chiefs. they're better without Deshaun Watson right, right now. I think Joe Flacco is playing at a higher level than we, anything well, we saw. And the team, and the team actually, Watson. team loves him. Team loves Joe Flacco. Yeah. I mean, he's come in and just been like a dude. And, it's uh, an awkward situation, man. When when basically the, 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 the team and the fans want Joe Flacco back as a backup. <laughs> To, to Deshaun Watson next season because he's done so well. And then Deshaun Watson, who is the c- quarterback making all the guaranteed money, <clears throat> is not a fan favorite and is not as liked in the locker room as Joe Flacco, the guy who won games for him and went to a uh, – made a, basically went to a, a playoffs for him or led them to the playoffs, I should say. That's well, it's, be- it's hard to be a fan of somebody when they're, they're – you're sp- spending a lot of money. They aren't playing well, and they just happen to be a sexual predator on the side. Yeah, uh, he, yeah he's in your locker room, and you got to pretend you like you don't think he's a creep. You know yeah, I mean? no, it's a, like I said, he's <laughs> he's a villain for the first time in his life, and he's uncomfortable with that. It's like just it. It, it's going to get real awkward in that locker room with Deshaun because they're tied to Deshaun Watson forever, but yet Joe Flacco is leading them to wins and to the playoffs. I don't know how you don't bring Joe Flacco back in some kind of role next season. Now, right now, if the playoffs began today, the Bills would go to the Chiefs. Okay. But because they'd be a division winner. Yeah. Now, but the the when they would go on the road would be the second round if they're able to even get yeah. through the Bills because the Bills beat them in that game we're talking about. It was kind of like the tipping point of their season. Yeah, you don't want to play the Bills right now. And who knows? I mean, right now, I I was reading some of the Houston stuff that if the Texans beat the Titans and beat uh, Indianapolis at the end of the year, they're in. Hmm. They're going to win the division. Okay. Uh, but, you know, they got to win those games, and they're, they are going to get C.J. Stroud back. So there's still a lot to play out, and Baltimore and Miami play a huge game this weekend <laughs> uh, in Week 16. Right. How about Baltimore coming off San Francisco? Now they get Miami in a critical game Sunday night. So looking forward to an NFL weekend that does start tonight. We're also looking forward to the Sugar Bowl. And for bowl, there's a bowl game that's underway as of right now, the Wasabi Fenway Bowl. Gotta love a bowl wasabi. game at 10 in the morning. <laughs> It's just, it's just like wasabi, like the stuff you eat with like Japanese food. Yeah, or yeah, is that a yeah. brand? I thought it was an actual food. I didn't, it, know, I, didn't know, I didn't know it was like a brand. What is I don't it? think it is a brand. Maybe it's like the wasabi covered peas. You ever had those? Oh, those so it's, okay. But it is that stuff that we're thinking about, right? It's wasabi. Yeah. That, okay. Oh, uh, wasabi is also a restaurant now. Oh. And they have their own brand of like. Uh, frozen like, foods you can buy. Oh, uh, so they, okay. See what they just got me. They got me to look it up. That's what they want. It, their, exactly, they want to... <laughs> it works. It's work, it works with you, E. That's exactly what they want. Hey, man, let's see how many of our impressions go up. Yeah, because wasabi is a Japanese horseradish. Yeah, so I was thinking, like, yeah, you get it like. from the plant, yeah. but, you, but, you, but they've made it into a brand. I what, when I was growing up, um, and it, so, you know, I was grounded a lot of, I've told a lot of the stories, grounded for stupid stuff. and Rightfully we, so. We'd go out to dinner, <laughs> and uh, the same thing with, like, a Mexican restaurant, but we, my dad's a big fan of Asian food, and say, you know, if I was grounded for the weekend or whatever, it's Friday night, we'd go to dinner, he would say, hey, if you eat this giant glob of wasabi, you can be oh. ungrounded. Oh. Same thing, I like a Mexican a Lupe tortilla, you know, the big pepper they give you that's hot with your pretty like your fajitas or whatever. He's like, you eat that whole, you can be ungrounded. Yeah. Well, look, uh, <laughs> wasabi, that's so crazy. You'll be ungrounded. Your dad, like, bribing you. Wow. <laughs> 
<laughs> needed some entertainment, oh, I guess. I I'm, I'm probably going to do the same thing with my kids. wanted to see you laugh. That's well, it was like a challenge. You know, you know I love a challenge. A good challenge. Yeah, but I, okay, I had a different parenting idea. You can't buy your way out of grounding. Well, this is a, serve this your time. This Don't do the crime be, if you can't serve, you know. This would be time, like you know if I was grounded for like two weeks and I'd already been grounded for like a week and a half. You know, like. Okay, now he gets you. Buck, get out buck, on buck. good behavior. Probably plus. because he wanted you out of the house and he knew you would do it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> He do how to hustle you. Yeah. Yeah, you're tired of this kid hanging out the house. Let's get him out of here. Uh, this says scrub-ass wide receivers. Rod's been saying it all year. No, that's true. But, look, I, there's no doubt. But they, they, they had scrub wide receivers last year for the most part. They did, but the NFL usually takes a while to adjust to your game plan. That's the that's first right. year they didn't have wide receivers, and, and teams still did not, for some reason, focus on Travis Kelsey. I don't know why. They were still, like, allowing Travis Kelsey to get either man coverage or they would just bracket him every now and then. Now they're triple teaming this dude, and they're just saying there's no receiver that you have that can beat man coverage. You don't yeah, have one. And they're just doubling Travis Kelsey. They're just doubling, triple teaming him every play. Every important play, for <laughs> sure. And yeah. they're just, But it's just the mistakes. and the, I mean, it's just a fumbling, bumbling mess. And again, that I don't want. I can't say we, no one can prove that it's Matt Nagy versus Eric Bieniemy because yeah. Andy Reid's still there. Yeah, but, but you know, coaching we, matters. Coaching we underestimated matters. the impact of Eric Bieniemy. It's yeah, fair co- to say we all matters. did. Right? Coaching matters. And by the way, who, you know who kept telling us that Andy Reid. Yeah, Andy Reid kept saying he's like, no man, this guy is a big important piece. He was trying piece, to get him hired. Office. He was trying. He kept saying, no man, this guy does a lot of work. He is a really important uh, component to what we do, and nobody really listened to him. And turns out. Might have been right about it's that. It's all showing up. Yeah. Because, I mean, all the stuff comes goes to practice and practice habits and mm-hmm. how buttoned up are you as an offense, and they're not. They're they're the opposite. And, you know, two two defensive touchdowns allowed uh, on your own mistakes. One of them, a Patrick Mahomes bad decision. This says uh, – uh, <laughs> Nate says it's unfortunate Kelsey injured himself banging a skinny seven. So, what, you, know, oh, you like Ty. Six. Is that Ty? Is six. That, <laughs> celebrity that Ty? celebrity More than six. A seven. She's Aaron. better than a It's Yoko Aaron, Ono's come fault, on. CB said. I can think of 100 women off the top of my head that are more attractive than, than Taylor Swift. Well, yeah, but but there, are, there are billions in the world, so still, there's still... Yes, the, I was watching... Okay, but everyone acts like she is perfect, and she's no, far I from don't. perfect. But no. I don't think she's a six. She's really talented, and that that. And she's not this level. humanitarian, like, globalist person. You know, we need to talk about the private jet. She, she rides that thing around like it's riding a bike. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Well, she's, the she's a she chance. will be canceled by this time next year, guaranteed. Ty Henderson, guaranteed. Well, you make her seem like she's the devil. She's not the devil. She's, she's not the devil, person. but I just like she. She's in my face all the time. You know, eventually. She's in his face. I, I no, no. nobody likes that that much unless you're a true Swifty. I, I had a, this argument with my sister over Christmas. She said she told me to my face that Taylor Swift is hotter than any girl I've ever been with. And I, oh, that's now you're really mad. My girlfriend, now it's called family that. personal. Oh, I know now it's called family personal over some drinks. Oh my god, yeah, no, we got into a big argument about it, and she did not agree with me. It's safe to say. I like your sister now. That's funny. She poked the bear. That is she funny. poked the bear. That is great. <laughs> uh, I look. I mean, is she? I was watching what was on last time. Barbie, the Barbie movie. I mean, Margo, oh, yeah. like I mean, Margot Robbie that. is like super hot, right? Yeah, she is. Smart. And, uh, so I wouldn't put Taylor Swift in that category. No, but, different level. But Taylor Swift's a super talented person who is, you know. Yeah. Written a lot of hit songs. You know what I'm saying? That's exactly right. Good for her. That makes her, you're right. And talent yeah. makes you more attractive. That's Ask Jay-Z. That's, Jay-Z looks like Joe Camel, but he's more attractive. Because <laughs> he's talented. Because he's talented. And he's rich. He's a billionaire. She's rich, but she's a billionaire, and she's really talented. So she goes from being a six in your book. She should probably be close to being a seven and a half or an eight. There you go. This right. says, Ty, that is there. definitely a family counseling moment with the eat fire in your ungrounded conversation. <laughs> <I tell> you. <laughs> we worked through it. We're cool now. <laughs> Uh, oh, that's I, too I, much. I appreciate the uh, the tough parenting, man. The tough love. I, I do that, like I mean, here's a, brought up with. Again, I, my kids are old and raised, and I would, you know, I, I guess I could have understood one of my kids would have suggested it, but your dad was the one that came up with the idea. Dad came up with it, and I loved it. I, it would, like, like, whenever this I, came up, I'd be like, "Hell yeah, let's do it." I'm, I'm like one of my of kids said, "Dad, I'll I'll do X." Like because for me, they know about their dad. It would have been like go do some extra chores or. Yeah. Go yeah. mow the lawn or <laughs> clean the toilets for mom or whatever. Maybe, yeah. they, and if they had brought up the idea, I would have maybe considered it. You know, you know, one chore for for each day. I'm yeah. gonna remove from the grounding part. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> You'll get there, Rod. Uh, no, but, trust me. I but, can't But your wait. baby Monroe will be perfect. A lot so you of bargaining and negotiating. <laughs> I like that, man. No, I'm already did. My, my wife tells me that I'm too hard, like, coaching our baby already. So I got to, like, soften up a little bit. You're already coaching her. Yeah, I'm already coaching like her. four months. We need tummy months. time. And, I'm, you know, I'm trying to coach her up because, you know, turn the head. This one, She's like, I'm a, little, I'm a little too hard on her already. So I was like, all right, I got to learn. Hey, I, I do like this text. Uh, it's from an unnamed texture, though, that says Taylor Swift looks like a praying mantis. I, okay. I can see that. <laughs> Here, here's the thing I don't understand. I, a I, I sexy guess, praying I, I, mantis. Everybody's different. I just don't. I don't feel like Taylor Swift's doing anything to put herself in your face. The TV networks are putting her on television. Uh, she's just going to the game to aware, see her boyfriend. Aware? She doesn't have yeah, to. Sit you don't want her to not go to the game. You want to be a hermit? Oh my God. There's plenty of people that go to games and don't want to be seen, and they're not seen. I'll just say that. Well, if you don't okay. want to be seen, well, I, I you think, won't be. It's all part I, of the grand scheme. I would scheme. put that if you want. If I was going to be mad about That's the fair. number of times I see Taylor Swift, I would put that on the TV networks. They don't have to put her on television. They put her on because she's popular. You don't think they she, do. she, her, and uh, Brittany Mahomes plan their little choreographed dances and like all? They're like, oh my no. god, we're so sad. Or her no, I like don't saying, actually. I think F they're, that, I like, think they're girls who do that. But again, I, that's not you're seeing because the TV networks are choosing to put it on. Not Taylor Swift is asking them to do that. So yeah. you don't think she's a part of the? She's she's a cog in the machine. Well, she's just going to the games <laughs> with her BC, her boyfriend, uh, and root on her boyfriend. She's That's how I see it. Trying to support a man, to support a man. Like, huh? like Giselle Boonjian went to every game Tom Brady played. Did yeah, they did, show her all the time? Did she and go she to every stood, game that she was played? in a suite? They showed her a lot. Well, and, and, and they showed fine. her a lot. And I was fine. <laughs> I was fine like, with I'm, it. I'm fine looking at that beautiful people. It's yes. okay. And it, it, it's not like they didn't show Brittany Mahomes in, the, in her brother before oh, Taylor Swift not was there. even close to enough. This has been the best thing that's ever happened to Brittany Mahomes. And you know what? They, they what she you, she's on the same level as Taylor Swift. I will say that. But do you know why they're doing it? It was because it because people like you who get so mad about it. Yeah, they do. Oh, they're trying you, to piss me off. That's, that's what they're yes. trying to do. Yes, because there's a lot of people the, just like you that are yeah, like it's working. It's working. Mm -hmm. and, and you now you could turn the channel. It makes me. Yep. Yeah, I walk the last when we were watching the Chiefs Raiders game on Christmas Day. We were watching in my living room. Me and my sister had that conversation. We had to we had to leave in the next like twenty minutes. And what I saw her on the screen after a Travis Kelsey drop. I called that they were going to show her, and I flicked her off, pissed off my sister, and we left early because. And I, so yeah, we turned off the game because of her. Uh, yeah, but you know what? It's I know you don't probably do this, but a lot of people do. Hate watching is a thing. Like right? people hate watch and hate listen to all types of programs uh, around the country. Like half the audience is watching or listening to it because they like it, and the other half are watching, and listening to it because they hate it or don't like it. Um, so I think music's different, though. Do no, you I'm, have, not, do I'm you not talking. Never... I'm, talking I'm talking about people watching Swift. You're talking about people watching Taylor Swift and still watching, even though they're annoyed by it. People watch stuff they're annoyed by and listen to stuff they're annoyed by all the time. Sure. 100%. And, I, and my point is, that Taylor Swift, I'm, I'm talking, telling you the Taylor Swift phenomenon you're talking about, where people are now turning against her in the blowback, it probably is happening, but it won't deter people from watching. Yeah, I'm trying that, to watch, because yeah, I'm never not going to watch football, but I just want to yeah. watch football. I don't want to watch somebody in a box having fake reactions to their fake boyfriend. <laughs> I don't believe it's fake, but okay. Uh, all right, I, and it sounds like you still have residual uh, anger toward your sister, so That's for her comment. Well, she doesn't, know, she doesn't know any better. So I'll she give her a pass. Know any better. As a Swifty, how old is your sister again? She's twenty one. Yeah. Oh, she's yeah, I mean, I guess I'm knows. the I'm the observer who looks at it and says, you know who's more in my face than Taylor Swift is Travis Kelsey. He's the one that's everywhere. He's the one that every commercial I see and everything yeah. I Mr. You know, Pfizer? He, well, he's everywhere, <laughs> which is fine, but give Travis Kelsey credit. He's uh, late in his career. He's going to go to the Hall of Fame on a first ballot, and he he's uh, and he's marketing himself where he can cross over now. Yes, like he, he can. As soon as he retires, he can cross over and do what, reality for... TV or whatever he wants to do. People talk show hosts, talk show hosts. He can do all kind of stuff now, yeah. especially now with Taylor Swift. You know, if and that they, endorsement. Yeah, if they stay together. He'll he'll honestly do something really annoying. He'll probably end up you know acting. And being, like, you know, I mean, like or cameos, be like Michael movies. Strahan, right? I mean, Michael Strahan's <laughs> now on Good Morning America. He could, he, could, he could go that route. Yeah, I mean, a lot of guys. I don't, I don't know if he's if he's got the chops for that. Yeah, I see him more like he's, getting he, into cameos, doing he, acting. He's getting stuff. carried by his brother on their podcast that they have. Let's, let's, oh, we can all agree on that. I don't. I, I I think they're both pretty funny. Uh, they're brothers. You're just a big brother. fan of, of the Jason, Kelseys and the Swifts. Jason, Aaron. no, Jason. No, I'm just Jason's not. A, funny, I don't. Yeah. It doesn't bother me. Jason I, Kelsey's I just, funny. Yeah. I I, I in, yeah. take it in and you know 
turn it off, turn it on. It's fine. I, I I'm starting to think we are having me. this conversation just to piss me off every day. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, <laughs> I'm starting to believe. We were, we were actually talking about the Chiefs and their inept offense. We didn't say anything. You about brought any up, of it. You brought me into it for the tape. You said, I'm sure ties enough. So every time I'm out, they pull me. Back <laughs> <in>. <laughs> we were actually talking about the Chiefs, and it started with a conversation about the, they wouldn't want to play the Browns in the playoffs because the Browns are really good. Uh, that was the conversation, but uh, it's deteriorated to this, so yes, we apologize yes. for that. Uh, but props to your sister. <laughs> props to your sister. I like that that, that, that comment. Uh, all right. Uh, we'll get you where we're going to be in New Orleans coming up. We're excited about our uh, coverage coming to you live from New Orleans, Louisiana, coming up on Sunday and or Monday and Tuesday of next week, Rod. I will also tell you that our coverage is brought to you by friends at uh, Hayes City Store out there in Driftwood, like Texas, it. and Taste on Main in Buda. Got to get to taste, man. If you're looking for some great food and not having to fight with uh, downtown Austin and looking for a steak, some seafood, the raw while you love oysters, got to get into taste, Rod. Steakums. Got to do it, man. Love it. I was over there, and I, I couldn't even decide the, the appetizer that I wanted. Much less the pro, much less the steak or the. the sometimes fish. you get, to, sometimes you just get appetizers. Sometimes I skip a meal, I just get like five appetizers. And eat well, them now all. they throw this uh, chicken fried pork chop thing on the menu. I'm like, what? Chicken fried pork chop? That looks amazing. Uh, the ribeyes, the food is so good there. Uh, so you'll have a hard time with with every level of that menu. Uh, bring it back again and again because you want to try the new stuff. Uh, it is tremendous. So I uh, want to thank them. They're Taste on Main right there in downtown Buda, Texas. Charming downtown Buda, Texas is where you'll find them. Uh, don't have to fight with the parking and the hassles of downtown Austin to get a great uh, steak, great meal, especially if you live in South Austin like uh, Rod does and I do and Ty does. Uh, so get on down there. Taste on Main. They're going to help us get there. We'll tell you where we'll be, though, and when the coverage will be coming your way. Also, uh, Rod will take us behind the burnt orange curtain, Texas and uh, – Washington are in New Orleans. They're practicing now on site. Details coming from both head coaches. Also, Pete Kwiatkowski met with the media this morning. We'll get some details on what he may have said about this Longhorn defense and the challenge of facing Michael Penix and this Washington top-rated pass offense in the country. We'll have that coming back on Hook'em Up with Ian Rodby.
Aaron Hogan, Rod Babers, Hook Em Up, 1019 AM 1260, The Horn. One of our uh, texters, uh, uh, Rod, points out that, uh, do you remember how often they showed Jessica Simpson when Tony Romo was there? Oh, her? yes, we do remember this. Yeah. How did that work out? Yeah, but still, the... We certainly got sh- uh, exposed a lot on television. Celebrity quarterback. And, and it, ruined really their, it ruined Tony Romo's season. You say yeah. So? Well, I remember they, they did go to Mexico. Remember him and Jason Wade? They went to Mexico like before the playoffs or something. Well, yeah, they Jessica. had the week off. They had the week Jessica. off, then they lost. Yeah. That was a bad optics. That because, was bad luck. But, but Romo had a great season that year with Jessica Simpson. But then uh, I believe that started down at the – when they were had the training camp at Alamo Dome, and she was there. She showed up there way back in the training camp. If memory serves, I'm trying to you know, from a celebrity yeah. dating yeah, cause he profile. Did, Romo dated a couple of celebrities, right? Didn't he, he did. date another one? He dated another one, I thought. A, a young lady that was like a like a I don't know, she's a pop star or something, something like that. I gotta well, go look because because he was dating Jessica Simpson, and who was the uh, Miles Austin was dating somebody right. famous at the same time. I think you're correct about this. I think your memory's on the point. Yes, she he was dating someone famous and pretty and all that kind of stuff too. So you had like two celebrity. Then there was Jason Witten with his wife. It was perfect. <laughs> just, <laughs> Jason Witten, just, I'm just hanging out. Yeah, Carrie Underwood. Yes, that's he right. He dated Carrie Underwood. Carrie Underwood. It was Carrie Underwood. Yeah, he went through a couple of those. Remember, and that's – Bill Parcells hated celebrity quarterbacks. Like, he was – he literally – that was part of his, one of his rules. He was like, guard against the celebrity quarterback because he didn't want his quarterback to start dating starlets. And hanging – Aaron Rodgers is a celebrity quarterback, right? Dating starlets. I still would have loved to be in the room when uh, the, the Giants quarterback, Jesse Palmer, told Tom Coughlin he was going on The Bachelor. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> they asked Simpson to do it, actually, too. He Sims? didn't do it. They asked Simpson to do it. He didn't do it. Yeah, because I think Phil was like, no. Come on, man. You'll never be taken seriously as a quarterback. And honestly, I think Sam should have did it because look at where Jesse is now. He's just doing what basically he's like hosting like one of the morning shows. It was a conduit to great things yeah, for him. Yeah, it helps you cross over. So Sam should have did it because I, well, I think at times Sam was like, hey, I'm going to be a professional you know, quarterback I'll give for Jesse Palmer credit because he knew he was not going to play in the NFL for long. He's my former teammate with the Giants, man. I'm telling you. He's a handsome Jesse, dude. He was cool and now dude. the girls love him because he's on – you know what he's on? He's, he's not only over. rooms to go commercials. Yeah. He's on uh, celebrity, something called Celebrity Baking Challenge, Bro. Christmas Baking Challenge. It's all about crossing <laughs> over, man. You know what I mean? You need to start. Guys living on Easy Street. Yeah. I believe it's Chris Peterson who was, uh, I don't know, I've listened to a lot of Chris Peterson lately. But he was talking about his uh, former players, and one of his uh, kind of go-to lines was, football is always and will always be plan B. It's going to have to be because you're not going to play football for most of your life. All right? Your plan A will be what you do for most of your life. And that ain't gonna be football. Yeah, find your, you know find what I mean? your niche. So, yeah, exactly. Start, start, start figuring out Plan A while you're doing Plan B because he's always always got football's Plan B. What's your Plan A? What yeah. you gonna be doing for the rest of I your like life? That. That's most smart. of your life. Very smart. Yeah, very smart. Also, very smart will be uh, you know our coverage from uh, New Orleans. Excited about it. Uh, we're gonna be headed there. Ty's headed to New Orleans. Uh, he'll be, he may have some some hanging intel out. from behind the scenes at the Manning House. Ooh. Hanging like out, the, the huh? house of Manning. This is Archie's house, Ty. You're talking about, or is this the? We're, we're, we're uh, talking about. They got know. a lot of houses. In Louisiana. I don't know. It's, it's, they got a lot of houses. Come on now. It's, the, it's the Manning's pregame party slash exactly. watch party at one of their houses. So okay. Well, I will be on Monday because you know how this day goes. The game is Monday night, mm-hmm. so you and I will not be doing a morning show on Monday of New Year's Day. Uh, we are going to, you know. Ring in the new year. No morning show, but we will be on you, Patrick Davis, and myself. Ty can jump in, too, if he's around. Uh, you guys, you and Ty, you and Patrick will be here. Yep. And I will be uh, at Manning's Restaurant in uh, in downtown New Orleans, right there off of Canal. It's right there by the Harris Casino, not far, uh, kind of convention center area. Great spot. Really cool. Right? Huge. Huge. So we'll be. I'm going to be partnering with our friend Bobby Burton and the team at On th- On Texas Football. Nice. Uh, so we'll be doing some stuff with them. And from four to seven on Monday, brought to you by Hayes City Store and Taste on Main. We will be at Manning's. Now I'm bringing you coverage. And then whatever happens Monday night, uh, we'll be talking about it Tuesday morning here on Hook 'Em Up, Rod. And I will Love be it. live from New Orleans. Nice. Uh, with coverage from the uh, the media hotel there, the Sheraton on Canal. So I'll be broadcasting live there. So looking forward to doing it. Thank you to Taste on Main, and thank you to Hay City Store for helping us get there. That'll be our live coverage. Make the trip over on Saturday. Already making plans to 
rather because there's a ton of people that I know going to this game, Rod, uh, or at least going to New Orleans. Oh, man. Yeah, exactly. People are going to New Orleans. They don't give a damn about the game anymore. It's like, I'm going to be there. Ring in the That's new year and watch the there. game. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then the Cowboys play Saturday night. That ain't bad either. You get to Saturday night to watch the Cowboys play the Lions and maybe go over to Harris and put a wager on that bad boy. Mm-hmm. Uh, see how that goes. And then, uh, you know, you get to hang out on, on Bourbon Street or wherever. And then, obviously, Sunday night is New Year's. You ring in the new year in a cool town. Uh, and then, you know, next night is Sugar Bowl. So pretty good. I love that. Pretty good. So yes, looking forward great. to that. Uh, and, of course, if the Longhorns win, and we're talking about a win on Monday, on Tuesday morning, Rod, or as Longhorn fans would like me to say, when Texas wins, we'll be talking about a, a quick turnaround. We've got to get ready to get down to Houston. Oh, man. Do this thing all over again it's, it's the, the following Monday. It's amazing how the Longhorns I can't, can't say lucked out because they've uh, earned this opportunity, but they've had kind of a home field regional advantage. <laughs> in these games, the Big 12 title game, pretty much a home game for Texas in the state of Texas. Uh, the Sugar Bowl now, at least it's in the southern region. So Washington, a, a team from the Pacific Northwest, got to travel all the way down. A lot of their fans just can't afford it and just won't do it. It's just too much madness. So it's going to be mostly Longhorn burnt orange down there. And if they are lucky enough to make it in H-Town, can anybody, could anybody have ever imagined oh. for any for any Blue Blood fan base to be playing a national title game in your state, in one of the biggest cities Two and a half in hour your from your campus. <laughs> from your campus. Like that play, H-Town is going to be wild. It's going to be painted Now, Georgia, by orange. Georgia's had the, you know, they played in, in some big games in the in Atlanta. Yeah, because they played SEC title game there. Yeah, no, there that, that helps. So I'm, sure, I'm, sure there's been, I'm sure it's happened before. I mean, I'm USC – yeah, they could play in the Rose Bowl. USC sure. playing in the Rose Bowl. I'm, so I'm sure it's happening. Hey, there you go. I mean, there you go. USC, play, imagine that, right? That's how hype there to be. USC playing in the Rose Bowl. That's the equivalent of playing a national title. Well, game listen, for Texas I mean, let me take it to, a, to another level, and then we'll go behind the burn orange curtain. This is kind of is. By the way, several people on the text line, thank you, have reminded us that Miles Austin was dating Kim Kardashian. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Forgot about it. Kim's dated a lot of dudes, I'm just going to say. She's got a type. She's got a type. You got to I'll say this, Miles Austin. This is a, I'm a heterosexual, happily married guy. He's got some of the bluest eyes you'll ever see. Like seriously, have you been mesmerized by Miles Austin's well, yes. eyes? When I mean, you interview him, and you're like, "Golly!" Didn't he get like arrested for something in the last few years? Like, I don't know. I, 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 did, I did see a, a negative Miles. I don't know what it was, but I did see a negative Miles Austin that, headline not too long ago. But Miles Austin, dang. Uh, he, was, <laughs> he was suspended. Dang. He was a Jets wide receivers coach, and he was suspended for gambling. Yeah, so it, was, oh, it was a negative headline. I don't know what no, it was. But it was a negative no. headline. But to to the point, if uh, if the, can you imagine just for win or lose in the national title game with with what the Longhorns have done, and we talked about it this morning, Rod, with the addition of the the receiver from California, and of course Trey Trey Moore. Can you imagine the way they're recruiting in Dallas right now. What playing a national championship game in Houston could do for the recruiting in Houston. Oh, yeah. Big picture for the program. Oh, there's no question. They're trying, I mean, the, right now they're kind of behind Houston and or A&M and some others in that city because they're, 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 they've really focused on Dallas, which Houston, is not a problem. Houston is just tougher to recruit because there's just more of an SEC influence. Yes. They are, there are SEC schools with – they have, like, they have basically bases. I'm not joking about it. They have, like, recruiting bases. In Houston. Like, physical bases in Houston. Yeah, because <laughs> like they know LSU. how fertile it is. Yes, right? LSU and Bama. So it's just tougher to recruit there because teams have and every, all yeah, – ever since – they have a history there already. Right. Well, like, <laughs> yeah. DF, 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 DFW's rise is relatively new. Remember I told you guys, Houston had more talent than DFW for years, uh, because mostly because of the refugees from Hurricane Katrina and from Hurricane yeah, Rita. Right. And they would all come from Louisiana, like my people. My mom and dad are born swamp people, and they would come to Houston. So they would get not only the Houston talent, they get a lot of Louisiana talent, second generation, yeah. second, third generation there too. Dallas didn't have that, but now – Dallas, whatever they put in the water up there. It's like the U.S. has military bases all over the globe. But when, <laughs> when A&M joined the yeah. SEC, they started – Yes. That got them into oh, Texas. That H-Town. got them into Texas. Yes. That was the portal, right? There. That was like that corridor well, right there. And so Texas now deals with that. But Texas uh, – you know, Tom Herman and his staff were big recruiting in Houston because yep. that's where they came from. Mm-hmm. Uh, this could jumpstart the – not that they need help recruiting right now at Texas, but uh-huh. um, you play a national championship game in that backyard and get to be this, the focal point for a week – you can't even on – on a year when you beat Nebraska uh, – you know, I know our friend Jerry Hamilton and all the recruiting insiders talked about how big that win at Tuscaloosa was mm-hmm. for the Longhorns recruiting yep. in the Deep South. 
And we've already seen this recruiting class for 2024 start to come together with a kid from quarterback from Alabama and a tight end from Georgia and a running yeah. back from Florida. And it's like, okay, you know, but get back down into Houston. and Because uh, Houston, Houston gives you that, that corridor to Louisiana. It's right there. Yeah. I mean, and, that's, and, that's, well, and that's swamp people. That's, they're all the same well, people. And if you heard <laughs> us earlier this morning, we played the entire Sark opening news conference from New Orleans. And if you missed that, you can go back on podcast in the six o'clock hour here, his first full eight minutes. But in there, he says, you know, in the, in the staff, we don't, we don't consider there a border between here and, Louis- yeah. and New Orleans. Basically, East Texas, Houston to East Texas, all the way to Louisiana. That's all one territory for us. We don't know. see a border. Yeah, exactly. And he should start looking at it like that. I, I wish Mac would have looked at it like that more because LSU doesn't have any natural competitors in that state. There's no program even close to LSU like that, like A&M is with, you know, Texas. At least they're in the same the com- uh, competition level, they don't have that. So they, and they can't get all the talent. They're still trying to get guys from Georgia and Florida too. So there is tons of talent in Louisiana that really goes overlooked for the most part. Yeah, and they're they're you know Terry Joseph has been big in that state, mm-hmm. and he brings Brandon, a lot of time. Ha- Brandon Harris has been big. Brandon Harris got LSU ties. Yeah, yeah, I man. Mean, uh, and as you said, I mean, if you can if you can lock up, you know, do a really good job in the Metroplex, especially South Dallas, get back into Houston. Then you can target around the country, and this is what they're doing. Like they're targeting t- individual players, and, and no, no matter where, yeah. if you're recruiting well in Dallas and Houston, uh, and in your own backyard here in Austin, yep. uh, you're going to have a talented team. You're going to clean up. <laughs> Those to me are the three areas in Texas where you have to have a majority sh- market share, right? Majority market share: Dallas, Houston. And I think your own backyard in Central Texas. And as they consider Houston to be East Texas going into Louisiana, then they already got Beast Texas taken care of as well. West Texas, listen, there'll be pockets of great players out there in West Texas and in the panhandle and all that. But like you said, that's sporadic. That's, you know, you'll find those guys when they pop up out of nowhere. But for the most part, you're talking about pipelines, most fertile recruiting grounds in the country, top yeah. 10. That's Houston, that's DFW, that's Central Texas for the most part. Well, and you heard, you had the quote last week with uh, Xavier Filsamy saying that uh, all the top dudes in Texas want to play at Texas. They all want to go to Texas. Well, you go into Houston and win a natty in Houston. You're a made man. Oh. You're a made man. All right, we'll, yeah. we'll uh, continue that conversation. Well, right now, Rod's got more on that. Let's go behind the burn orange curtain. And they were all asking themselves the same question. What is behind that curtain? All right, a lot of talk today, uh, this is a lot of conversation for us about the offensive line for Washington, uh, which has won the Joe Moore Award. It's uh, for giving out annually to the best offensive line in the country. Uh, that group, uh, which was one of the best, if not the best, pass blocking offensive line in the country, won the Joe Moore Award. Only allowed 11 sacks all year long. 18 sacks they've allowed in the last two years, which is a phenomenal stat. I mean, that's a, over 1,000 passing attempts for Michael Penix in the last two years and only been sacked 18 times. Phenomenal. Um, and only 9% of the pressures against Michael Penix are converted into sacks. That is another phenomenal number. And that is because <laughs> these sacks, and, and Chris Peterson says this, sacks are usually attributed to the quarterback, even in his mind. Analytically, we know that too. Sacks attributed to the quarterback. Quarterbacks holding on to the football. All right, quarterbacks uh, taking too long to process. That is not Michael Penix. He has a comfort level in this system that is, honestly, it's troubling. At least for Longhorn fans, it's going to be troubling. The last quarterback you played, uh, that Texas played, that had this amount of uh, knowledge and this amount of comfort and experience within the same system was probably Dylan Gabriel. And before that, it was probably Donovan Smith. Think about Ooh, think yeah. About, well, Donovan Smith, well, he's an air raid system, right? He had yeah. been an air raid there at Texas Tech. Great one. He was in the air raid uh, there with U of H, Daner Hogerson, and he had some success lighting up Texas just because he's comfortable in that system. Uh, and same thing with Dylan Gabriel. That worries me a little bit with Penix. His comfort level in the system, that keeps you from converting pressure into sacks, but also just just lets you know that you know Texas had trouble with teams that are pass first with quarterbacks that have a lot of experience in a particular system. Uh, we'll get back to that, but uh, they, uh, they watched an offensive line, uh, one of the best in the country. The O-line itself, the five starters on the O-line, have only given up a total of five sacks, zero attributed to the right tackle, two attributed to the left tackle, and he's considered a better player. Uh, Fawutano is considered a, a better player. He's a third-team All-American, first-team All-Conference player. Roger Rosegarden has only given up zero sacks, zero the entire season. He's, so they both their tackles are legit NFL players who will play on Sundays. The interior is where Texas would have an advantage. 
They usually do because they got Byron Murphy and, uh, you know, and DeFundre Sweat as their interior D tackles and the best D tackle duo in all of college football. If those two guys can provide organic pressure, then it's going to be a problem for Washington's offensive line. They haven't faced a defense or tackle duo as dynamic, right, and as imposing as uh, Texas. But last year they did a really good job against Texas' defensive line. Texas did not have any sacks, didn't have a lot of splash plays against this group. If they can move the pocket, which they re- they like to do a lot of, and if they can get the ball out quickly and Texas doesn't take away the easy completions for Michael Penix, all right, then they'll be able to insulate Michael Penix with pass protection. But if Texas can force Michael Penix to hold on to the ball just a little bit longer and get interior pressure, that's when he's been its most erratic all season long. Uh, Washington run deep, run offense, I should say, with their offensive line also pretty good. They're allowing – or at least I should say they're achieving 3.1 yards before contact per rush. Texas defense is allowing 2.4 yards after contact per rush. That number leads to Big 12. Washington's top 10 in yards before contact per rush. So they're actually a really good offensive line at getting an initial push. Texas is really good at neutralizing that initial push. So something's got to give there. I think people have been really – I just think they've been an underrated offensive line even prior to them winning the Joe Moore Award. I think now they'll get a little bit more respect. Uh, But I don't think we've done uh, them enough justice and I don't think we've given them enough props. That's going to be a huge matchup in the game. Uh, And Michael Penix, uh, one thing to throw out about him, uh, he's only – like I said, only been sacked 18 times in the last two years. And one thing he does really, really well is he avoids sacks in the pocket. He maneuvers in the pocket really well. He's athletic. He's really athletic. Uh, He's had a lot of AC, a lot of injuries, two ACL surgeries. But you look at the way that he operates, just his movement in the pocket, buying himself time, creating bigger windows to throw the football to. He, he's actually one of the best in the country at that and having a low turnover uh, play rate at the uh, at the same time. I think he's got a 2% turnover uh, worthy play rate, which is really, really low. Doesn't turn the football over a lot, only nine interceptions on the season. So the key to this game, honestly, is probably going to come down to whether Texas can pressure Michael Penix. They only had eight quarterback hurries on him last season. No sacks, no tackles for loss, no quarterback knockdowns, no quarterback hits, just Eight hurries. This has to change in this next matchup. If they only have hurries against him, no knockdowns, uh, no sacks, if they don't have any hits on the quarterback, it's going to be a long day. They didn't really touch Michael Penix last year. No, they hurried no him. Sacks. They hurried him, but they didn't touch him. Yeah, That's no sacks problem. and no negative plays in that game. Just mm-hmm. one turnover. Jaron Thompson yeah. had the one interception in that game last year. Uh, and last year's last year, but it's a good good look. And as you said, I you know you the, the stats over the last uh, Washington, but I gave you the stats of when even at Indiana, this guy's thrown sixteen hundred passes and been sacked thirty one times. So he is a really good quarterback of avoiding sacks and getting the ball out yeah. of his hand. Um, that's a big factor of why he's you know up for the Heisman Trophy this year. And you know it's one of those the, Rod, you, you you can play defense in a lot of different ways, right? You can play defense with your defense. But you can use your offense as a defense too. I mean, yes, this can be. This is yep. one where Sark and his offense. I know he wants to, you know, get in, the, get in that gun battle, but uh, that shootout, as they say. But you may want to use your if you're able to run the football. If you can run the football, you might want to run the football, and you know, try to control the clock a little bit, play some field position, get them backed up where you can uh, to come after them. Uh, and yeah, I mean, both teams are going to be looking to force field goals, you know, and play some some bend but don't break. Because you, I mean, fans can be all they want. But the, the the numbers tell you this is the number one pass offense in the country. Yep. And you just gave all the numbers of why they're gonna they're gonna score some points. They're gonna hit you with some things. That's yeah. just you got to go in there expecting that. And then you know people on the long, the long run side will point out their their pass defensive numbers. Well, as I pointed out, they played five of the top sixteen passing offenses in the country this year. They won't be scared. <laughs> right. I mean, what, I mean, think about that. The five of the top sixteen yeah. passing offenses in the country they faced Washington. Play faced Oregon, Washington State, USC, um, gosh, Arizona, number eleven in the country in pass offense. Colorado's number sixteen. Right about that. So that not not only will they not be scared, those numbers are going to get inflated. And when you're playing that many great passing teams, yeah, I mean they're star. No question. And, and the other point of that is they're thirteen and zero. They've given up a lot of yards, but they've still won. Yeah, Quinn's not not the not even a. I think he's like the third best quarterback they've played. Yeah. Like they, like, like they played some really good quarterbacks, right? Yeah, so that this is going to be a game management thing, too, because you just got to know going in, 
you're going to give up some points. It just is. You're going to score some points. But, man, execution, critical moments, end of half, that whole end of the half, start of the second half kind of thing. Can you can you uh, play that game, uh, end of game situations? It's going to be that kind of kind of football game. So, Sark and his staff have to be on point with that, too. And Kalen DeBoer has been really good uh, at 13-0 and, and, you know, 20 – Four and two in two seasons or whatever he is. It's just unbelievable. I don't. Yeah. Uh, you you can argue that that I don't know if there's been a better start to a coaching career. He's in. I mean, if he wins, especially if he ends up, you know, winning a college football playoff game, I mean, he's had one of the best starts to a coaching career ever. Yeah, yeah, and won the Pac-12, beat Texas last year in the bowl game. Now uh, thirteen and zero. So looking forward to this game coming up Monday night. We'll be there. Uh, Horn taking your live coverage. Thanks to Hazen City Store and Taste on Main. Thank you to to uh, uh, Rod for behind the BOC. We'll come back with what's popping and. What's popping is not this bowl game in Boston. We'll get you details coming next. Welcome up with Ian Rodby. Damn, that's ugly. <laughs> oh, man. We're watching uh, the beginnings of SMU ponies. You know, on, on the SMU home field on Tuesday night, the Texas State Bobcats were popping. They won their first ever pole program bowl game. Wow. Also at SMU, they drank. This is n nothing more on brand than the Texas State fans who showed up big time for the first ever bowl game for that program for G.J. Kinney. They showed up, and not only that, uh, Rod, they drank the stadium out of beer. They, they actually drank the <laughs> – like they were on one side. They drank the home side out by halftime. <laughs> they had to go to the, they, they had to the, go to the side? They had to go ransack the rice side. Man, yeah, rice, they, <laughs> the rice ain't drinking like that. Come no, on now. They don't bring enough people. They ain't doing it exactly. Come on now. Uh, so props to the uh, for the wow. for the Bobcats on a couple of occasions, yeah, good but for them. but SMU who, who would like to be playing on their home field right now, they're playing at Fenway Park in front of countless twelves, uh, maybe four forty four hundred people are there at Fenway Park, <laughs> maybe four hundred. Yeah, because the weather's disgusting, and it's forty five degrees and pouring down and rain. pouring down rain. On a baseball field. How bad do you want it, guys? On a, in a baseball stadium. How bad do now, you want Now, there'll probably it? be some Boston College fans there, but even they are going to be like, I'm out of here. Oh, no. You, if you went to that game, even <laughs> as you went casually, you're like, no, I'm not. Yeah, how could you get up in the morning and still be motivated to go? Oh. In the morning, be like, no, I ain't going to that game. Well, it's, the next no. game is going to be the same because it's the pinstripe bowl in New York and the weather forecast is the same. I'm going to that game. And that's Miami. Miami's going to come out of South Beach and be like, what? 
No what way. are we doing here? <laughs> Playing who? Rutgers? Greg Schiano's team? That's no fun. Uh, uh, yeah. So that won't be fun. Decent game, but uh, there's 32 different players in the portal. The transfer portal bowl is NC State and K-State at uh, 430 today. Or 445. That, that Orange Bowl is kind of like that, too. The Orange Bowl, I think they're at 40 between God. Florida State and Georgia. I believe they're at 40, almost 40 players who have either transferred prior to that bowl or have opted out of that bowl game. Uh, mm-hmm. And Arizona, Oklahoma tonight. That should be worth, if you're going to stay up late, that might be good. That's not going to kick till after 8 o'clock tonight down in San Antonio. But Arizona, number 14, Oklahoma, number 12, they're both pretty intact. Now, they've both lost some players to the portal, Oklahoma for sure. Yeah. But uh, this is a big one for Brett Venables. They didn't make a bowl game last year, and now they're playing down in San Antonio. So that'll, that'll be, mm-hmm. a, I think, a pretty heavy Oklahoma crowd tonight in San Antonio. Oklahoma State showed up, though. They did. And they ready to play. Beat up on the Aggies. But that game, I mean, you know, the Aggies got beat. But at the same time, they only, they only had 48 scholarship players available last night. Mm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's tough. I was going to say, but that is kind of the reality, the yeah. new reality of the bowl game. They and, just they, These expeditions don't matter to these players anymore. They just don't. No. They don't care anything about them. No, that's <laughs> not popping. There's, and there's no loyalty like, oh, man, you know what? My, what about my teammates? What about my coaches? There's no loyalty. Hey, we asked the question earlier, and now advertising does work. You could advertise with us in the new year if you'd like to. It does work. We get a lot of response <laughs> for our people. But, what, you know, we said the Wasabi Fenway Bowl. Mm-hmm. Totally wrong, Rod. Rod. Wasabi has nothing to do with food. Wasabi is a the world's fastest uh, hot cloud storage company. Oh, so it's not food? It's cloud right? storage. It's one, we go back to the clown. I was starting the show. <laughs> yes. We full you, circle. You said you need a new phone because you're out of food. You're taking so many pictures of your daughter in Christmas. Yeah, so I'm out of storage. You might need to go to Wasabi. Because now we were talking about, has anybody Photo. know how to access the cloud, what the hell the cloud is, how I retrieve stuff from the cloud. And then Ty told me, oh, it's out in the cloud. I'm like, well, what? how do I access the cloud? What do I? How do I get to the cloud? Wasabi. Wasabi can, Wasabi.com. They can help me with my cloud. Uh, okay. At 80% lesser cost than leading competitors. There you go. Compliant, durable. There you go. Uh, hot cloud storage. You know, I said I never. <laughs> I didn't know. I never heard of that before. So good for wasabi. We just got us. I looked it up. I thought it was going to be food. See. But then the first commercial of the first break was wasabi hot cloud storage. Hot hot cloud storage. <laughs> yeah, what what's in between? Just regular cloud. Hot cloud. Storage. I think they've added hot because wasabi is hot. I think Ooh, that's part of their branding. Oh, there you go. That makes sense. That's why, well, they had me fooled. I was thinking about wasabi. Wasabi. The, you know, the accoutrement. I want to think about wasabi. Do you like wasabi? I don't you, think so. Every time I go, to like a, I go to like a Japanese steakhouse or something, um, yeah, people sushi. always say, no, I'm not a sushi guy. I'm not a sushi guy. I don't like sushi. I, I have like Same. spring rolls or something, but yeah, I'm not into Hey, yeah, what's the, uh, and this, by the way, I'm going to give credit. This is a good restaurant. Went there. Ty, have you been to 1010 down on 6th Street? Oh, yeah, good Fifth stuff. Street? Okay, went there. I don't know that I've ever spent over two hundred dollars on a meal and still been starving. That's so, that's how I f- that's how I felt at Red Farm when I went for my birthday. Yeah, they, they I mean it's a small plate thing and you kind of share and it's really good. But then it was like two hundred dollars later and I'm walking out going, "Golly, can I go get a sandwich now somewhere? I need a burger? <laughs> now I had a dinner. Now I need a good burger." <laughs> no, I feel this, I, I'm with, I feel like that when I go to when I have like honestly, I feel like they have the Chinese a lot. Sometimes. Yeah, and they were bringing yeah. so much food, and then you're like, well, I don't know that I got. Did I get it? Did I'm I... kind of hungry, so yeah. I had like Stop. some ribs, and then I had some of this, and then it was good. But uh, don't oh. know. And then I'm like sitting there hungry, and I'm like, how much? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, usually I'm doing those, uh, what do they call them? Uh, we do the uh, oh, the sake bombs. Ooh, that's, that'll that's my give jam. you a headache. That is, yeah, that's what I do. That's, I what, that's why my birthday dinner bombs. was so expensive, so expensive because we ordered like nine bottles of sake for the entire Oh, day. love sake bombing, man. That's my stuff. Also popping tonight, it's uh, Jets and Browns on Monday, on Thursday Night Football. The great story of Joe Flacco and this playoff-bound Browns team. Uh, they can still you know, lock, them, lock up that division. Well, they're not going to chase down the Ravens at this point. Uh, do you have a pick tonight, Ty? Is there a Sex Panther pick, or are you just going all in on the Longhorns to win the Natty? Um. Yeah, Longhorns to win the Natty, and I'll give you the rest of my uh, friends' ideas to get into the game tomorrow. Cause they're, <laughs> yeah, let's not go with the wheelchair ones. idea again. There's some better ones. Don't fake a disability just to get into it. Ty, all he had to do was say, my buddy's taking a wheelchair to New Orleans to try to get into the game. I'm like, we have to end of that story. I don't need the rest of it. <laughs> no, we cannot endorse that behavior. Come on, man. Oh, I'm not Ty. doing it. It's just someone you can talk about other people. By the way, Ty had a Ty had a Christmas Day popping miracle because he, he. How much money did you win on Christmas Day in your, your three NFL games? Enough. Like two G's. 
<laughs> nice job, Doc. Ooh, trip is fun. I might find you in New Orleans and have you buy a, buy a wasabi. Hey, have a great <laughs> one, everybody. Everything podcast at hornfm.com. We're back on a Friday.